Despite the differences in rank, the two men were old friends, and William showed no irritation at his friend's tone or lack of deference. In this private council, rank was put aside, and everyone had proven his worth to the crown and his reliability many times before. Despite his youth, barely twenty-five years of age, Patrick had served three years on the northern border, fighting goblins and dark elves. Callus was roughly the same age as William, though William looked to be in his late fifties, while Callus looked barely older than Prince Patrick. What if it doesn't work? asked Callus. It was James who answered, Then it doesn't work. Callus studied the old man who laughed ruefully. Glancing at his old friend, he said, I remember when you used to ask questions like that, Nicky. Nicholas said, None of us is as young as he once was, Callus. Patrick said, well, When will you go? Callus said, We're still months away from being ready. I've got only four men I can count on besides those of us here in this room. De Longville, Greylock, Eric, and Jado. All have seen what's down there and know the risks. There are a couple of other veterans from the last two campaigns, but those four are leaders, though Eric and Jado don't know it yet. But the rest are men who just follow orders. Fine for soldiers, not enough for leaders. Patrick said, How are you going to proceed? Callus smiled. Come at them from behind. He crossed to a large map on the wall, one redrawn many times over the last twenty years, as new information came from the continent on the other side of the world. We'll sail from the Sunset Islands, as usual, but here... He pointed to a seemingly empty place on the map four hundred miles south of the Long Island chain. There's an uncharted bit of land with a lovely harbor. We'll meet there and transfer to another ship. Another ship? asked Patrick. Nicholas answered, By now, our enemy has an inventory of every ship in the Western Navy. They can probably identify the outline on the horizon of each one from their rigging. And I have no doubt they know which of our trading ships are really royal warships in disguise. What have you got down there? asked Patrick. A new ship? No, a very old one, said Callus. We're going to go as Bridgeners. Bridgeners? Cassian raiders? said William, with a half-smile. Nicholas said, We have one of the dragon ships. The navy of Roldham captured one during a raid two years ago. Roldham was a small island kingdom to the east of the kingdom of the Isles that was a long-time ally. The king of Roldham has agreed to lend it to us. It was quietly sailed around Lower Kesh. Nicholas smiled. A couple of times, according to reports, other Bridgener dragon boats sailed within hailing distance. The Roldan captain waved and smiled and kept right on going. No questions asked or answered. William laughed. The arrogant swine couldn't imagine someone sailing in their waters who wasn't one of them. Calla said, I'm hoping we get the same reaction. What? asked Patrick. I'm not sailing west to get to Novendus. I'm sailing east, under the Horn of Kesh, then across what is now known as the Green Sea, to a small village near the city of Ispar. He pointed at the map as he spoke. We'll be sailing in from there west. I hope if they're looking for our ships, they're looking in the other direction. We have always sailed out of the city of the Serpent River. If we're intercepted, we're Bridgener traders who are blown off course and are working our way around their landmass. Patrick said, Do you think they will accept that? Callus shrugged. It's happened before, I've been told. There's a fast-running current that moves eastward down near the ice flows, and if you catch it south of Kesh, you can ride it across the Green Sea to a great mass of ice that points like a finger right at Port Grief. We won't be the first party of Keshian sea raiders to show up there, but they won't have been so common that locals will notice any differences. Patrick said, Then what? Callus said, we buy some horses, change clothing, and sneak out of the city one night and head north. He pointed to the south end of the mountain range that ran down to the sea west of Ispar. I can find the entrance we used to get out of those caverns on our last journey without too much trouble. No one doubted him. His tracking skills were considered legendary. Callus's heritage was unique and in no small measure supernatural. Patrick said, very well. What then? Callus shrugged. The destruction of the Pantathians. Patrick's eyes widened. How many men were you planning on taking? Ten squads. Sixty men. 
You plan on destroying a nation of these creatures, magic users from every report I've studied, with sixty men? Calva said, I never said it would be easy. Patrick looked at Nicholas. Uncle? Nicholas said, I learned twenty years ago that if Callus says a thing can be done, it can be done. Looking at Callus, he asked, What is your thinking? My thinking, said Callus, is that the bulk of their forces will be with the armies of the Emerald Queen. He made a sweeping motion with his hand on the map between the city of Maharta and the city of the Serpent River. We've never seen them in numbers. The squad I saw in the caverns was no more than twenty in one place, and that was the single largest concentration we've encountered. We've judged them by their ability to visit evil on us, but never have we questioned their strength of numbers. He let a distasteful expression cross his face. When I caught sight of one of their crashes, it was poorly guarded. A half dozen adults, a dozen or more infants, and a score of eggs. I saw nothing of their females. Patrick said, What does all this mean? Callus said, Pug and Nacor both hold that these creatures aren't natural. He returned to the table and sat. They claim that these were created by an ancient dragon lord, Alma Lodaka. Callus let his eyes drop a moment, and William and Nicholas both understood that this strange man, half elf by birth, was revealing lore to non elves that no full elf would volunteer. His half-human nature felt no such prohibition, and he knew that he served a greater good by being frank in all matters concerning the Serpent Men, but that still didn't make it any easier for his elven half to accept. Those things were not taught. They were inbred. If this is so, that may explain a low birth rate, or perhaps they have never had a large population. They may even have some queens as insects do, or there may be a special holding area for females. We don't know. But if there is a crash, the females can't be far away. Patrick said, I'm still unclear on one thing. If the majority of fighting men and magicians are with the army of the Emerald Queen, what do we gain by raiding those birthing cabins? His words trailed off as his eyes widened. You're going to slaughter the young? He asked, almost gasping in shock. Callus's expression remained calm. Yes. You're talking about waging war against innocence, said Patrick, his voice taking on an angry tone. Cassian dog soldiers may slaughter women and children in their rampages, but the last man caught at that during a kingdom war was hanged before the assembled rank and file of the army. Nicholas glanced at Callus, who returned to the look, then nodded. Duke James said, Patrick, you're new here, and you don't have all the information. My lord, interrupted the prince, I realize you've held high office since grandfather's youth and were my father's chief advisor in Villanon, but I am now the ruler of the Western realm. If there is something you think I should know, why have I not been informed? Duke James looked at Prince Nicholas. Nicholas sat back, recognizing his nephew's mood. The new prince of Crondor was revealing himself to be a young man of some temper, touchy disposition, moods, and not terribly secure in his position. So he tended to magnify every slight, real or imagined. Knight Marshal William took charge. Your Highness, he began, formally emphasizing the young man's title, what I think Callus means is that we were all here during these events, which are only dry reports on paper before you. He paused, then went on. We've seen the damage these creatures can do firsthand. It was Callus who said, Would you not kill a poisonous snake because it was its nature to be a viper? Patrick looked at Callus. Say on. Callus said, You've cities within your borders that were once Cassian, but those who live there are kingdom by birth, though their ancestors were loyal to the emperor of Great Cash. To them it makes no difference. They were raised within the kingdom. They speak the king's tongue. And they think, as we all do, that this is their homeland. What has this to do with the matter under discussion? asked Prince Patrick. It has everything to do with it, said Callus. He leaned forward, elbows on the table. 
You may somehow think that these creatures are born innocent. That is not the case. Everything we know about them says they are born hating from the moment they hatch from their eggs. They are created to be the way they are. If we killed every adult and child and took the eggs and hatched them in this palace, raising those who were born here, they would come to consciousness hating us and seeking to reclaim this lost goddess they so mistakenly believe in. It is their nature to be this way, as it is the nature of a viper to bite and poison. They cannot help it any more than can the viper. Seeing that the prince's objections were wavering, Callus pressed on. You may some day forge a treaty with a brotherhood of the dark path, as you call the Moradel. You may see goblins obeying kingdom law and visiting our town markets in some dimly imagined future. You may see open borders with great cash and free travel between the two nations. But you will never know a moment's peace in this world so long as a Pantathian draws breath because it is in his nature to scheme, kill, and do whatever needs to be done to seize the life stone and set them on and reclaim the lost goddess, Alma Lodaka, the dragon lord who created him. Patrick was silent a long moment, then said, But you're talking of genocide. Callus said, I'm not leaving for at least six months, Sinus. If you conceive of a better plan, I will be here to listen. He let his voice fall, the low tone making his next sentence that much more urgent. But forbid me this, and I will go anyway. If not in a kingdom ship, then in one from Quegg or Kesh. If not this year, then the next or the one after. Because if I do not, then sooner or later the serpent priests will gain the life stone, and then we shall all perish. Patrick sat motionless for a very long time. At last he said, Very well. There seems no other course. But if any one of you learns anything that changes this matter, I wish to know of it at once. He stood up and said to William, See that things stay calm, but begin preparations. The prince departed. James turned to William. There's something else going on we need to discuss. William smiled and looked up at the slightly taller duke. What's going on, Jimmy? James looked at Callus and Nicholas, then at William. Helmut Grindel was killed last night outside the city gates. William said, Grindel? He's Rue Avery's partner. Nicholas said, Exactly. And a potential ally. We are going to need the support of merchants like him. William looked at James. Any suspects? Our agents are almost certain Frederick Jacobi, or one of his sons, is behind the death of Grindel, and the Jacobis are presently allied with Jacob Estabrook. Estabrook is a very influential man, both here and down in Kesh. James was silent for a second, then said, For the time being, let's hope Mr. Avery doesn't discover too much about who killed his partner. What if he already knows or has suspicions? asked Callus. I know Rue Avery. He's clever, and Grindel may have regained consciousness long enough to identify his killer. Perhaps, but as long as Mr. Avery doesn't cause any problems with Jacob Estabrook and his friends, it won't matter. He smiled. We need merchants hard at work making profits for us to tax, not killing one another. William said, with that in mind, will they cooperate when it comes time to put that wealth at risk for our benefit? James looked at his old friend. You take care of the war, Willie, and I'll see it's paid for. The merchants of the kingdom will come to heel once we make it clear they're going to lose everything if they don't help us. He glanced around the room. I now have the mockers where I want them. I have the throne where I want it. And soon I'll have the wealth of the kingdom to use as I need. And if I must bleed our people white to finance this war, I will. Remember, I am the only one in this room who was at Sethanon. No one else needed to hear any further explanation. 
Nicholas's, William's, and Callus's fathers had been at Sethanon, and they had heard in detail over the years what had happened when the Pantathians had tried to seize the life stone for the first time. But James had been there. William said, I'm due in court soon, too. If you'll excuse me, I'd like to see to some other matters before that. James? The Duke nodded. After William had left, James said to Callus, Who are you taking with you on this suicide mission? Callus knew whom he spoke of. Bobby, Greylock, and Eric. Of the two junior sergeants, he's the smarter one. Then leave him here, said James. If you're going to kill off one of them, leave the smarter one alive to serve me here if you fail. Take Jado with you instead. Callus nodded. Done. And leave Bobby here. Callus said, He'll never stand for it. Order him. He'll disobey. James said, You serve a unique function here, my friend, but as much as I need the eagle to return unharmed, I need your vicious dog of Crandor. He glanced out the window. I need a sergeant now more than I need a general, he glanced at Callus, or a captain. Callus smiled slightly. He's going to make your life living hell. James returned the smile. What else is new? It's not as if I have any choice. Very well, said Callus. I'll leave Bobby and Eric here and take Jado and Greylock. The three were starting toward the door when James said, What about Nacor? Callus said, He'd go back if I asked, I'm almost certain, but I think you'll serve us better down in Stardock. Those magicians are far too full of themselves, and he's just the man to swap them out and remind them they're living on a kingdom island in the middle of that lake of theirs. Very well, but you're going to face some powerful magic by everything you've said. What do you plan? Callus seemed almost embarrassed when he answered, Miranda has agreed to come along. James studied Callus, then laughed. For all your years, you do at times remind me of my son. Callus had the good grace to smile. Speaking of whom, when is Arutha due? Any time now, answered James. I think I may send him down to Stardock to run things a while. His smile turned rueful. And my grandsons are coming with him. Callus nodded. Jimmy and Dash must be men now. So they think, said James. Turning to Nicholas, he said, You have no idea what you've missed by never getting married. Nicholas said, I'm not too old now. Amos married my grandmother when he was nearly seventy. Well, you'll miss the joy of children if you wait that long, answered James as he moved toward the door. Then he made a sour face. As I think of Jimmy and Dash, you might not. As they left the conference hall, James turned to Callus and said, Like others before me, I am not all that pleased that this magical lady friend of yours has so many secrets. But, as she's proven a worthy ally over the years, I'll say nothing more than be careful. Callus nodded, lost in his own thoughts as James and Nicholas returned to speaking of families and children. Rue looked around, and Eric laughed. You look as if you're ready to run. In low tones, Rue said, Truth to tell, I felt that way since the minute I proposed. Eric tried to look understanding, but he couldn't hide his amusement. Rue said, You wait. One of these days you'll propose to that whore. Wait a minute, began Eric, his good humor vanishing. Wait, wait, said Rue. I'm sorry. I'm just not sure this is such a good idea. Looking around the temple, where Carly and Rue were about to be married, Eric whispered, It's a little late for that. Carly was entering the temple from a side door, as brides were required to do by the followers of Sung the White. At her side was Catherine, the girl de Longville had captured and turned to the prince's service. Carly had no friends to speak of, and it wouldn't have been proper for Mary, the maid, to serve as her companion. So Eric, as Rue's companion, had asked the serving girl to substitute. To his surprise, the girl had said she would. Huh? here we go, said Rue, and he turned to march down the center aisle, Eric at his side. The only witnesses were Luis and some of the other workers from the office, and Jado and those soldiers who had served with Rue in Callus's company. They watched as the priest, obviously bored by the fifth or sixth such ceremony of the day, hurried through the rites. 
grew vowed to care for Carly and be true to her, and she the same. And suddenly the priest was saying that the white goddess was pleased, and they could now leave. Eric gave the priest the votive offering required for such a ceremony, and the wedding party was ushered outside by harried-looking acolytes. Rue and Carly were escorted to a carriage hired for the occasion, while the others made their way on foot or horseback to the Grindle house. As the carriage made its way through the streets, Rue turned to see Carly with eyes downcast, staring at her hands. What's wrong? asked Rue. Aren't you happy? Carly looked at him, and her gaze struck him like a blow. Suddenly he knew there was anger and resentment behind the girl's bland facade. But her voice was calm and her tone almost apologetic as she asked, Are you? Rue forced a smile. Of course, my love. Why wouldn't I be? Carly looked out the window. You looked positively terrified walking down the aisle. Rude tried to make light of it. It's the normal reaction. When she turned to look at him, he quickly added, So I've been told. It's the ceremony and the rest. They traveled in silence as they made their way slowly through the city. Rue studied the passing cityscape, watching the changing buildings, the throng of citizens, traders, and travelers, as they moved through Crondor at a stately pace until they reached the Grindle House. Eric and the others were waiting as the carriage pulled up. As Rue's companion, Eric opened the door, and Catherine moved to help Carly from the carriage. The girl might be a stranger, but she took her part of Bride's companion seriously. Inside, the cook had prepared a tremendous repast, and the best wine from the cellar had been uncorked. Rue awkwardly let Carly move through the entrance before him, despite the tradition that said a husband should lead his wife through the door. It was, after all, her home. When she was inside, she said, I'll see to the kitchen. Rue put a restraining hand upon her. But, Mary, you will never serve again in this house. Carly studied his face a moment. Then a faint smile appeared on her lips. Rue turned and said, Mary. The maid appeared, and Rue said, You may begin serving. The guests fell, too, and the food was both delicious and bountiful. After a more than satisfying meal, Eric stood. He looked around the room and saw Catherine smiling at his awkward stance. He loudly cleared his throat, and when conversation didn't diminish, he said, Listen! He had raised his voice louder than he had wished, and the room fell silent. Then erupted in laughter. Blushing furiously, Eric held up his hand. I'm sorry, he said, grinning at his own embarrassment. It's my duty as the groom's companion to offer a toast to the newlywed couple. He glanced at Luis. Or so I have been informed. Luis nodded with a courtly smile and a wave of his hand. Eric said, I'm not one for words, but I do know this. Rue is my friend, more like a brother to me than any man living, and I only wish his happiness. Then he looked at Carly and said, I hope that you love him as I do, and that he loves you as you deserve. He raised his goblet of wine and said, To the newlywed couple, may they live to an old age and... Never regret a moment of their lives together. May they know happiness every day of their lives. The company drank the toast and cheered. Then Rue stood and said, Thank you. He turned to Carly. I know this has been a difficult time, he said, referring to her father's murder. But my earnest desire is to make the bad times fade into memory and to fill your days with happiness. Carly smiled and blushed, and Rue held her hand awkwardly. The dinner progressed, and Rue was filled with good cheer and too much wine. He noticed that Eric spent a great deal of time talking to the girl Catherine, and that Carly kept her own counsel most of the day. Soon the guests began to excuse themselves, and after night fell, Rue and Carly were bidding good evening to Eric, who was the last to leave. When the door closed, Rue turned to his wife and found her staring at him, an expression impossible to read on her face. What is it? he asked, suddenly sobering with a stab of fear. Something about her manner caused him to feel the need to draw a weapon. She came into his arms and put her head on his shoulder. I'm sorry. Rue's head swam and he felt his knees wobble, but he forced himself to be alert enough to ask, What are you talking about? 
Over the sound of sobbing, he heard Carly say, I wanted this to be a happy day. Gru said, And it isn't? Carly didn't speak. Tears were her only answer. Eleven. Travel. Jason pointed. The pile of ledgers and journals before the former waiter from Barrett's was daunting. Well, I've been through them all, he said as he pushed his chair back from the writing desk now established in the corner of the workshop. Carpenters had built a set of shelves for Jason as well as a low railing around his work area so he could see anyone coming into the warehouse, despite some privacy. Rue had informed the youth that he would be responsible for the smooth operation of the freight business if he, Duncan, and Luis were all absent from the premises at the same time. Duncan looked bored, as he usually did when it came to matters of business, unless it was getting paid, and Luis was his usual taciturn self. Rue said, And? Jason said, well, you're in better shape than you thought if you can get some of those who owed Helmut money to pay up. He held out a parchment upon which he had been working for days and said, I've compiled a list and the amounts owed. Rue glanced at it. There are a couple of noblemen here. Jason smiled. Experience at Barrett's tells me they may be very slow in paying accounts. He paused a moment, then added, if you don't mind my saying, you might just wish to let some of those debts ride until you need a favor from someone highly placed in court or with influence with another noble. That sort of thing? Rue shook his head. I don't mind your saying. Holding out another list, Jason said, I had more trouble with this. Rue looked at the second list. What's this? People Mr. Grindle did business with in distant cities, but whose identity is unclear. Rue's confusion was evident. Their identity is unclear? Jason said, This is not uncommon. Often those who trade in valuable goods don't wish it widely known they have rare items in their possession, or that they need to sell such. Hence the notations. It's a code, and only Mr. Grindle knew the identities of these people. Rue puzzled over the list. Maybe Carly knows who some of these people are. She knows a great deal more about her father's trade than I think even he was aware of. Duncan said, What are we doing now? Rue found his cousin's attitude irritating lately, as he often complained about not having as much authority as Louise. Rue wanted to give Duncan more authority, but had discovered he lacked Louise's willingness to work hard. Louise, on the other hand, rarely complained and was always meticulous in whatever task lay before him, while Duncan often was sloppy and left things undone. Fighting back a nasty reply, Rue said, We're leaving for Salador in the morning. We have a special cargo to deliver. Salador, said Duncan. I know a barmaid there. Rue said, you know a barmaid everywhere, Duncan. True, said the former mercenary. His mood seemed to brighten visibly with the prospect of a change of scenery. It was Louise who said, what cargo for Salador? Rue handed over a rolled-up parchment. Louise snapped it open and held it up before him, and his eyes widened. This is incredible. The remark caught Duncan's interest at last. What is it? he asked. But taking a load of goods from the palace to the estates of the Duke of Salador, answered Rue. The king's cousin? asked Jason. The very same. I have no idea what it is we are carrying, but the Prince of Crondor is sending it by fast freight. Us. And we need to make haste. But the price is too good for us not to go. And while there, he said, holding up the list, we'll attempt to identify the two names in Salador. He mused over the list. We've got a half-dozen names within a week's ride of Salador. I think we'll deliver our cargo and then nose around some in the east. To his companions, he said, I'm going home to speak with Carly, and then Duncan and I will be departing at first light tomorrow. To Duncan, he said, Be here and be alert. Duncan frowned, but both knew that, given a choice, he was likely to come wandering in around midday with a hangover. To Luis, Rue said, You're in charge while Duncan and I... Duncan said, Wait a minute, cousin. Why not take Louise and leave me here to run things? Rue regarded his cousin a moment. That request could only mean Duncan had a new barmaid or serving wench who had caught his fancy. With ill humor, Rue said, Because I prefer to return here next month and find I am still in business. He ignored Duncan's dark expression as he continued his interrupted instructions to Louise. 
You are in charge, and if you have any unusual needs, see Carly. Jason knows what our resources are, so if something comes your way that depletes us of our money, make certain it's a sure thing. Louis smiled. Many times he had said to Rue, there were no sure things. Understood, he said. Rue said, Jason, you're doing a good job with the ledgers. Now, can you start a fresh set of accounts for me, beginning the day I took sole control of the company? Jason said, I can do that. Rue said, good, and label them Avery and Company. He turned to the door, then stopped. And don't mention that last bit about the name change to Carly until I return. Jason and Luis exchanged glances, but neither spoke. Rue left the office and began the long walk home. The city streets were crowded as sundown approached. Vendors hawked their wares, trying for that last sale before they called it a day and returned to their own homes, while messengers hurried to carry that last missive of the day. Rue winded his way through the press, and by the time he reached home, the sun had set behind the buildings opposite the Grindle House. He glanced around and suddenly realized how dingy this place looked, even when not overwhelmed by shadows. He once more vowed that as soon as he could afford it, he would move his wife to newer, more sumptuous quarters. He opened the door and entered. Carly was in the kitchen, talking with the cook, Rendell, and Mary the maid. Mary saw Rue first and said, Oh, sir, it's the lady. Since the wedding, the maid had taken to referring to Carly as the lady of the house, or simply the lady, as if she were the wife of nobility. Rue found he liked that, as well as being referred to as the master or sir. Rue took a moment, and then the scene registered. Carly stood at the large chopping block that dominated the kitchen, holding tightly to the edge. Her hand was white. She was gripping so tightly. What's wrong? he asked. Rendell, a huge woman of unknowable years, said, She's off her feed, poor dear. Rue frowned, not being quite sure he liked having his wife referred to as if she were livestock. Carly? She said, It's some sort of stomach problem. I just walked in a moment ago, and the smell of food... She grew even more pale, and suddenly her hand came to her mouth as she fought to keep whatever was in her stomach down. She turned and left the kitchen, hurrying out the back door toward the Jake's. Mary, a simple enough young woman of modest intellect, said, I'm so worried about the lady. Rendell laughed and turned back to the vegetables she was washing in a bucket in the sink. She'll be fine. As Rue looked at them both, obviously unsure what to do next, Mary said, Sir, should I go see to the lady? Rue said, No, I'll go. And he went after his wife out the rear door of the home. The plain façade of the house hid, along with the interior of the home, the rich little garden that lay behind it. Carly spent a great deal of her time in the garden, which was equally divided between vegetables and flowers. At the far wall stood the modest little outhouse, from which issued the sound of Carly's retching. As he reached the door, it opened, and a pale Carly emerged. Are you all right? said Rue, at once regretting the question. Carly's expression showed it to be one of the more stupid questions of Rue's life, but she said, I'll be fine. Rue said, Shall I send for a healer? Carly smiled at his obvious concern. No, it's nothing a healer can help. Panic revealed itself in Rue's face. My gods, what is it? Carly couldn't help but laugh, despite her obvious physical discomfort. She allowed him to offer an arm and let him walk her to a tiny stone bench next to a modest fountain. It's nothing to be alarmed over, Rue, she said. When they sat, she told him, I wanted to be sure. You're going to be a father. Rue sat speechless for a minute. I need to sit down. Carly laughed. You are sitting. Rue stood, said, Now I need to sit down, and sat down again. Then his narrow face split in the widest grin Carly had ever seen. Baby? Carly nodded, and Rue suddenly realized he had never seen her look so lovely. He kissed her on the cheek. When? Seven more months, she said. Rue calculated, and his eyes widened. Then, she nodded, the first night. Rue said, Imagine that. He sat motionless and speechless for a long moment. Then a thought crossed his mind, and he said, I shall have Louise change the sign to... Avery and son, at once. Carly's eyes narrowed. Change the name of the company? 
Rue took her hand and said, My love, I want the world to know I have a son coming. He stood up. I must tell Duncan and Eric before I leave tomorrow. He was halfway across the garden when she asked, Leave tomorrow? He halted. I'm going to run a special cargo to Salador for the prince. I'll tell you about it when I get back, but I need to tell Eric and Duncan I'm going to be a father. He dashed out of the garden without waiting for a reply. Carly sat quietly for a moment, then stood slowly. She asked herself, What if it's a daughter? In the failing evening light, she returned to the only home she had known her entire life, feeling nothing so much as a guest in her own house. Rue groaned. Duncan laughed as he snapped the reins, urging the horses out the city gates. Duncan, Louis, Eric, and Rue's other friends had fated their friend on the announcement of his coming fatherhood, and now Rue was paying the price. He had been helped home by Duncan and had fallen into bed nearly comatose next to Collie. Without comment, she had roused him the next day when, against expectations, Duncan had arrived on time. They had made their way in the pre-dawn light to the shop, hitched up the wagon, and headed out to the palace. At the gate a squad of men waited, and they quickly loaded the cargo for Salador. Then, to Rue's surprise, Eric rode up with a squad of horsemen, an escort for the cargo. All he said was, I don't know what's in there either. Now it was midday, and the wagon rattled along at a good rate over the King's Highway, starting a long climb up into the foothills of the southern end of the Calastius Mountains. Rue said, We need to rest the horses. Duncan reined in the team and shouted, Eric, time for a break. Eric, who had been riding a short way ahead, nodded as he turned his own horse and dismounted, signaling to the other guards to do the same. He picketed his horse by the roadside and let it crop grass. Duncan took a large water skin and drank, then handed it to Rue. He poured a bit over his face and wiped it off, then drank. Eric came over and asked, How's your head? Too small to hold the pain inside, Rue replied. Why did I do that? Eric shrugged. I sort of wondered myself. You seemed to be working very hard at being happy. Rue nodded. Truth to tell, I'm scared witless. Me, a father. Taking Eric away from the wagon, he said to Duncan, Check the horses, will you? When they were out of earshot, Rue said, What do I know about being a father? All my old man ever did was beat on me. I mean, what am I supposed to do when the baby gets here? Eric said, You're asking the wrong man. I never had any sort of father. Panic surfaced on Rue's face. What am I going to do, Eric? Eric grinned. You're only going through what we all go through, I bet. It's a big change. First a wife, now a child. He rubbed his chin. I've wondered what I would do if I fell in love and got married, had children. And? I really don't know. Some help you are. Eric put his hand upon Rue's shoulder. Well, I did come up with one thing. I imagine if I'm ever a father and something happened that I don't anticipate, I'm going to ask myself, what would Milo do now? Rue pondered that a moment. Then he smiled. He's the best dad I've ever seen, the way he treated Rosalind and you as kids. That's how I figure it, said Eric. If I start to get confused, I'll just imagine what Milo would do and try to do that. As if this somehow made the prospect of being a father less fearful, Rue brightened. Well, I think I'll have another drink of water. Eric laughed. Take it easy, Rue. You have a lot of time to recover from last night. Rue turned back toward the wagon. So why are you in charge of this escort? He inquired. I asked for it, said Eric. Things are under control back at the palace, and the prince seems to think this cargo needed special protection, and I haven't been home in a year. Rue blinked. It has been a year, hasn't it? Eric said, This way we'll have two visits, a short one on the way through, and we can probably steal an extra day on the way back for a proper get-together. Rue said, Well, you've got your mother and Nathan, Milo, Rosalind, lots of friends. You've also got some friends, Rue. Rue smiled. I wonder how Gwen is doing. Eric's brow furrowed. You're a married man, Rue. Reaching under the buckboard, Rue pulled out a bag of provisions and dug out some bread. Yanking off a piece, he stuffed it in his mouth and washed it down with another gulp of water. I'm not that married, said Rue. Eric's expression turned dark. Rue held up one hand. I mean, I'm not so married I can't be civil to old friends just because they're women. Eric studied his friend's face a moment, then said, 
If that's what you mean. Duncan returned from looking over the horses and reported, Everything's fine. Rue climbed back up on the buckboard and said, Well, let's get moving again. The Duke of Salador is expecting this cargo, and we're getting a bonus for speed. Duncan sighed. The buckboard was about as comfortable as a moving block of stone. I hope it's a very good bonus, he said with poorly concealed ill humor. The journey went smoothly. Twice the presence of Eric's guards had speeded up accounting with the local constabulary, saving Rue precious hours. The visit in Ravensburg had been a hasty one, with them rolling into Milo's Inn of the Pintail after sundown and leaving before sunrise, without seeing Rosalind and her family. Eric promised his mother he would linger on the way back. In Dartmoor, if the local guards recognized Eric or Rue, they said nothing. Still, Rue found he felt considerably better once that city had fallen behind them. As a child, Rue had accompanied his father on the journey to Salador only twice, and now he saw the eastern realm with the eyes of an adult. The lands through which they passed had been cultivated for centuries. Farms were tidy to the point of appearing like miniatures painted by artists when seen from the distant road. Compared to this, the western realm was still rough-hewn, and the lands across the sea primitive and wild. They reached the city gates at noon, and Eric hardly slowed as he passed the city watch, shouting, Cargo from the prince for the duke. One of his soldiers had carried a pennant, which was now unfurled. It bore the crest of the prince of Crondor. That morning the soldiers had donned the tabards they had carried in their saddlebags, and Rue saw that his escort was comprised of not just city troops, but Prince Patrick's own household guard. Rue wondered again what his cargo was but knew that he might never find out. They rode through the city, and Rue was astonished at the number of people. Crondor might be the capital of the western realm, but it was dwarfed in size by several of the eastern cities. Salador was the second largest city in the kingdom after Villanon, and it took more than an hour for Rue's wagon to roll through the press of the crowds and reach the ducal palace. The prince's palace in Crondor sat atop a suddenly rising prominence hard against the harbor. Salador's ruler's home also sat atop a hill, but over a mile from the harbor. A long, sloping hillside led down into the heart of the city, and far beyond that, Rue could see the harbor. I always forget how damn big it is, said Duncan. I never realized, was all Rue said. They reached the palace, and Eric announced them to the palace guard. The guard waved the wagon through, while another ran to the main hall to inform the duke. A third guard directed Rue's wagon to a large double-door entrance set off to one side of a sharply rising broad flight of stairs. Duncan said, Must be important people who get to walk up those steps. He leaped down from the wagon and, with a nod of his head toward the door, said, For the common folks. Rue said, Did you expect anything else? Duncan sighed, rubbing his backside in exaggerated relief. All I know is that tonight I want a hot tub to soak in and a hot woman to keep me warm the rest of the night. Rue smiled. I'm sure that can be arranged. The doors to the palace opened, and down the steps came a well-dressed young man with a court retinue following behind. Then Rue noticed that the retinue was arranged in a loose circle around an elderly woman. Easily in her eighties, she still moved with a sure step and carried herself erect. She held an ornate walking stick with a golden hilt, but it was as much for effect as for support. Her gray hair was swept up in a fashion new to Rue and set with jeweled pins of gold. The young man moved to where Eric waited, and Eric bowed. My lord. Grandmother, said the young man to the elderly woman, it's here. The two large doors next to the steps opened, and servants in the livery of the ducal household ran forth. The young man waved his hand toward the wagon, and they began to untie the tarpaulin covering the cargo. The six large boxes were carefully handed down. The woman pointed to the first box. Open it. The servants complied. The woman poked into a loose assortment of clothing and moved it around with a walking stick. This isn't much to show for a lifetime, is it? Rue and Duncan exchanged glances, and the young man said to Eric, Tell Cousin Patrick... We are all grateful for this. Grandmother? The old woman smiled, and Rue saw a hint of youthful beauty that must have been something to behold. Yes, we are thankful. She motioned for her servants to pick up the boxes and said, Arutha, 
he was always special to me. After my husband, I miss him most of all. She seemed lost in thought, then said, Duncan. Duncan stepped forward, confusion on his face, as the young man said, Grandmother? Man? asked Duncan. The old woman glanced at the two men and smiled. I was speaking to my grandson, sir, she said to Duncan Avery. I take it your name is also Duncan. Duncan removed his hat and swept into his most courtly bow. Duncan Avery at your service, ma'am. To her grandson, the woman said, Tell your father I shall join his court shortly, Duncan. The young man nodded, glanced at the other Duncan, then hurried up the stairs. Coming to stand before Duncan Avery, she peered into his face. I know you, she said quietly. Duncan smiled his most charming smile. Madam, I hardly count that possible. I am certain, had we met, I would have no doubt about it. The woman laughed, and Rue found it a surprisingly youthful sound from one so old. She tapped his chest with her finger. I was right. I do know you. I married you. She turned away, and as she returned to the waiting retinue, said, Or oh, someone very much like you once, a long time ago. Without looking back, she added, And if I ever see you within speaking distance of any of my granddaughters, I'll have you horsewhipped from the city. Duncan looked at Rue with fleeting alarm crossing his face. Then the old woman looked at him as she mounted the first step, and Rue saw the mischief in her smile as she said, or brought to my quarters. Have a pleasant trip, gentlemen. To Eric she said, Sergeant, tell my grandnephew I am grateful for these keepsakes of my brother. Eric saluted. My lady, he said. Rue went over to Eric. Who was that? he asked. Eric said, The Lady Carline, Dowager Duchess of Salador, the King's aunt. Duncan laughed. She must have been something once. Rue elbowed his cousin in the ribs and said, Seems she still is. They returned to the wagons, and Duncan said, So that was the precious cargo, some old clothes and whatever. Rue mounted the wagon and said, So it seems, but she certainly seemed to set great store by it. Duncan mounted the wagon, and Rue called out, Where to now, Eric? Eric said, In of the nimble coachman. We passed it on the way here. They have the royal account. Rue knew that meant he and Duncan would stay the night at the prince's expense, and he smiled. Every coin he saved now would be put back into the business, to compensate for the riches lost when Helmut was murdered. At the thought of his former partner's murder, Rue's thoughts turned dark again, and he found his merriment fleeing. The inn was modest but clean, and Rue enjoyed a hot bath after the long journey. Duncan found his willing barmaid, and Rue found himself left alone with Eric and the squad of soldiers. Rue motioned for Eric to sit with him, and when he was sure he was out of earshot of the soldiers, he asked in a low voice, Do you know what's going on? Eric said, About what? This rush shipment of old clothing? Eric shrugged. I think it's just some things belonging to the old prince that Prince Patrick thought his great aunt would want to have. That part I understand, said Rue. I understand why they want me to bring things into the palace. He left unsaid what they both knew about that contract. But this cargo could have gone to anyone, and why the rush? Maybe the old woman is ill, said Eric. Rue shook his head. Hardly. She looked like she might yank Duncan's trousers down. Eric laughed. She was kind of outspoken, wasn't she? Rue said, Is the Longville doing me a favor? Eric shook his head. Not him. He has nothing to say in this. Fact is, no one in the military does, either our command or the palace. Your selection was handled by the office of the Chancellor. Which means Duke James. I guess, answered Eric, suddenly yawning. I'm tired. Why don't you worry about this tomorrow? Besides, who cares if it's a pointless job as long as it pays well? He stood and motioned for his men to retire for the night. Rue sat alone for a long minute, and a barmaid came over to see if he wanted anything. She smiled at him. He inspected her with a young man's eyes, then shook his head. 
to the chair Eric had just vacated, Rue at last said, I care. Back in Ravensburg, the homecoming was far more festive than before. Knowing that Rue was returning, the locals planned a small party. Eric and his guards had left Salador the morning after the delivery, while Rue and Duncan had set out to track down some of the mysterious accounts on the ledger Jason had found. A few of them had been known to Carly, and by using deduction during the conversation with those people, Rue identified all those in the Salador area in quick order. With each of those accounts, he discovered a different reason for the discretion exhibited by Helmut Grindel. All but one had agreed to continue doing business with Rue's new company, and that one had paid off his account in full. Rue was satisfied with the overall outcome. Eric had ridden ahead so he could spend a few days in Ravensburg. Rue felt no pressing need to linger in the town of his boyhood and was content to spend but one night there before moving on back to his new home in Crondor. At least sixty people were crowded into the common room of the Inn of the Pintail, and Eric was grinning at the attention. Rue watched his friend from across the crowded room, feeling envy. Always something of a rogue in Ravensburg, Rue knew everyone, but had few friends. Eric, on the other hand, had always been everyone's friend, including Rue's. Rue smiled, despite his somewhat subdued mood. Eric's mother, Frida, long the resident rain cloud in Rue's life, came into the room through the kitchen door looking like a sunburst. She smiled at the sight of her son and husband talking together. Marriage certainly had agreed with Frida, Rue was forced to concede. He wondered if he would ever find such pleasure in wife and family. Thinking of Carly, he felt some concern. Yet women had been having babies since the dawn of time, and what could he accomplish by being near her? Making his fortune, providing for her and the child was the most important thing Rue could do. You're lost, aren't you? asked a feminine voice. Rue glanced up to see a familiar face. He smiled. Gwen, hello! The girl sat down. An old friend, she reached across the table and patted Rue's hand. Thought I might run into you and that cousin of yours, she said. Then, with a twist of her head, she indicated Duncan at the other side of the room, deep in conversation with a young girl unknown to Rue. Seems Aline found Duncan first. Aline? Bertram's little sister? Rue looked again at the girl and saw that she was a little younger than he had thought her to be when Duncan first began flirting with her. The last time he had seen the girl, she had been shapeless. Now, given the plunging neckline of her blouse, he could see some shape had definitely manifested itself over the last three years. Gwen twirled a strand of her hair absently as she said, What about you? Rue said, I'm doing fine. I'm owner of a freight company now. Gwen's smile broadened. Owner? How'd you manage that? Rue mentioned the death of his partner, and in his telling of his story he overstated his own skills only a little. Frida came by and filled Rue's wine glass, smiling at him while she did. Rue said, She's changed. She's found a good man, said Gwen. What about you? asked Rue, taking a deep drink. Gwen sighed dramatically. Like most of the town girls his own age, Rue knew, she had spent her evenings down by the fountain in the center of town flirting with the local boys, and unlike most girls, she was still unwed. The good ones are taken. She feigned a pout. Drawing a fingernail across the back of Rue's hand, she said, Things haven't been the same since you and Eric left Ravensburg. Rue grinned. Getting dull? You could say that. Gwen glanced over at Duncan, who now was whispering something into Aline's ear. The girl's eyes widened, and she blushed, then burst out laughing, covering her mouth with her hand. Softly, Gwen said, Well, that's one little flower that's going to get plucked tonight. Her sour tone wasn't lost on Rue. It was now obvious that Gwen had heard Duncan was here, and had come looking for him. As a boy, Rue had slept with a girl a few times, Gwen was one of the more agreeable girls in that regard in the town, which had probably contributed to no boys asking for her hand in marriage. Ruth thought it was more likely that there simply were more girls than boys his age as he grew up. There were bound to be those who didn't find husbands. Still, he liked Gwen. Leave your father's house and find a position at an inn, advised Rue. And why should I do a thing like that? asked Gwen. 
Rue grinned as the wine warmed him. Because then you might find a rich merchant passing through, whose fancy you might catch. Gwen laughed. She took a sip of wine. Rich like you? Rue blushed. I'm not rich. I'm working hard at it, though. So you're going to be rich some day? She pressed. Feeling his spirits lifting, he said, Let me tell you something about what I'm going to do. Gwen motioned for Frida to bring more wine and sat back to listen to Rue spin his tales of ambition. Rue winced at the sound of someone slamming a door down the hall. Then he shuddered as someone pounded on his bedroom door. What? he croaked. Eric's voice came from beyond the door. Get dressed. We leave in an hour. Rue felt the way he had the day they had left Crondor. I've got to stop doing this, he groaned. What? said a sleepy voice next to him. Suddenly Rue was wide awake and sober. He looked to his right and saw Gwen wrapped up in the bedsheets. Cots, Rue whispered. What? asked Gwen. What are you doing here? said Rue as he scrambled out of bed, reaching for his clothing. Letting the sheets drop away, Gwen stretched, showing off her body to good effect, and said, I'll come back here and I'll show you. Again? Rue pulled on his pants. I can't! Gods! I didn't... Did I? Gwen's expression clouded as she said, You most certainly did more than once. What is the problem, Rue? It's not the first time you and I have sported. Uh, he said, not certain what he could possibly say to explain this away. He sat and pulled on his boots as quickly as he could. Well, it's just... What? said Gwen, now certain she wasn't going to like what she was about to hear. Draping his shirt over his arm and grabbing his coat off the floor, Rue said, Well, it's just... I thought I might have mentioned it last night, but I married. What? came the shriek as he opened the door. You bastard! she shouted as she threw the porcelain wash bowl that had rested a moment before on the nightstand next to the bed. It shattered loudly as Rue hurried down the stairs. He found a Duncan outside and said, Is the wagon ready? Duncan nodded. I told the smith's apprentice to hitch it up when you didn't come down to breakfast this morning. Seeing the agitated condition his cousin was in, Duncan said, Is something wrong? As if to answer his question, a loud shriek of outrage could be heard from inside the inn. Frida, Nathan, and Milo, who had been saying goodbye to Eric, glanced back at the inn, but Rue didn't look back. He climbed up into the wagon, took the reins, and said, We're leaving. Eric nodded, signaled his squad to form up, and motioned them to follow after Rue's wagon, while Duncan had to jump to get up on the wagon before it left him behind. What was that? asked Duncan with a grin. Rue turned and warned, You will say nothing, not a thing. Do you understand? Duncan only nodded and laughed. Twelve. Expansion. The baby squirmed. Eric smiled as he stood at Rue's side, while the priest of Sung the White, goddess of purity, blessed the child on her naming day. At the appropriate moment, Rue quickly handed the child back to Carly. The priest said, Abigail Avery, in this your pure and innocent time of life, know that you are blessed in the sight of the goddess. If you remain true and good, doing harm to no one, then shall you abide in her grace. Blessed be her name. Blessed be, Rue, Carly, and Eric repeated, completing the ritual of greeting. The priest nodded and smiled and said, She's a beautiful girl. Rue forced a smile. He had so expected a son that when, a week before, Carly had begun her labor and produced a girl, he had been completely unprepared. They had argued for hours about the boy's name, Rue wanting to call his son Rupert after himself, so that he could look upon himself as the founder of a dynasty, but Carly holding out for Helmut, after her father. Then, at the moment Carly had asked, What shall we name her? Rue had stood dumbfounded, without an answer. Carly had asked, Might we name her Abigail, after my mother? Andrew had nodded, not having words to express himself. The priest left the bedchamber, and Carly put the child at her breast. Eric motioned for Rue to follow him and led his friend out of the room. She'll be a fine daughter, said Eric. Rue shrugged as he walked down the stairs with Eric. I guess. Truth to tell, I expected a boy. Maybe next time. Eric said, Don't be too disappointed. I think Carly would be very upset if you were disappointed. Do you? said Rue, glancing up the stairs. Well, I'll go back and fuss a little over the child and pretend I'm thrilled. Eric's gaze narrowed, but he said nothing. 
He moved toward the door and retrieved his cloak and a broad-brimmed slouch hat. It was raining in Crondor, and he had gotten soaked coming to witness the ceremony. "'I guess I might as well tell you now,' he said as his hand rested on the door latch. "'What?' "'I probably won't be seeing you for some time.' "'Why?' asked Rue, his face betraying something close to panic. Eric was one of the few people in the world he felt he could trust and rely upon. "'I'm leaving. Soon. It was supposed to be Jada, but he broke his leg last week.' He lowered his voice. "'I can't tell you where, but I think you know.' Rue's expression revealed concern. "'How long?' "'I don't know. We've got some bloody work ahead of us, and, well, it may be a very long time.' Rue gripped his friend's arm as if to hold him there. After a moment he squeezed Eric's arm and said, "'Stay alive. If I can, I will.' Then Rue had his arms around his friend, hugging him closely. "'You're the only damn brother I ever had, Eric von Dockmoor. I'll be very angry if I learn you're dead before you get a chance to see my son.' Eric awkwardly returned the hug, then disengaged himself from Rue. "'Keep an eye on Greylock. He was supposed to go, but the Longville threw a fit at being left behind.' Eric managed a wry smile. It's going to be an interesting trip. Sure you don't want to come with us? Rue laughed a humorless laugh. I can do without that sort of interesting. He motioned toward the upstairs room. I have people to take care of. So you do, said Eric with a smile. Just see you do a good job, or I'll be back to haunt you. Just come back and you can do what you want, said Rue. Eric nodded, opened the door, and was gone. Rue stood motionless, feeling an absence more profound than any he had known in his life. He remained there for a while, and when he at last broke out of his reverie, he pulled his cloak off the peg and left for the shop. He forgot to go upstairs and make a fuss over the baby. Jason signaled to Rue, who moved across the crowded warehouse. Business had been building steadily for the last six months, and now they had twenty-six full-time drivers and a score of apprentices. What is it? asked Rue. Jason held out a parchment without any seal on it. The only marking on the outside was Rue's name. This was just delivered. It came by royal post. Rue took it and opened it. It said, A Quaggan trader has put in at Sarth. John. Rue's brow furrowed as he considered the importance of the message. Then he said, Tell Duncan we leave at once for Sarth. Jason nodded. Duncan came from the small apartment he and Louise still shared in the rear. Jason had taken Rue's space in the tiny apartment, since Rue was now living with his family. What is it? he asked, obviously having been wakened from a nap. Remember John Vincy up at Sarth? Duncan yawned widely as he nodded. What of him? He's sent us a message. What's it say? asked Duncan. A Quaggan trader has put in. Duncan looked uncertain a moment, then his face lit up with a smile. A Quaggan trader in Sarth can mean only one thing. He lowered his voice. Contraband. Rue held up a finger, indicating silence. Something requiring discretion. To Jason, he said, After I'm gone, send word to Carly, telling her I'll be gone for a week or so. As the newly serviced wagon was fitted and food and water skins loaded aboard, Rue speculated on what it was that Vincey wanted to sell him. He kept wondering as they rolled out of the yard into the city and started their way north. The trip to Sarth had proven uneventful. Rue felt a strange discomfort listening to Duncan rattle on about this barmaid or that game of dice. He couldn't put his finger on it, but he felt as if there was something back in Crondor left unattended, and that vague uneasiness was growing into full-blown worry by the time they reached Sarth. They arrived at sundown and went straight to the shop of John Vincey. They pulled up in front, and Rue jumped down. Let me talk to him a moment, he said to Duncan. Then we'll head for the inn. Very well, Duncan agreed. Rue went inside, and Vincey said, Ah, it's you. I was just about to close. Would you like to dine with my family? Rue said, Certainly. Now, what is this mysterious note you sent me? Vincey went to the door and locked it. He motioned for Rue to follow him to the back room. Two things. As I said in the note, a Quaggan trader arrived here a little over a week ago. The captain was anxious to dispose of an item, and when I saw it, I thought of you. He took down a large box and opened it. Inside, Rue saw a very elegant-looking set of rubies, mounted in a display case, 
as if for presentation. He had never seen anything like it, but Helmut had mentioned such displays to him, and he didn't need more than a moment to know what it meant. Stolen. Well, the trader seemed ready to take whatever I agreed to give him before he returned to Quegg. Rue thought a moment. What did you pay for it? John looked at Rue askance a moment. What matter is that to you? What is it worth? Your life, if the Quaggan noble who ordered it to present to his mistress finds out you have it, answered Rowe. Look, I'm going to have to ship that to the Eastern Realm if I take it off your hands. No noble in the Western Realm is going to give those to his wife, have her wear them to a reception, and encounter some Quaggan envoy who recognizes them for what they are. John looked uncertain. How would they know? Rue pointed to the stones. It's a matched set, John. There are five brilliant matched stones, and a dozen smaller ones. But all are cut in identical fashion. The case is... He took it, closed it, and turned it over. Look here. He pointed to a line of symbols cut into the wood. I don't read, Quaggan, said John. And I can fly, said Rue. Don't lie to a liar, John. Vinci is no kingdom name. What is it, short for Vincenti? John grinned. Vincentius. My grandfather was an escaped Quaggan slave who kept his master's surname. He glanced at the mark. So this was made by commission from Lord Vesarius by Sicalus Gracianus, master jeweler. Get a new box? Rue said, Because that gem cutter will know these rubies like he knows his own children, he has certainly let it be known they are gone. If they show up anywhere west of Darkmoor, he will know within a month who has them and who they were purchased from. The hunt will be on. The only way you're going to keep your throat intact will be to stop pulling my finger and tell me what you paid. John didn't look convinced. Ten thousand sovereigns? Rue laughed. Try again. John said, very well, five thousand. Rue said, I'm sorry I can't hear you. What was it you said? John said, I paid a thousand gold sovereigns. Where did you get a thousand sovereigns? asked Rue. Some I had saved and the rest in trade. He needed to refit. On his way to Kesh or the free cities, was he? said Rue. In something of a hurry, said John. He stole the box or had it stolen before he realized how difficult it would be to dispose of the booty. He shrugged. His loss, our gain. Rue nodded. Here's what I'll do. You can have either 2,000 sovereigns gold now, or I'll give you a third of what I can fetch in the east. But you'll have to wait. John considered only a moment. I'll take the gold now. Rue said, I thought you would. Reaching into his tunic, he pulled out a heavy purse. I can give you a hundred now and a letter of account. The gold is in Crondor. That's not gold now, Rue. Rue shook his head. All right. Make it twenty-one hundred. A hundred now and two thousand on a letter. Done. I'm heading to Crondor next month, and I'll present the letter then. Take it to my office, and I'll see you're paid. Or you can have a line of credit. What, so you can have the merchants jack up the prices for a kickback and get your price discounted? Rue laughed. John, why don't you work for me? John said. What do you mean? Let me buy this miserable shop of yours and close it up. Bring your family down to Crondor and run a shop for me. I'll pay you more than you'll ever make here. Your talents are wasted in Sarth. John said, Crondor? Never thought much of living in a city. Let me think on it. You do that, said Rue. I'm heading for the inn. I'll come by your home later for supper. I have my cousin with me. Bring him along, said John, and we can talk of that other matter I mentioned. Good, said Rue letting himself out of the store. He felt good. It might take a couple of months, but those rubies would fetch him at least five thousand sovereigns profit. As he climbed into the wagon, Duncan said, That took you long enough. Taking the reins, Rue grinned. It was worth it. John's family was crowded into a small house a short distance behind his shop, 
separated from the shop by a small garden in which John's wife grew vegetables. Rue and Duncan were admitted by John, who was now puffing on a long pipe. He offered them a mug each of a fair ale, while Annie, his wife, prepared dinner in the kitchen, aided by several children. Rue found the noise nerve-wracking as the younger three children half played, half scuffled underfoot, while John sat ignoring them. "'Don't you find this a little much?' asked Rue. "'What?' said John. "'The noise!' John laughed. "'You get used to it. You obviously don't have children.' Rue blushed. "'Actually, I do have a baby.' John shook his head. "'Then get used to it.' Duncan said, "'Very nice ale.' John said, eh, it's nothing special, but I do enjoy a mug between closing the shop and supper. What's this other matter you mentioned? asked Rue. While he was talking, the Quaggan trader whom I did business with mentioned something I thought you might find interesting. What is it? If you can turn this to a profit, what's my cut? Rue glanced at Duncan. It depends, John. Information is sometimes very useful to one person and worthless to another. I know about those trading consortiums down in Crondor, and you're the sort of man to be involved with them. Rue laughed. Not yet, but I do know my way around the trading floor at Barrett's. If there's something you know that I can trade for gold at Barrett's, I'll give you two percent of what I make. John considered. More. Take the two thousand gold sovereigns you owe me and invest it with your own gold. He leaned forward. Make me a partner, Rue said. Done, for this one transaction. Here's what I know, began John. The Quaggan captain I talked to said that a friend of his had sailed a cargo to Margrave's port. While he was there, rumors were spreading through the city that there was some sort of pest infesting the wheat fields outside the city. He dropped his voice, as if fearing somehow to be overheard in his own house. Grasshoppers. Rue looked confused. So? There are grasshoppers everywhere. John said, Not like these. If the farmer is mentioning grasshoppers, what they're talking about is a lot worse. Locusts. Rue sat back, stunned. If this is true, he calculated. If that news hasn't reached Crondor yet, he jumped to his feet. Duncan, we're leaving now. John, I will invest the gold I owe you. For if this rumor turns out to be false, I'll be too poor to pay you what I owe you anyway. But if it's true, we'll both be rich men. Duncan was out of his seat, looking confused, as Annie stuck her head through the kitchen door. Supper's ready. Are we going to eat? said Duncan. Who didn't fly? He half pushed Duncan out of the door as Duncan complained. I don't follow. What's going on? I'll explain it to you on our way south. We'll eat while we drive. Duncan made an aggravated sound as they hurried to the inn, where they would need to tack up a tired team of horses and get started on a hurried trip home. Duncan said, I see something ahead. Rue, who had been dozing a bit while his cousin took a turn driving the team, was instantly alert. It was an uneventful trip, despite their hurrying to the horse's limits. Usually between Sarth and Crondor, this was the case, but even though they were still inside the well-patrolled principality, outlaws and the occasional goblin raid were not unheard of. As they moved up the road, another wagon could be seen. It was pulled over to the side of the road, and the driver was waving. Rue pulled up, and the driver said, Can you help me? What's the problem? asked Rue. I've got a busted hub. He pointed to the rear wheel, looking nervous. And my master will be furious if this cargo is late. Rue took a second look at the wagon. Who's your master? I'm a teamster for Jacoby and Sons, answered the driver. Rue laughed. I know your master. Yes, you'll be upset if you're delayed. What cargo? At that, the driver looked very uncomfortable. Just some trade goods from Sarth? Rue glanced at Duncan, who nodded and jumped down. My friend, said Duncan, we're in a position to be of service. He slowly drew his sword and pointed at the wagon. First, we're going to unload your cargo and put it in our wagon, which, as you can see, is presently empty. Then we will replace our very tired horses with your rested and fresh animals. The driver looked as if he was going to bolt, but Rue had come around the other side of his horses and stood between the driver and Freedom. The timid man said, Please don't hurt me. Duncan smiled. My friend, that is the last thing we wish to do. Now, why don't you get started on unloading while my companion inspects your bill of lading? 
The man's eyes grew wide as he headed for the back of the wagon. Unfastening the last tie-down, he said, The paperwork is coming by messenger. Later. Rue laughed. And the guard at the city gate, who Tim Jacoby has paid off, will believe that nonsense, I'm certain? The driver nodded and sighed. You know the routine, obviously. He lifted a large box out of the wagon and carried it over to Rue's wagon. Duncan lowered the tailgate, and the man shoved the box in, pushing it deep into the wagon. You realize you're going to get me killed? I doubt it, said Rue. You've got a busted wheel, and when you reach Crondor, you'll have a wonderful tale to tell of the brave fight you put up against overwhelming odds. Duncan chimed in. Your bravery is undoubted, and you risked your life against six bandits. No, seven bandits for your master's cargo. Why, I'd buy you a drink in any inn in Crondor to hear that story again. What's the cargo? asked Rue. Might as well tell you, said the driver as he carried the second box over to Rue's wagon. Quiggin luxuries. My master sent me up to Sarth to meet with a Quiggin captain who made an unscheduled stop there. The royal customs house was closed because the customs officer in Sarth is dead. When did that happen? asked Rue, suddenly very interested. Over a year ago. The driver laughed bitterly. For whatever reason, new prince in the city or some other thing, there's been no replacement up there since. Makes it easy to pick up goods there and bring them down to the city. As you said, if you know the right city gate in which guard sergeant to talk to, getting into the city with any cargo is an easy task. Rue said, Would you be willing to mention the time and gate? What's in it for me? Asked the driver, and suddenly Rue was laughing. Your loyalty to the Jacobis is unmatched. The driver shrugged, then jumped into the wagon to grab the last box. Do you know Tim? Rue nodded. Well enough. Then you know he's a swine. His father, Frederick, when he was in charge, well, he's a tough old boot, but he was mostly fair. If you did something well, there was a little extra in it for you. Randolph's a decent enough fellow. But Tim, said the driver, carrying the box over to Rue's wagon. Now there's a piece of work. He's the sort that if you do a perfect job, why, that's what he's paying you for. But if you make the tiniest mistake, you're as likely to get a knife between your ribs as a pat on the back. He has these two bashers who are with him all the time. He's a rough customer. Rue glanced at Duncan. At least he thinks he is. He asked the driver, What's your name? Jeffrey, answered the driver. Well, Jeffrey, said Rue, you've been very helpful. He reached into his purse and pulled out a gold coin. The gate and time? Just before you get to the city, turn off along the sea trail and come to the small gate that leads to the fishing harbor to the north of the city. That's the gate. During the day watch, it's a sergeant named Diggs. He's taking Jacoby gold. Are you known to him? The driver nodded. But Jacoby uses a lot of different teamsters to cover his tracks. He sometimes hires sailors or farmers if he thinks he might be caught smuggling. Rue nodded, remembering the drunken sailor who had run his wagon into Barrett's front door. So when you see the gate guard, ask for Diggs by name. Tell him you've got netting from Sarth. Netting from Sarth? Anything else and he'll be on you like lice on a beggar. But if you say netting from Sarth, he'll wave you through. Don't mention Jacoby or say anything else. Just say netting from Sarth. And you're in. Rue took out another coin and flipped it to the driver, who suddenly seemed far less troubled by this hijacking. Jeffrey said, You'd better mark me up some so Tim Jacoby doesn't kill me. Rue nodded, and Duncan struck the man hard across the face with the back of his hand. Jeffrey spun around and fell to the ground, and Rue could see a red welt appearing on his cheek. Jeffrey shook his head and stood up. Better close one of my eyes, he said as he tore his own tunic. Duncan glanced at Rue, who nodded again, and this time Duncan doubled up his fist, drew back, and drove it straight into the man's left eye. He staggered backward and fell hard against the side of Jacoby's wagon, striking the back of his head. He sat heavily on the ground, and for a moment Rue thought he might lose consciousness, but instead he fell over on his side and started rolling in the dirt. Then, with wobbling knees, he stood up. One more ought to do it, he said in hoarse tones. Rue raised his hand, and Duncan held his blow. When you're discharged by Jacoby, come see me about a position. Squinting with his good eye, the driver said, Who are you? Rupert Avery. 
The man laughed, a strangled laugh. Oh, this is rich. Just the mention of your name makes Tim crap in his trousers. No one knows what it was you'd done to him, but he's got some major hate for you, Mr. Avery. Rue said, the feeling is mutual. He killed my partner. Jeffrey said, well, I'd heard rumors, but that was all. Now, if we could get this over with, I'll be along after I lay low a bit, and then I'll be talking to you about that job. Rue nodded, and Duncan unleashed a heavy blow, striking Jeffrey hard enough to lift him off his heels. The man turned in the air as he fell again, this time not rising. Duncan leaned over and looked at the unconscious man. He knows how to take it, that's for certain. He'll live. He's tough enough, said Rue. And even if I don't hire him, I want to know as much as he does about how the Jacobis operate. Duncan said, Well, we'd better be along before a patrol rides by. It might be difficult to explain all this. Rue nodded. Both men mounted up, and Rue headed the wagon down the highway. The return to Crondor went uneventfully. The only tense moment was when they reached the indicated gate and the soldier inquired about their cargo. Rue asked for Sergeant Diggs by name, and after Rue told him the cargo, the sergeant hesitated a moment before waving them through. Rue had taken a circuitous route through the city in case they were being followed, and finally reached his own shop. Luis was overseeing the dispatch of four wagons that were to meet with a caravan outside the city and carry goods into the palace. Rue quickly unloaded the goods they had taken from Jacoby's wagon and opened each box for inspection. As he had suspected, the items involved were all high tariff. A couple of small boxes contained what appeared to be drugs. Duncan said, I'm no expert, but I think those are dream and joy. I'm not a user, but I've caught a whiff of them in some of the places I've visited. Dream was a drug that induced hallucinations, and joy caused euphoria. Both were dangerous, illegal, and highly profitable. End of Side 6 What do you think boxes like that would be worth? asked Rue. Duncan replied, As I said, I'm no expert, but I think our friend Jeffrey may end up floating in the harbor for letting us boost it from Jacoby. Maybe 10,000 gold? I don't know. I don't even know who you'd sell it to. Rue calculated. Find out, will you? Start with that girl over at the inn of the Broken Shield, Catherine. She's a former mocker and would know if there's an apothecary in the city who would be a discreet buyer. The other boxes contained some jewelry, probably stolen, as the rubies were. After Duncan departed, Rue called Jason over from his work desk. How much gold can we get our hands on in a hurry? Jason said, you want an exact figure or rough? Rough for now. Thirteen, fourteen thousand gold, plus whatever you can raise selling this stuff. Rue rubbed his chin as he thought. Prudence dictated he sell the jewelry as far from Quegg as possible, lest he run the risk of finding some angry Queggan lord's hired assassin in his bedchamber one night. Luis came into the room from seeing the wagons leave for the caravanserai, and Rue asked, Has Eric left yet? Saw him last night at the inn, why? Rue said, I'll tell you when I get back. He hurried out of the office, running after Duncan. Rue glanced around the room and saw that Eric was nowhere in sight. He and Duncan crossed to where the girl Catherine worked, and Rue said, Has Eric left yet? The girl shrugged. Saw him here last night, why? I need to talk to him. To Duncan, he said, See if she can help us, and I'm off to the palace. I'll come back here when I'm done. Good, said Duncan, slapping his hand on the bar and winking at the girl. I've a throat full of road dust and haven't seen a pretty face in weeks. Catherine threw him a withering look, but said, What'll you have to drink? Ale, my lovely, said Duncan, as Rue hurried out of the inn. It took a few minutes to convince the gate guard to send for Eric. The guard didn't realize whom he was speaking to, as Rue always showed up on a wagon early in the morning, not on foot late in the day. Eric arrived ten minutes later and said, What is it? I need to talk to you a minute. Eric waved him through the gate, and they walked to where they were out of earshot of the other soldiers. How much gold do you have? asked Rue. Eric blinked. Gold? Why? I need a loan. Eric laughed. For what? 
I've got this information, Rue said. I don't have a lot of time. I need twenty thousand gold pieces. I have maybe fourteen and can raise another three or four. I just thought I'd see if you wanted to get in on this investment. Eric considered. Well, it's not like I'm going to need a lot of gold where I'm going. Rue blinked as realization came to him that he and Eric had already bidden each other goodbye. When do you leave? Eric said, we sail day after tomorrow, but that's not to be shared with anyone. Rue said, I'm sorry, Eric, I wasn't thinking. You have a great deal on your mind and a lot to do. Things are pretty much under control, actually. He stared at Rue a moment. Important? Very, said Rue. I haven't even been home yet. Well, come along. He led Rue through the palace to the office of the Chancellor. Duke James's secretary said, Sir? It occurs to me that I haven't drawn my pay in a while. Could you tell me how much I have on accounts? The secretary said, A moment, sir. He opened up a larger leather-bound ledger and consulted it. The inner door opened, and Lord James exited his private office suite. Ron Darkmore, he said with a nod. Then he caught sight of Rue. Avery? What brings you here? Thinking of enlisting again? Rue smiled, despite finding no humor in the remark. But the man was Duke of Condor, after all. My lord, he said in greeting. No, I was asking my friend for a loan for a business investment. James stopped, and his eyes narrowed. You're seeking investors? Yes, answered Rue. The old Duke studied Rue's face a moment, then waved him to follow. Come in, both of you. Once inside, James signaled to Eric to close the door, and when they were alone, sat down. Looking at Rue, he said, What's the scam? Rue blinked. It's no scam, my lord. I've come into some information which may give me a position that will bring great profit. James sat back in his chair. Care to share that information with me? With all due respect, no, my lord. Duke James laughed. You're direct enough. Let me rephrase this. Tell me. Rue looked first at James, then at Eric, and finally said, Very well, but only if you promise not to interfere with my investments, my lord. Eric looked scandalized at Rue's affront to the Duke's dignity, but the Duke only looked amused. I make no promises, young Rupert, but trust me when I say that the kinds of sums of money you're thinking about interest me very little. My concerns have more to do with the safety and well-being of the realm. Well, then said Rue. It's about the wheat crop in the free cities. What about them? asked James, now keenly interested. Locusts. James sat, blinked, and then broke into laughter. And where did you get this tidbit? Rue explained about the chain of news, without going into detail about what brought a Quaggan trader to Sarth, and when he was finished, James said, so what do you propose to do? Buy up all the wheat in the West, then hold the free city's trading representatives hostage? Rue blushed. Not quite. I mean to underwrite as many grain ships as I can. I mean to form a syndicate. That takes time, and I need to find someone at Barrett's who can vouch for me, and time is moving quickly. Now, that's an ambitious plan, said James. He picked up a small bell and rang it. Within a heartbeat, the door opened, and the Duke's secretary said, My lord. How much gold is young von Darkmoor owed by the kingdom? He has nearly a thousand gold sovereigns in back pay coming, my lord. James rubbed his chin. Pay him a thousand, and... He narrowed his gaze. Advance him another two thousand against what we're going to be paying him over the next year. If the secretary was curious why, he said nothing, only bowing slightly and closing the door. Before it was completely shut, Duke James said, and send for my grandson, Dash. Yes, my lord, came the reply as the door shut. The duke stood and said, My two grandsons have come from the court in Rillanon to serve with me. Their parents are still in the capital, as my son must tidy up a few things before joining us. He circled around his desk and said, James, the eldest, has a strong appetite for the army, like his great-uncle William. James smiled. But Dashiell is, well, let's say I'm looking for the proper undertaking to engage his unusual talents. He put his hand on Rue's shoulder. Do you think you could use a clever lad in this soon-to-be-booming enterprise you're building, Mr. Avery? 
Rue wanted to hire a noble's grandchild as much as he wanted a boil on his backside. But sensing the way this conversation was heading, he said, My lord, I would be more than happy to have a bright and talented lad join my concern. As an apprentice, you understand. I can't show favoritism because he's at high station. James laughed at that. Rupert, if you had any idea of my history... Never mind. I think you'll find the boy a quick study, and he's getting a bit underfoot around here. A knock came from the door, and James said, Come in. The door opened, and a young man stepped through. Rue glanced back and forth between the Duke and his grandson. The resemblance was striking. They were of equal height, though the boy might be a finger's width taller. Save for the age, they could have been brothers, not grandfather and grandson. But where the Duke had a beard, the lad was clean-shaven, and where the Duke had nearly white hair, the youth had curly brown locks. "'How would you like to try your hand at commerce?' asked the Duke. "'What do you have up your sleeve, Grandfather?' responded the youngster. "'Something that will keep you out of the gambling halls and taverns, Dash. "'Meet your new employer, Mr. Avery.' Rue nodded. The young man seemed wryly amused at the news that he was now an employee of Avery and Sons. But he merely nodded. Sir, was all he said. Now, go with Mr. Avery, and when you get to Barrett's, ask to see Jerome Masterson. Introduce yourselves and say this, that I would count it a great personal favor if he could facilitate whatever Mr. Avery needs done to establish his little syndicate. To Rue, he said, Good luck, and I hope you don't go broke too quickly. To Eric, he said, I hope you can find a day when you can enjoy all this immense wealth Rupert is going to put aside for you until you return. Eric nodded. I'll say yea to that, sir. To Dash, the Duke said, Come by and visit us from time to time, you rogue. The young man said, That means you're throwing me out of the palace again? James laughed. Something like that. You're Mr. Avery's apprentice until he fires you. So you'll be living wherever he puts you. Rue thought of the already cramped quarters shared by Louis, Duncan, and Jason, but said nothing. The three men left the Duke's office, and Rue found he could hardly breathe. He was so excited by the prospects of the coming opportunity. He barely heard Eric's goodbye as he left the city gate, the grandson of the most powerful noble in the kingdom at his side, his new apprentice. Thirteen. Gamble. Rue cleared his throat. The doorway had turned, and Rue winced as he saw it was Kurt. His old nemesis narrowed his gaze and said, What do you want? I would like to speak with Jerome Masterson, said Rue evenly, ignoring Kurt's lack of civility. Kurt raised one eyebrow, but said nothing. He turned and whispered something to another waiter, a new boy unknown to Rue, who nodded and hurried off. Wait here, said Kurt, walking away. Surly bugger, isn't he? said Dash. He don't know the half of it, said Rue. The second waiter and Kurt returned a few minutes later, and Kurt said, Mr. Masterson regrets that his schedule at this time doesn't present an opportunity to speak with you, perhaps some other time. Rue's temper began to flare. Let me guess, Kurt. You neglected to specify who was asking to see him. Rue pushed through the swinging railing, and Kurt backed away a step. Don't make me send for the city watch, Avery, warned Kurt. Kurt motioned for the young waiter to come closer, and with some hesitancy he did. What did you say to Mr. Masterson? The boy glanced at Kurt, then Rue. I told him what Kurt said to tell him. A former waiter wished a word with him. That's what I thought, said Rue. He instructed the boy, Return and say to Mr. Masterson that Rupert Avery of Avery and Son and the grandson of the Duke of Crondor would appreciate a moment of his time. At mention of the Duke... Dash made a theatrical half-bow, with a wicked grin, and Kurt's face drained of color. He glanced at the now totally confused waiter and said, Do it. Two men returned with the waiter a few moments later. To Rupert's surprise and pleasure, one of them was Sebastian Lender. Young Avery, said Lender, holding out his hand. They shook. Gentlemen, may I present Dashiell, grandson of the Duke of Crondor and the newest member of my company? And may I present Jerome Masterson, said Linder, referring to the stocky man at his side. Masterson wore a short-cut black beard shot with gray, and his hair was cut straight at his collar. 
His clothing was finely made, but of plain design, and he wore a minimum of jewellery. Please, come with me, said Masterson, leading them into the main room of the coffee house. As they left a gaping curt behind, Rue turned and said, My cousin Duncan will be along sometime soon. Please show him to our table the moment he arrives. The order for coffee was put in as they settled around a large table in the corner, and Masterson said, Your grandfather and I are old friends, Dash. Boyhood friends. Dash grinned. I think they understand. Rue did as well. Given what he overheard that night outside the headquarters of the leader of the mockers, he guessed that the Duke wasn't the only former thief to have migrated to a lawful existence. Then there was always the chance that despite his proper appearance, he was still a thief. Masterson said, You look enough like him. It's uncanny. Do you take after him in other ways? He asked with a wink. Dash laughed. I've climbed a wall or two in my time, but I've never picked up the knack for cutting purses. My mother frowned on that sort of thing. They all laughed, and the coffee was served. As each man fixed his cup the way he liked it, Lender said, So, Mr. Avery, I was conducting some routine business with one of my clients when your message came to us. What is this about? Rue glanced at Masterson, who nodded. Lender is my litigator and solicitor, so he would be here even if you didn't know him. I am right in assuming this isn't a social call, am I not? You are indeed, sir, said Rowe. Clearing his throat, he said, I am looking to form a syndicate. Linder glanced at Masterson and then asked, You mean join a syndicate? No, I mean to form one specifically for an investment. Masterson said, I am a partner in several. It might be far easier to propose you as a member of one than to build one from scratch. Rue said, I only worked here a short time, but as I understand the workings of such, if I join a syndicate and propose a venture and the partners vote it down, then I'm out of luck. Yes, that's true, said Masterson. But if I propose the creation of one for the specific purpose of the venture, then only those who wish to participate will accept partnership, and we go forward. That is also true, said Lender. Well, before we rush down that avenue, said Masterson, Let's hear something about your venture, so I can judge the wisdom of starting from scratch. Rue hesitated, but it was Dash who spoke. You're going to have to tell someone sooner or later, Mr. Avery. Rue sighed. His biggest fear was of telling someone in a position to take advantage of the news without benefiting himself. He knew it unlikely from anyone who was recommended by the Duke and the client of Lenders, but he still hesitated. Go on, said Lender. I mean to underwrite shipping. There are dozens of such syndicates already, said Masterson. Why do we need a new one? I want to specialize in grain shipments to the free cities. Masterson and Linder looked at each other. Masterson said, That's usually a fairly short gain, low-risk venture, young man. Unless the Quaggins are in a raiding mood. But as they've been quiet of late, one must suspect you've a different reason to wish to specialize in a relatively dull enterprise. Rue colored a bit. I have reason to believe that the demand for such transport is likely to go up soon, and that there will be a very heavy increase in shipping to the free cities. So I thought I would be in a position to set up some multiple voyage underwriting. Masterson looked at Lender. The lad knows something. Leaning forward, he lowered his voice. Out with it, Rupert. I give you my word that whatever it is, you shall be entitled to a full share based on both your participation and your news. Rue glanced at the other three faces and quietly said, Locusts. I knew it, said Masterson, slapping the table. Lender said, You knew there were locusts in the free cities? No, answered Masterson. I knew there was something that gave him an edge. Again lowering his voice, he said, There's a type of insect called the twenty-year locust that breeds out there. They're due next year, but sometimes they come a year early and sometimes they come a year late. Any news, they are, in fact, on their way. Masterson looked up and signaled to a waiter who hurried over. Masterson said, Would you see if Mr. Crowley and Mr. Hume are upstairs, please? If they are, ask them to please join us. Turning to Rue, Masterson said, 
How reliable is your source? Rue was loath to tell him the news was from a fugitive sea trader dealing in stolen gems. I'd say it's fairly reliable. Masterson stroked his beard. There are several ways to play this. Each matches risk to reward. Two men approached, and Masterson indicated they should sit. He introduced everyone. Hume and Coley were a pair of investors who had participated in several different syndicates with Masterson. Our young friend here, he indicated Rue, brings us word of a shortage of grain in the free cities. How do you react to that news? How much of a shortage? asked Crowley, a thin, suspicious-looking fellow. Rue lowered his voice and once again said, Locusts. Who's your source? asked Hume, a soft-looking man with a wheezing in his chest. A Quaggan trader put in at Sark two weeks ago and mentioned in passing to a business associate of mine that they had been found on a farm outside Margrave's port. Masterson said, well, That would be the logical place for them to first show up. If it's as bad as when I was a boy, said Hume, they could spread up to Illith and into Yabon. There would be serious shortages in the West. And if they go over the mountains into the far coast region, even more, said Crowley. Masterson turned to face Rowe. There are three basic ways we can approach this news, my young friend. He held up a finger. We can attempt to buy grain now, storing it away in warehouses, and wait for the demand to increase. He held up a second finger. We can do as you suggest, and underwrite the cost of shipping the grain to the far coast, making our profit irrespective of the profit potential in each shipment of grain. He held up the third finger. Or we can try to control the grain without purchasing it. Options, said Crowley. Nodding, Masterson said to Rue, Do you know about options? Rue decided trying to appear more clever than he was would work against him in this situation. Not really. We agree to buy grain at a price from a group of growers here in the area, but rather than buy it, we purchase the right to buy it for a small part of the costs. If we fail to purchase it, we lose the option money. The benefit is that we can control a huge amount of grain for a relatively small amount of gold. But the risk is you lose everything if the price goes down, said Dash. Yes, said Crowley. You do understand. Masterson said, I propose we hedge our positions by buying some grain at market, options on the rest. What about the underwriting, said Rue. Masterson said, I've never been keen on underwriting. Ships sink. If what you say turns out to be true... We'll be sending grain out on anything that floats, and some of the craft will likely sink. But someone else assume the risk, and we'll pay a tiny premium. Masterson was quiet a moment, then said, I think we option the entire amount. What hedge we have with grain purchase is trivial if the price doesn't rise. We diminish our risk by little, but we diminish our profit potential a great deal. Hume sighed. You always win at cards, too. He thought a moment. But you make sense. If we are to gamble, then let us gamble, Crowley said. Agreed. This was all going too quickly for Rue, and he said, How much will this cost? How much gold do you have? asked Crowley. Rue tried to remain calm as he said, I can put about 20,000 sovereigns on the table this week. Masterson said, A tidy sum. Between us, we can raise a hundred thousand. That should prove sufficient for our needs. What's our potential gain? asked Dash, ignoring the fact he was considered Rue's assistant. Hume laughed and coughed. If there is a massive grain shortage in the free cities, a five-to-one return is not out of the question. If it spreads to Yaban and Crydy, ten-to-one is not outside possibility. Masterson added, If all goes as we hope, young Mr. Avery, your 20,000 golden sovereigns could be 200,000 within the next three months. Rue was almost speechless. But then Linda said, It could be nothing. Rue felt a cold chill run up his back. Masterson said, 
I propose a new syndicate, gentlemen. We shall be the Condor Grain Traders Association. Would you draw up the papers, Mr. Lender? Then he turned to Rue and stuck out his hand. Welcome to our syndicate, Mr. Avery. Rue stood and solemnly shook hands with his three new business partners. As the other men moved away from the table, Masterson said, We'll post your name as a member, and you'll be able to join us up there. He pointed to the private upper gallery, restricted to members only. Rue had served coffee up there, but would never have been allowed to set foot there otherwise. I'll see you to the door. Lender left as well, and Masterson put his hand on Rue's shoulder as they walked toward the main entrance. When can you have your gold here, Rupert? Within the next two days, Mr. Masterson. Call me Jerome. Call me Rue. Everyone does. Very well, Rue. Get it here as soon as possible, and Lender will send word to your office when the papers are ready to be signed. As they reached the door, Rue saw Duncan entering through one door. Through the other came an older man, whom Rue recognized as Jacob Esterbrook. But next to him walked a young woman, so beautiful that Rue almost stumbled. He saw Duncan's mouth open at the sight of her. She was perfect, thought Rue. Her hair was done up in a current fashion that framed her face in curls, and ringlets hung down the back of her head, a halo of gold. Her eyes were enormous, and the blue of late winter skies, and her cheeks held a hint of blush. Her figure was slender, and she carried herself like royalty. Ah, Master Brooke, said Masterson. There's someone here I want you to meet. Esterbrook nodded as Masterson opened the swinging gate of the rail, ignoring the flustered-looking waiter who had tried to get there first after opening the door of the carriage from which the Esterbrooks had descended. Sylvia, said Masterson, nodding in greeting. Good day, Mr. Masterson, said the girl with a smile that made Rue's blood pound. Jacob Esterbrook, said Masterson, one of our most important members. May I present to you our newest member, Mr. Rupert Avery. Estabrook's expression remained unchanged, but something about his eyes bothered Rue. Estabrook said, Grindel and Avery. Rue said, It's now Avery and son, sir. He held out his hand. Estabrook regarded the proffered hand a moment, then shook, a quick grip and release that made it clear this was no more than a formality. Something in his manner communicated to Rue that Mr. Estabrook didn't think much of Barrett's newest member. Then Rue caught himself being regarded coolly by Sylvia, and now he was certain. The Estabrooks of Crondor didn't particularly care for the company of one Rupert Avery. Rue slowly turned toward Dash while finding himself unable to take his eyes off Sylvia. Uh, he began. May I present my new assistant? Sylvia leaned forward ever so slightly as if to hear better. Yes, she asked quietly. Dash took control. Dashel, he said with a smile and deep bow. I believe you know my grandfather. Estabrook said, Indeed. Duke James, said Dash with feigned innocence. Instantly, Estabrook's and his daughter's manner changed. He smiled and she beamed, and as her smile broadened, Rupert felt his pulse pound even more furiously. Of course, said Estabrook taking Dash's hand and gripping it warmly. Please remember me to your grandfather when next you speak with him. Sylvia turned her radiant smile on Rue. You must come to dinner soon, Mr. Avery. I insist. Rue could barely speak as he nodded. I would love to. Dash turned to Masterson with a grin. We must be going, sir. We'll be back tomorrow. Good day, then, said Masterson, the farewell echoed by Estabrook and his daughter. Dash gently propelled Rue out the door and reached out to take Duncan's arm and turn him around as they stepped through the portal into the street. To the gaping cousins, he said, You'd think you two had never seen a pretty face before. Rue reached home late that night. It had taken half the day to deal with the news that Duncan had returned with, that it would be both possible and dangerous to dispose of the drugs, but that the profit potential was very high. Catherine had also been unable to provide the name of anyone who might consider such a purchase. Then there was the matter of housing Dash. Rue promised that he would secure quarters for Luis and Duncan in a few days, allowing Jason and Dash to share the apartment, but for the time being the newest addition to their company's roster would have to sleep in a makeshift loft above the wagons in the warehouse. 
If the grandson of the most powerful noble in the kingdom was discomfited by this revelation, he hid it in good humor. Rue suspected he had seen rougher quarters during his relatively short life. He thought in passing about his asking if he was being tossed out of the palace again. Jason and Rue had sat up for a couple of hours plotting the quick disposal of the gems gained in Sarth. A message was prepared for a gem broker in Salador, who had been an old trading companion of Helmut Grindel's, outlining in detail what Rue had to offer, and by the time that had been disposed of, it was after dark. Rue made it home and used his key to unlock the door. He saw that everyone was already in bed, and quietly made his way upstairs. In the gloom, he saw Carly asleep in the bed. There was a tiny shape next to her, and he leaned close. Then he saw the baby. In the murk of the unlit room, the child was little more than a featureless, blanket-wrapped lump, and Rue could barely make out the little bump of her nose. He waited for some strong emotion to come sweeping up out of a natural, paternal well, but nothing came. Then he looked at his sleeping wife, and again felt close to nothing. Standing back upright, he sighed. It was the fatigue, he told himself, and his mind rushed with concern over the coming investments. If he was being a fool, he would lose everything he had built over the last two years. While he was young and could start over again, he knew that a failure now would rob him of any future chance for greatness and riches. As he removed his boots, a soft voice said, Rue? He grunted as he dropped one boot upon the floor. Yes, he whispered. I'm back. How are you? She asked. Tired, he said. I have a lot to tell you, but in the morning. The baby stirred, then suddenly it was crying, and Rue asked, What is wrong? Carly sat up in the dark and said, Nothing. She's hungry. That's all. She needs to eat during the night two or three times. Rue sat upon a small chair, one boot on, the other off, and said, How long does this go on? Carly said, for the next four months, maybe longer. Rue stood, picked up his boot, and said, I'm going to sleep in your old room. There's no reason for both of us to be exhausted tomorrow, and I have a great deal to do. I'll tell you about it when I get up. He closed the door behind him and moved to Carly's old bedroom. Stripping off his clothing, he fell into the bed where he and Carly had created their baby. And in the dark, his mind raced. First, exultation at the prospect of ten years' profits in a few months. Then, terror that he would be destitute instead. Next, he plotted how he would expand once the profits were his, and then he felt fear creep up as he thought how best to recover from the coming disaster. But more and more, as sleep approached, he found his mind's eye returning to the image of a wonderful face with large blue eyes and golden hair and a laugh that made his stomach knot. Sleep finally came with the dawn. Rue came downstairs, his head as fuzzy as if he had been drinking the night before. He found Carly in the kitchen, nursing Abigail, and he kissed her dutifully upon the cheek. "'We've missed you,' said Carly. "'It's good to be back,' he said as Rendell, the cook, poured him a steaming cup of coffee. He had developed the habit of starting the day with a cup while working at Barrett's, and had purchased beans for grinding when he first came to live in the house. He studied the baby. The tiny figure lay in her mother's arms, her hands moving in random directions, her tiny eyes opening and closing. From time to time she would look in his direction, and he would wonder what was going on behind those slate-blue orbs. "'I've never seen eyes that color,' he said. Carly laughed. "'Most babies have eyes like this. They'll turn brown or blue when she's older.' "'Oh,' was all he said. "'You had a good journey?' she asked. "'Very,' he answered. "'I came across some information.' He fell silent for a few moments, then blurted, I'm forming a trading syndicate. Carly said, Father was always cautious in tying up his future with others. Rue was in no mood to be compared to his dead father-in-law, whom Carly almost worshipped, but he took the comment as if it were merely an observation. That discounts risk, he agreed. But I have ambitions beyond your father's, Carly, and if I'm to realize a rich future for you and the child, I must take some risks. Is this venture risky? she asked. She didn't seem overly concerned, but rather interested. Rue couldn't convincingly shrug it off, so he just said, Yes. You think this will work out? Rue nodded. I think we're going to be richer than you can imagine in a few months. 
She managed a small smile. I always thought we were rich. I know the house isn't much to look at, but Father always liked to keep a modest appearance, lest it attract undue notice. But we always had good food, wine, new clothing. If I wanted anything, I only had to ask. Rue's fatigue and nerves made this conversation irritating. He finished his coffee and stood. I have to get to the shop. He again kissed her dutifully on the cheek and glanced down at the now sleeping baby. It appeared so alien to Rue, he wondered if he would ever feel anything for the child. Will you be home for supper? Carly asked. Certainly, he said. Why wouldn't I be? He didn't wait for a reply as he hurried out the door. Duncan hailed Rue as he walked into the shop. Where have you been? Rue looked irritated. Sleeping. You know, when you close your eyes and don't move for a long time? Duncan grinned and said, Oh, you mean dead. Look, your new business partners would like you to come to Barrett's at once. Jason, Rue yelled as he turned away from his cousin. Where are you? Jason and Dash came out of the small office, and Jason said, Yes? Where's our gold? In the strong box? Yes. How much do we have? We have accounts due in later this week, but right now you have 21,647 gold pieces and a few silver coins. Rue told Dash and Duncan, Put the box in a wagon and bring it to the coffee house. I'm leaving now. He hurried out through the front of the shop and down the street. Moving through the crowd was as trying an ordeal as Rue had ever known, so impatient was he to get this business done. He reached the coffee house and walked straight past the door waiter, who blinked as Rue admitted himself to the main floor. The keller, the head waiter, was moving toward him, and as Rue moved toward the stairs to the second floor, he said, Welcome, Mr. Avery. Rue couldn't help but grin. He was a member. He mounted the stairs two at a time and reached the top landing, where before he had always come carrying a large serving tray. He glanced around and saw Masterson's table and his three new partners and Linder sitting there. Glad you could join us, said Masterson dryly. I hope you gentlemen haven't been waiting too long, said Rue as he sat. I have a new baby in the house and things are a bit confused. I didn't get much sleep last night. All four men made understanding noises and brief comments about their own children. Then Masterson said, Here we have it, gentlemen. The document forming our new trading syndicate. He handed copies around, and Rue looked at the neatly executed script. Rue read it twice, and he thought he understood it, but he wasn't sure. He pointed to a paragraph and said, Mr. Lender, would you explain this to me, please? Lender looked at the indicated paragraph. Mm, it simply pledges your goods and other chattels against any losses beyond those secured by whatever gold you bring to this accounting. Rue blinked. How could we go into debt beyond what we agreed to? Masterson said, We usually don't, but there are instances when circumstances require a decision on the basis of the partnership, and sometimes we must establish lines of credit. If we need cash and don't have it, a money lender or admitting new partners are the only alternatives. If we take loans, we often must pledge our personal businesses, even our homes and family heirlooms, as security. It's normal. Rue frowned, but said nothing. Then he asked, But no one can do this without our agreement. Masterson smiled. There are four of us. It would take a three-to-one majority to do so. Rue was uncertain, but he nodded. Lender said, If each of you will sign the document before him and pass it to your right, then sign again. We'll have all these copies executed. A waiter appeared, and Rue ordered coffee without looking up. He signed his name four times, and when he was done, he held his admission to the high-risk financial community of the city. Now, said Crowley, to the sums. Hume said, I am comfortable with a position of 15,000 sovereigns. Crowley said, Fifteen is fine with me. Masterson said, Mr. Avery? 21,000, but I may have more by the end of the week. Masterson raised an eyebrow. Very well. So far that means 51,000. He drummed his fingers on the table a moment. I have heard this morning of some cautious inquiries about grain shipments to the free cities, so I'm beginning to think our young friend is on to something. I will occupy a position that will take the syndicate to 100,000 golden sovereigns. He looked at his three partners. If any of you would care to underwrite more, I will surrender up to a third of my position for a premium, depending on the price of wheat at the time. Lender said, Gentlemen, your letters of credit... 
The three men reached into their coats and withdrew letters. Rue looked confused. I'm having the gold brought here. It will arrive in a few minutes. The three men laughed. Mr. Avery, said Linder, it is usual to keep one's gold in an account at one of the counting houses in the city and to draw upon the funds with letters of credit. He lowered his voice. You'll discover that here at Barrett's we deal in sums that would require several wagons of gold to carry if we were to require the gold actually to be present. Rue looked unsure, but said, I have no such account. Blender said, I will help you establish one at one of the more reputable money-lending firms in the city. I will note that you intend to participate to the amount of twenty-one thousand golden sovereigns. Rue nodded. Though if more arrives later this week, I may wish to purchase some of Mr. Masterson's position. Linder nodded and noted that. Then we are ready, said Masterson. Rue sat back. He had witnessed what was to come next on several occasions as he waited at tables, not quite certain about the details of what was occurring, but never before had he had such a keen interest in what was happening. Linder stood and walked to the rail overlooking the center floor and raised his voice. Gentlemen! We have a request for an option on wheat. A new syndicate is formed, the Crondor Grain Traders Association. We close our books at the end of the week. Best price position to a sum of 100,000 sovereigns, subject to revision. There was a slight buzz at the price, but then the noise in the room returned to normal. The five men sat, and after a half hour passed, a waiter arrived bearing a note. He handed it to Lender, who handed it to Masterson, who read it. He said, we have an offer of 50,000 bushels at two silvers per bushel, delivered to the docks of Crondor in 60 days. Lou did the calculations in his head. That was 10,000 gold pieces. Hume asked, What position? 15%. Crowley laughed. Well, let me guess, that was from Armistead. Masterson laughed in return. Yes. He's fishing said Crowley. He thinks we're on to something and wants to know what it is. He took the paper for Masterson and scribbled a note on it. I'm telling him we'll pay 3% for 50,000 at four coppers per bushel with a 5% per week penalty for late delivery after 60 days. Masterson almost snorted his coffee. He laughed. You're going to make him very curious. Let him wonder. Hume looked at Rue. You'll meet Armistead and the others below in time. He's always trying to find out who is doing what, without taking risks himself. If he thinks there's a killing, he'll try to buy the wheat now, at what we call future prices, and then hold it for us at an inflated price, after we've exhausted our options. He offered us a price he knew we'd say no to, and we just made a counteroffer that we know he'll say no to. Bruce said, But why not offer him a price he'll say yes to? Masterson said, You're meaning? I mean, his coins are gold as much as any man's, and we don't care if he makes or loses money in this as long as we make ours. If we can use this man to set a price and he comments upon it, and the word gets out, Rue shrugged. Crowley's leathery old face split in a wide grin. You're a shrewd young one, aren't you, Avery? Masterson held out his hand, and Crowley handed back the note. Masterson balled it up and threw it away and indicated the young waiter should bring him new parchment and pen. When that was delivered, he wrote a note. I'm telling him what we'll pay straight out. Ten percent against the price of one silver per bushel delivered to the docks in sixty days. We guarantee up to one million gold sovereigns with a security of one hundred thousand. Old Hume was now almost splitting his sides trying to control his laughter. This is priceless. It's exactly what we're doing. But now old Armistead will be certain we're lying to him and be trying to figure out what it is we're really up to. The waiter was given the note and instructed to carry it back to the sender of the earlier note. A few minutes later, Duncan and Dash appeared, carrying the chest of gold. They required the help of two waiters, and Lender stood up at once, saying, We'd better get that treasure to a counting house before raiders come looking for us. The gold was deposited and accounted, and a letter of credit in the amount of 21,000 golden sovereigns was provided to Rue, who turned it over to Lender. Then they returned to the coffee house. Over the course of the day, notes would appear, and Masterson would read them, comment on them, and occasionally write a reply. Once in a while, he would simply say, no, and hand the note back to the waiter. At the end of the day, he stood and said, this has been a good start, gentlemen. I shall see you tomorrow. 
Rue rose and discovered that Dash and Duncan had spent the entire day downstairs waiting for him. He cursed himself for a fool. His own anxiety over this investment had completely occupied his mind and made him forget he had a freight business to conduct. Head back to the office and tell Jason I'm on my way, he said to Dash. When the young nobleman was gone, Rue said to Duncan, Why don't you go looking for a nice pair of rooms for you and Louise? Our accounts are settled, and I can pay to get you into more comfortable quarters at once. Duncan grinned. About time. Then he said, If we're to be spending time with people of quality, cousin, we need to do something about our wardrobes. Suddenly, Rue felt shabby for the first time in his life. He said, In the morning. As Duncan ran off, Rue looked around Barrett's, drinking in the fact that he was now an investor. As he made to leave, a voice sounded out of the shadows of a table back under the overhang. Mr. Avery, a word with you, sir. Avery recognized the voice of Jacob Estabrook and moved toward the table. At the table he saw two figures, and his pulse began to race, as he recognized the other man as Tim Jacoby. Jacoby looked at Rue and said nothing, as Estabrook said, I believe you know my business associate, Mr. Jacoby. Rue said, We've met. Estabrook said, I hope that in the future you gentlemen will put aside your differences. He made no pretense of not knowing there was bad blood between Rue and Tim. It would be my most sincere wish to see such differences vanish in the future. Jacoby stood and looked at Rue, saying nothing to him. To Estabrook he said, I'll pay my respects tomorrow, Jacob. After he left, Estabrook said, Sit down, please. Rue did, and after signaling for some more coffee, Estabrook said, Mr. Jacoby's father and I are old business associates, and more, friends. Frederick and I started out together here in Crondor. We began as teamsters. Rue said, My father was a teamster. For the first time since Rue met the man, Jacob Estabrook looked at him with genuine interest. He asked, Is that so? Rue nodded. Can you drive a team, Mr. Avery? Rue smiled and said, I can drive a team, Mr. Estabrook. Six horses without breaking a sweat. Eight, if I keep my mind on things. The man laughed, a genuine sound of amusement, and perhaps even with a hint of affection. A teamster. Imagine that, he sighed. Perhaps that's why my daughter finds you so interesting. At mention of Estabrook's daughter, Rue found his heart pounding. He forced himself to remain as calm as possible. Huh? he said, trying to sound only mildly interested. Sylvia is a difficult child, said Estabrook, a young woman with a mind of her own. I have little understanding of what captures her fancy, which brings me to my reason for asking you to join me. She requests you join us for supper at the end of this week, will you? Rue didn't hesitate. Certainly. Good, said Estabrook, sipping his coffee. Then we can discuss what we shall do if you find you must kill Mr. Jacoby. Rue felt as if a cold bucket of water had been thrown on him. Calmly, he said, Oh, I shall some day kill him, have no doubt. He murdered my partner. Estabrook shrugged, as if that were of little importance. Well, if we can find a way to avoid that, my lot in life would be easier. He put down the cup. And be warned, while you are presently well connected at the palace, you are not the only one. My friend Frederick Jacoby also counts powerful men as friends. Leaning over, he whispered, If you must kill his sons, be discreet about it, will you now? And if you can manage, some advance warning, so I may distance myself from the Jacobys, would be appreciated also. Patting Rue on the shoulder, he made his way around the table. My coach is now outside. I will see you for supper on fifth day. Rue sat alone for a minute, wondering at this new world of intrigue he found himself in. The polite manner in which Estabrook discussed murder bothered him as much as anything he had witnessed during the war. Then he thought of seeing Sylvia on fifth day, and his heart almost beat out of his chest. Forcing himself to calmness, he realized he must do as Duncan suggested and improve his wardrobe. He stood up and left, and until he reached his shop and Jason brought matters of trade to his attention, he couldn't stop thinking about Sylvia Estabrook. During the week, Rue fell into a routine. 
He left home at first light, stopped by the shop, and went over the day's shipments with Luis, Duncan, Jason, and Dash, then went on to Barrett's. Sometimes Duncan or Dash would accompany him, depending on what else needed to be done at the shop. Other times he went alone. Duncan had found a small house to rent not too far from the office with two bedrooms. Rue told him to hire a cook. Jason and Dash spruced up their own quarters at the shop and seemed to be becoming fast friends. While Jason was a few years older than Dash, it was clear from his manner and comments that Dash was old beyond his years and far more worldly than Jason. Rue followed Duncan's suggestion and visited the tailor, recommended to him by Linder. He supplied Rue with clothing fit for both barracks and social functions. Duncan went for far more colorful clothing, looking nothing so much like a court dandy as a former mercenary. Jason came to him on the third day after the syndicate was formed and said, Can I ask you something without causing offense, Mr. Avery? Rue said, Certainly, Jason. You were the only one at Barrett's who tried to set me right when Kurt and the others were trying to trip me up. I consider us friends. What is it? What is it exactly that your cousin is doing? What do you mean? I mean, Luis is overseeing the shipping schedule, seeing to rates and making runs. I'm doing all the accounts and paying the workers, and Dash is helping Luis and me when neither of us need him. But Duncan, well, well, he's just sort of around. Thinking of the encounter on the road with the driver from Jacoby's, and how Duncan could stand at his back with his sword, Rue said, I understand your concern. Let's just say he helps me. Is there anything else? And Jason said, No, I just... Well, anyway. Are you heading for the coffee house? Rue nodded. I'll be there if you need me for anything. Rue reached Barrett's less than a half hour later, only to discover the upper room in quite a minor frenzy. Masterson waved him over to the table and said, Something is going on. Several waiters were hovering nearby, taking pieces of paper that were being scribbled upon by human Crowley. What is it? asked Rue. We're getting offers, many of them. Rue's forehead furrowed. Where are they coming from? Masterson said, Why, well, from other members. No, I mean, where is the grain coming from? Masterson blinked. I don't know. Suddenly, Rue felt certain he knew the answer. He took a waiter by the arm and said, Send a message to my office. I want my cousin Duncan or my assistant Dash here as soon as possible. To the others, he said, Have we taken any positions? Not yet, said Crowley, but the price is dropping, and I'm inclined to think it's not going to go lower. How low? It's down to two silvers for three bushels at eight percent secured. Rue lowered his voice. I'm willing to bet one of the other brokers has sent someone east to the Vale of Dreams. Would you think that price reasonable if someone is bringing Keshian wheat north through the Vale? What makes you think that? asked Masterson. Rue said, Because I'm a sneaky bastard whose father drove a wagon to all parts of the kingdom, including the border near the Vale. Soon Duncan showed up, and Rue said, I need you to start hitting inns near the traders' gates. Listen for Valemen. I need to know if anyone has been buying grain in cash. Who and how much? After Duncan hurried off, Crowley said, Are you using some magic power we're ignorant of, or is this a guess? It's a guess. But before sundown, I think we're going to find that as much wheat as we need, twice over, is on its way west from the Vale. Why, said Hume, why do you think that? Grimly, Rue said, Because it's what I would do if I wanted to ruin this syndicate. He then asked, What sort of surety do we get regarding delivery? The options are secured, so if the person offering the option defaults, he is liable under kingdom law for the entire price, and more, for the gold we'd lose by not being able to ship the grain. To offer a contract and not make delivery would be terribly damaging, unless... Unless what? asked Rue. Unless the association that might bring a claim in the king's court was already out of business and suffering suit for its own failure to meet contracts. Rue said, Now I know someone is trying to ruin us. He was silent a moment. Do we have grounds to refuse the wheat for poor quality? Masterson said, We don't. We can refuse the contract delivery only if the grain is rotten or otherwise damaged. Why? Because they're paying the lowest prices, so they are going to be bringing in the cheapest grain out there, Rue pointed at his three partners. Who's offering these contracts? 
Various groups, answered Crowley. Who's behind them? Masterson's eyes focused on the pile of notes as if trying to discern a pattern. After a moment, he said, Jacob. Rue felt his chest constrict in panic. Estabrook? Human Crowley said, Why would he meddle in this? Rue said, My fault, I fear. He might find things more convenient down the road if I were reduced to poverty quickly. Your ruination would be only an unfortunate consequence, nothing personal, I'm certain. What do we do? asked Crowley. Well, we can't be buying wheat that even the most venal millers won't buy. Rue considered things for a few minutes in silence, then suddenly he said, I have it. What? I'll tell you when Duncan returns. Until then, do nothing. Buy nothing. Rue rose and left, determined to sniff out some information on his own. Near sundown, he discovered Duncan in an inn in a corner, sitting quietly at a table with two oddly dressed men, mercenaries by their arms and armor. Duncan waved him over. Rue, these friends of mine have an interesting story. Rue noticed that several tankards of ale had been consumed, but that Duncan was as sober as the day he was born, and his ale was hardly touched. Rue sat and introductions were made. The two mercenaries told Rue how they had been hired to guard a fast poster rider who carried a message from the city of Shamata to a trader in Crondor regarding the purchase of a huge shipment of grain from down in Kesh. When he was finished, Rue rose. He threw a small pouch of gold on the table and said, Gentlemen, pay for your room, drinks, and dinner on me. Duncan, come along. He hurried back to Barrett's and found his three partners almost alone in the upper gallery. He sat down and told them, Someone is bringing a huge shipment of poor quality grain to Crondor. Are you certain? Crowley repeated his question of earlier that day. Why buy grain you can't sell? Rue said, Someone knows we're writing contracts on options. Someone also knows that we must either pay the full price or forfeit the option price. So they bring grain into the city, enough to meet the contract demand, that we refuse to buy. They keep the contract money and dump the grain. But they'll lose money, said Crowley. Not that much. But more than offset by the contract price. And if their purpose is to break us, not make a profit, they won't care if they lose a small amount. Hume said, That's predatory. Very predatory, said Matheson, and brilliant. What do we do? asked Hume. Rue said, Gentlemen, I have been a soldier, and now it's time to test your resolve. Either we can stop buying and count what we've contracted for so far as a loss, or we can seek to turn this to our advantage. But it will take more gold than we have so far pledged to make this work for us. What do you propose? said Masterson. We stop taking contracts. From this moment on, we say no, and our counter-offers must be a margin of what is being offered. So low that no one will take our offers, but enough to let them know we are still in business. Why? said Crowley. Because each day a huge shipment of grain, sixty wagons being provided by Jacoby and Sons, is working its way to Crondor. He glanced at one of the offer sheets still on the table. To be delivered to the docks in forty-nine days. Each day that passes, each day that goes without the buyer of that wheat having someone to sell it to, his concern will rise. For if that grain reaches Crondor before all of it is optioned, then that seller will have to dump it in the harbor. Eventually he will sell at our price, assuming that he will still break us. How do we counter this? said Hume. We buy every contract in Crondor, gentlemen. If by the time the wheat reaches the city we own every kernel of wheat between here and Illith, then we can ship the high-quality grain to the free cities and the far coast, recoup our investment, and make our profit. What do we do with the grain from Kesh? said Masterson. We sell it to farmers for their stock, the army, whoever, as fodder. If we can merely break even on that grain, then the rest will make us wealthy beyond our ambition. Twenty to one, thirty to one, a hundred to one return on our investment. Masterson grabbed a pen and started scribbling. He worked in silence for nearly ten minutes. Given what we've seen so far, we need at least another two hundred thousand sovereigns. Gentlemen, we need to attract more partners. See to it. Crowley and Hume hurriedly left the table, and Masterson said, Rue, I hope you're correct. What price do we need to reach to make this a can't-fail proposition? Jerome Masterson laughed. If the grain was free, I wouldn't say it was can't-fail. We need to store this grain, and if the shortage in the free cities doesn't materialize, we may all be driving wagons for Jacobian sons before we're done. 
I'll sail back to hell before that, said Rowe. Masterson signaled a waiter and said, Bring me my special cache of brandy and two glasses. To Rue, he said, Now we wait. Rue drank the brandy when it appeared and found it excellent. Masterson looked at some of the pile of notes before him and frowned. What is it? asked Rue. This doesn't make much sense. I think it's a mistake. We're being offered the same contract, basically, twice by the same group. Then he nodded. Ah, there it is. It's easy to see why I made the mistake. It's not the same group. It just looks like it. Rue turned his head as if listening to something. What did you just say? I said this group looks like that group, he said, pointing to the two notes. Why? Because, say, for one investor, they're identical. Why would they do that? Because they're greedy, suggested Masterson. He sighed. Sometimes people offer contracts they have no intention of fulfilling. If they suspect the other party is going to go broke. If they take our money now and we go under, they'll just shrug when the contract is due. Whom do they deliver to? They'll say. He shrugged. It may be word is spreading we're in trouble. Trouble? Repeated True. Then a thought occurred to him. After a while, a plan formed in his mind. Suddenly he said, Jerome, I have it. What? said Masterson. I know how we can not only turn this to our profit, but ruin those who are trying to ruin us. He realized he was speaking over the top and said, Well, if not ruin them, certainly cause them pain. Then he grinned. But I do know how we're going to make an obscene profit on this wheat business. He looked Masterson in the eye. Even if there is no shortage in the free cities. Masterson was suddenly very attentive. Rue said, I guarantee it. Fourteen. Surprise. The rider reined in. The farmers walking home from a long day tending their wheat were surprised as he turned his mount in their direction and approached. Without word, they spread out and waited, for while it was peaceful times, the rider was obviously armed, and one never knew what to expect of strangers. The rider removed a large-brimmed hat, revealing himself to be a young man with curly brown hair. He smiled, and it was also clear he was little more than a boy. Greetings, he called. The farmers responded with salutations of their own, little more than grunts. They resumed walking, for these tired working men didn't have time to spend an idle chatter with some bored noble son out for an evening ride. How goes the harvest? asked the youth. Well, answered one of the farmers. Have you set a price? asked the rider. At this, all the farmers stopped walking again. The boy was talking about the two things that interested these men most in the world, wheat and money. Not yet, said the farmer. The brokers from Crondor and Illith won't be here for another two or three weeks. How much do you want for your wheat? asked the boy. Suddenly the farmers were silent, looking from one to another. Then one asked, You look like no broker I've met. Are you a miller's son? The young man laughed. Hardly. My grandfather was a thief, if truth be told. My father is in service to the Duke of Condor. What's your interest? asked another farmer. I represent a man who is seeking to buy wheat, but who is anxious to set a price now. That set the farmers to talking low among themselves. After a minute, the farmer who had first spoken said, This is unusual. We're not even sure of the yields yet. The boy looked from face to face. Finally, he pointed to one man and said, How long have you farmed this land? The man said, My entire life. It was my father's field before me. Do you mean to say you don't know to within a bushel how much grain that field will produce in a year like this? The man blushed and grinned. Well, truth to tell, I can. So can you all, said the young man. Here's my offer. Set us a price now, and you'll be paid now. We'll take delivery at harvest. The farmers looked amazed. Get paid now, asked one. Yes. Suddenly prices were being shouted so fast the rider couldn't understand any. He said, enough, and held up his hand. He dismounted, held out his reins for a farmer, then pulled some writing instruments from his saddlebags. The first farmer set a price for a thousand bushels of wheat, and the rider nodded. He countered, and the dickering was on. 
When they were done, he wrote down names on the parchment he had taken from his saddlebags. Next to each agreed-upon price and amount, he had them make their marks, and then began to count out pieces of gold. As the rider left, the farmers could not believe their luck. While the price wasn't the best possible, it was fair, and they had the money now. As Dash rode north, he felt sore in his back and shoulders. He had been to a dozen villages like this one over the last three days, and knew that Duncan, Rue, and Luis were doing as he was. But he knew if he rode hard, he could make the last village before Sarth just after sundown, which meant that after some dickering with the locals over wheat prices, he could pass along some messages to John Vincey for Rue, sleep a sound night in an inn, then return to Crondor in the morning. He put heels to the flank of his mount and took her to a tired trot as the sun sank in the west. As the week ended, four tired riders returned to Crondor and met at Rue's warehouse. Dash grinned as he said, if there's a grain of wheat between here and Sarth we don't own, it's in some horse's nosebag. Louis said, The same for here through Land's End. Duncan said, I don't know if I bought all the wheat between here and the Vale route, but I spent all the gold you gave me. He handed his cousin his list of farms and prices. Rue said, I did the same from here to the foothills. He looked at the accounts and said, If this doesn't work, we may want to reconsider joining the king's army. Dash said, I have other options. With a grin, he added, I hope. Rue said, I have to get home and change. I'm dining with Jacob Estabrook tonight. Dash and Duncan exchanged glances. Duncan's face turned unreadable, while Dash just continued to grin. Jason asked, Do you think Sylvia will be there? Rue smiled. I'm counting on it. Luis's brow furrowed at that, but he said nothing. Rue left the shop and hurried home. He found Carly in the sitting room, rocking the baby and singing a tune to her. Rue halted and walked quietly into the room, seeing that the baby was sleeping. Carly whispered, She's been fussy. Rue kissed his wife on the cheek. Did your plan go well? We'll know within a week. I would love to hear about it over supper. She should sleep a while. Rue blushed. In all the frenzy, I neglected to tell you I'm dining out tonight. I am sorry. Carly said, You just got home. I know, but it's important. More business. Carly said, Business tonight? Rue's exhaustion, his anxiety, and his impatience to see Sylvia Astorbrook again came together and caused him to speak more harshly than he had intended. Yes, business tonight. I'm having supper with one of the most important investors in the kingdom. Abigail started awake and began to cry at her father's loud voice. Carly's eyes flashed anger, but her voice was a controlled hiss as she said, Shush! You've woken your daughter. Rue waved his hand. I'm sorry. Deal with her. I've got to clean up and change. Turning his back, he shouted, Mary, I need a tub of hot water. His shout caused his daughter to cry even louder. Carly's face was a mask of control, but her eyes never left her husband's back as he vanished up the stairs to clean up for his dinner engagement. Rue hurried, and despite having bathed, he felt hot and sweaty under his new clothing. He paused before the gate to the Estabrook house. He should have driven out on a hired carriage instead of riding out, he thought. Instead of showing up at the Estabrook door calm and relaxed, he was nearly breathless. He knocked, and almost instantly the postern door in the gate opened and a groom stepped through. Yes? I am Rupert Avery. I'm to dine with Mr. Estabrook, answered Rue. Yes, sir, said the groom, and he disappeared through the small door. A moment later, the gate swung wide. Rue rode into the grounds of the Estabrook estate, and he was dutifully impressed. The house was located on a hillside on the eastern edge of the city, high enough above the next estate that it felt almost rural, though it had taken Rue only a half hour to ride there. The high stone wall had masked the house from his view as he had ridden up the narrow road, except for a small tower of some sort. Now Rue could see that the tower was actually a constructed observation platform with a small peaked roof, but with windows looking in four directions. Rue wondered why it was there, then considered it was a perfect place from which to observe the comings and goings at both the caravanserais to the southeast and ships in the harbor. Two moons had risen, and Rue saw a glint of metal and smiled to himself as he dismounted and handed the reins of his horse to the groom. Estabrook must have one of those clever viewing glasses up there. The house otherwise was what he had expected. Two stories in height, it was large, but not palatial by any measure. 
There were gardens, as Rue could smell blooms in the evening. Lights appeared at several windows, and there were sounds of activity from within. Rue knocked on the door, and it opened a moment later. Expecting a servant, Rue was rendered nearly breathless by the sight of Sylvia Estabrook herself, answering his knock. Mr. Avery, she said with a smile that made her stomach hurt. She wore a deep plunging gown that revealed she wasn't quite as slender as Rue had thought. It was a pale blue designed to highlight her eyes. She wore a necklace of diamonds and no other jewelry. Rue barely got hello out as he stepped inside. May I take your cloak? she asked. Rue fumbled with a tie at his neck and then finally got the new cloak unfastened. A father is waiting for you in his private room, down the hall and to the left, she said, pointing out the way. I'll hang this up and see to supper. Rue watched as she vanished through a door to the right, and he forced himself to take a deep breath. Totally intoxicated by the sight of the girl, he knew that dealing with her father was as dangerous as going into combat. Rue made his way along the hall, glancing through two open doors to see modest rooms with single beds, tables, and nightstands. Servants' quarters? he wondered. He reached the large door at the end of the hall, barely seen in the dim hallway. Only a single candle on a table halfway along the hall's length illuminated the way. From inside, a voice said, Enter, please. Rue opened the large door and stepped inside. Jacob Estabrook was rising from behind a large desk in the middle of what Rue could only consider a library. He had seen a room in the Prince's Palace once when he was training there that had as many books, and was astonished to discover that someone who wasn't royalty had this many in his possession. The room was lit by a pair of candles, one on Estabrook's desk and another on a reading stand, set against the wall opposite the door, two pools of light in the otherwise dark library. As he approached the desk, in the dim light, Rue saw another figure standing near the wall. Then Rue saw there were two men in the darkness. They stepped forward, and Rue's hand reflexively went to his side, where his knife usually hung. No, no, said Estabrook, as if reassuring a pair of children. Into the light came Tim Jacoby, and a younger man, one who looked enough like him that he could only be his brother. Mr. Avery, I believe you've already met Timothy Jacoby. This other gentleman is his brother Randolph. He glanced toward the door and said, They were just leaving. Rue stood stiffly, as if ready to defend himself. Tim Jacoby said nothing, but his brother said, Mr. Avery, with a nod of his head. Mr. Jacoby, Rue responded, nodding back. Neither man offered to shake the other's hand. Tim turned as they walked toward the door and said, I will be in touch, Jacob. I expect you will, Timothy, said Estabrook. Give my regards to your father. I will, answered Tim. Estabrook said, we took a bit longer to finish our business than I had anticipated. I'm sorry if their presence here caused you any alarm. Rue said, it was unexpected. Sit, said Estabrook, motioning Rue to a chair at the other side of his large desk. We have a bit of time before Sylvia fetches us for supper. Estabrook said, I have made inquiries about you, young Avery. He sat back in his chair and folded his hands over his stomach. Rue had never seen him without his hat, and saw the man was bald above his ears, but he let the rest of his gray hair hang to his collar and back. He affected long mutton-chop sideburns, but otherwise was clean-shaven. A look of wry amusement passed over his face. Your notion of importing bulk wine from Darkmoor had merit. I think it an enterprise worth pursuing. It's too bad you ran afoul of the mockers. Had I known about you, I could have saved you some loss and saved Sam Tannerson his life. Rue said, I'm impressed at your knowledge of the details. Estabrook made a gesture of dismissal with his right hand. Information is valuable, but easy to come by if you have resources. He leaned forward and said, Remember this. Of all the commodities men trade in, information is the most valuable by far. Rue nodded. He wasn't sure he fully understood what Estabrook was saying, or if he agreed. He decided this wasn't a debate or even a discussion, but most likely a lecture. Now, I hope that in the future you and Timothy Jacoby can put aside your differences, however deep the animosity runs, because I might find it difficult to do business with two men who are at any moment likely to kill each other. Rue said, 
I wasn't aware that we are doing business. Estabrook smiled, and there was nothing friendly or warm in it. I think fate has touched you, young Avery. Certainly you have advanced to a station of some notice in a rapid fashion. Marrying Helmut Grindel's daughter gave you some resources that most men your age would envy. But you've prospered far beyond that. Obviously you are well thought of in the palace. Mr. Jacoby's father was very upset that your company received the contract to transport goods to the palace. He thought he was the logical choice. You've cut him badly. Twice, I believe, in areas of less reputable trading. Rue was forced to laugh. One thing I've learned, despite my youth, Mr. Estabrook, is not to admit anything. Estabrook laughed, and this time there was genuine amusement in his reaction. Very well said, he sighed. Well, then, whatever occurs, I hope we can all manage to work in harmony. Rue said, I have a debt to pay, Mr. Estabrook, but you are not part of that. Well, at this point, no, said Estabrook. A knock came from the door, and Rue was out of his chair as the door opened and Sylvia peeked through. Supper is served. Estabrook said, We mustn't keep the lady of the manor waiting. Rue shook his head, but said nothing. He followed his host through the doorway, and Estabrook motioned he should precede him. Rue followed Sylvia down the hall, and as they came into the well-lit antechamber at the entrance to the house, he found himself again captivated by how the candlelight played off her golden hair. He followed her into the dining hall, his heart beating far too fast for the tiny bit of exertion walking to dinner entailed. He hardly noticed as he moved to a chair at a long table, with his host on his left at the head of the table, and Sylvia across from him. There was room for another seven people to sit at this table. Rue said, I have never seen a room like this. Estabrook said, It's an idea I found in a description of a dining hall in a distant court, in one of the kingdoms down in the Keshian Confederacy. That king preferred intimate dining to the usual court chaos, and instead of sitting in the middle of the table, which would be to your right by two chairs, with everyone arrayed to his right and left, he decided to turn the table sideways, sit at one end, and be able to talk to everyone. Sylvia said, We used to have this very large round table, and you'd have to shout across it to be heard by whoever sat opposite you. Rue smiled. I like it. To himself he vowed to have one made just like this. Then he realized there was no room for a table this large in his small home. Suddenly he remembered the gamble he and his partners were taking, and realized that if they won, he would be able to build a house to match this one. He put aside his worry over what would happen should the gamble fail. Conversation passed quickly, and Rue couldn't remember half of what was said. Throughout the night he found himself working hard not to stare at Sylvia, but he couldn't avoid it. She drew his eyes. By a supper's end, he had memorized her features as if they were a map home. He knew every curve of her neck, the set of her lips, the slight imperfection of one tooth in front that was slightly turned and overlapped the one next to it, the only flaw in her beauty he could ascertain. Without knowing how, he found himself at the door, bidding his host and hostess good night. Sylvia took his hand and held it tightly, moving up close to him so that his knuckles brushed lightly against the top of her breast. It's been wonderful, Mr. Avery. I hope you'll visit us again, and very soon. Rue almost stammered as he promised he would call again. He turned and mounted his horse and rode slowly to the gate. He could only wonder at this magic thing that he felt, and from every indication he was amazed to discover that Sylvia Estabrook was apparently pleased with his company. As the gate closed behind him, Rue wondered at that improbable fact. Sylvia waited until the door was closed, and then moved to a window beside the door, watching as Rue rode off. Turning to her father, she said, What do you think? Jacob Estabrook replied, A young man with unlikely promise. He's certainly unattractive, though there's a wit about him that's charming enough, in a rat-faced sort of way, she said dryly. But his hand was surprisingly strong. She tapped her teeth with her fingernail. Those wry lads, they tend to have great stamina. Sylvia, scolded her father. You know I don't like that sort of talk. Sweeping past her father as she made to climb the stairs to her bedroom, she said, Father, you know what I am. You made me this way. 
She smiled at him over her shoulder. Are you going to kill him? Estabrook said, I hope not to. He has wit, and from some of the things I have heard of his soldiering days, he has the ability to survive. He would make a better ally than foe, I think. Sylvia started to climb the stairs. But that still doesn't keep you from trying to ruin him. Estabrook waved away the comment as he turned to toward his library. Ruining a man is far different from killing him. If he's ruined in this wheat speculation, I may even offer him a position with one of my companies. Then I would not have to worry about a rising competitor, and he might be made a valuable asset. Sylvia vanished to the top of the stairs, and Jacob walked back toward the library. To himself, he said, Besides, if I need to, I'll have Tim Jacoby kill him. Rue sipped at his coffee. It was his fifth or sixth cup of the day, and he was drinking from habit, not any enjoyment of the drink. Dash hurried up the stairs to the table where Rue sat with his partners. Message for you. He handed a note to Rue. The gem buyer in Salador had offered a price lower than Rue hoped for, but not too low to make Rue consider shopping for a better deal. He quickly calculated and said, Reply by fast rider. Forward the gold at once. Dash said, and Duncan says there's starting to be some rumblings around the inn. A miller was overheard last night while he was getting drunk, saying that he has no wheat to grind because the farmers aren't bringing it into the city. Rue nodded. Keep me informed. Dash hurried away, and Rue said, It's starting. Masterson nodded and signaled for a waiter to come to the table. The young man did, and Masterson wrote out a note and handed it to the waiter. Take this down to the floor, please. It's for Mr. Armistead. Rue sighed. How are we doing? Masterson said, We are now in debt or have paid out 600,000 golden sovereigns worth of wheat options. You have created the largest single seizure of wheat in the history of the world. He ran his hand over his face. I doubt there's a grain of wheat between Malik's Cross and the far coast that's not going to show up at the city gates the next two weeks with our name on it. We'd better have guessed right, Rue. Rue smiled. None of you would have gone along with my plan if you didn't realize it would work. He hiked his thumb toward the floor below. It all turns on one fact, Jerome. Everyone here, including you and me, is a greedy bastard. Masterson laughed. There's more truth in that than not, Rue. He leaned forward. Truth to tell, when I was a boy, I cut purses for a living. Got a chance to go straight, and I did, in the army, during the Great Uprising. I was a little more than a kid, but like every man serving, I got the king's pardon. I decided to turn my hand to honest business, and found that the biggest difference between honest business and dishonest is in how you approach your mark. He leaned back. Oh, it's not like I'm taking everything a fellow has, and if we work well together, we both end up making money. But often it's just as vicious as if I cut his purse and ran through the market. Rue said, Where are we with price? We're steady at three silver pieces for ten bushels against a six percent guarantee. Rue said, I'm too tired to calculate the numbers. How much do we stand to make? Masterson said, I have no idea. We still need grain buyers from the free cities to show up and start running up the price. Not for a few more days, I hope, said Rue. We still need to buy a few more cheap options. He lowered his voice. Duncan reports word is starting to spread that wheat from the outlying farms isn't coming in. In a few days, no one will be making offers. We need to finish this today, by tomorrow at the latest. I'm out of gold, and I've put up everything I own as security to the moneylenders, said Masterson. He laughed. I should be scared to death, but the truth is, I haven't felt this happy since I was a boy running through the city with a city watch hot on my tail. Rue said, I know what you mean. It's... Like putting your life on the line for one toss of the knuckle bones. Never cared for dice, said Masterson. Always preferred cards. Linlan or Pokia. You against the other fellows. Rue said, I've got gold coming from Salador. Another ten thousand if we need it. We're going to need it, said Hume, who had just walked up. We're so overbought now we don't have the coppers to pay for our coffee. He leaned over. Keep it on you, in case we all need to make a quick escape. Rue laughed. I don't think that's going to happen. Any minute I expect we'll see what we've all been waiting for, and when that happens... He grinned. 
He held out his hand, palm up, then suddenly closed it, saying, We have them. A few minutes later, a waiter appeared with two notes. Masterson opened the first one and said, Armistead's agreed, and he's in for ten thousand. He is just about popping to know what we're doing, gentlemen. Crowley walked over and sat down. What's that? Armistead's? Yes, he's in, said Masterson. What's the other note? asked Rue. Masterson opened it and read it, then grinned. Here it is. What does it say? demanded Crowley impatiently. A syndicate is offering us thirty thousand bushels at two silver for three bushels secured by a ten percent option. Rue slammed his hand on the table. It's them. It has to be. The greedy bastards couldn't resist their hours. Masterson did some calculations. Not quite. He sat back, blowing out his breath, his cheeks puffing out. We don't have enough gold. Rue groaned. How short are we? Masterson calculated. We could use that ten thousand gold pieces you have coming from Salador. Is that enough? Almost, said Masterson. But we'd still be two thousand gold short. Rue groaned. I need to get out of here. He stood up. I'll think of something. He left his companions and walked down the stairs through the heart of the coffee house. He stepped outside and found the streets relatively uncrowded. Catching sight of the house where he had hidden the silk that launched his career, he crossed the street, avoiding puddles. It had rained hard the night before, which was partially responsible for the light traffic in the city. Reaching the porch of the abandoned house, Rue saw that no one had replaced the broken hasp on the lock he had forced. Whoever owned the place had merely stuck the screws back into the stripped-out holes as if the sight of the lock on the door would keep the curious out. As there was nothing inside worth stealing, thought Rue, as he pushed open the door, it was probably a safe bet. He wandered through the house, again finding some sense of place there. He hadn't said anything to Carly, but when he was rich, he intended to buy this house. Having quarters close to Barrett's was appealing to him, for he had already decided that while the freight company would be the heart of his business empire, it would be only one of many ventures he would embark on. Trading at Barrett's was like nothing he had ever encountered before. It was gambling on a scale undreamed of by any soldier losing his pay in an alehouse. It was intoxicating, and Rue was drunk with possibilities. He sat there a long time, listening to the rain when it came and the sounds of the city, as the light faded and the day trailed off. When at last he decided he needed to return, it was near sundown. He left the house and crossed the street to find Dash waiting for him. Dash said, Louis says the first load of wheat has shown up. One of the villages outside of Land's End harvested early. Rue swore. Do we have room for it in our warehouse? Barely, if we push everything else outside into the yard and street. Rue said, this could turn ugly. We don't have the gold to rent storage at the docks, and there's no ship in from the free cities. There is, said Dash. What? asked Rue. We've got word of a free cities trader docking at noon. I've been looking for you for hours to tell you. Rue's eyes widened, and he said, Then come with me. He hurried to the docks on foot, breaking out into a trot when traffic opened, and Dash kept up with him. As they reached the docks, Rue said, Where's the ship? Dash said, I don't anchor. There, he pointed. Rue said, The master must be at customs. Come on. They hurried to the customs shed and found a busy clerk going over documents while two very impatient men waited nearby. Rue said over the counter, Has the master of the free city's ship been in? The clerk looked up and said, What? One of the two waiting men said, Aye, he has, and he's still waiting for that stone-headed clerk to sign off on his paperwork so he can turn his cargo over to his buyer. And he pointed to the man next to him. Rue said, I have cargo for the free cities, if you're unbooked. The captain said, Sorry, lad, but I am booked. I have letters of credit and authorizations to secure cargo. My employer was most emphatic about this. He lowered his voice. If it's a tiny bit of cargo, I might be able to squeeze it in, but otherwise I'm instructed to fill my ship with grain and hurry back as fast as possible. Rue grinned. Grain? Aye, lad, wheat. I'm to purchase high-quality wheat at a fair market price, then leave as quickly as possible. He glowered at the clerk. Which is why I'd like this business done as soon as possible, so I can let my lads go ashore. 
They've been at sea three weeks, and we'll be here but a day or two. Who have you contacted for your wheat? asked Rue. No one yet, though I fail to see how that is any business of yours. Rupert stood and said, Captain, I forgot my manners. I am very sorry. May I be allowed to introduce myself and my companion? He turned to Dash and said, This is my associate, Dashiell Jameson, grandson to the Duke of Crondor. He put his hand on his chest as the captain and his buyer both rose at the mention of the Duke. And I am Rupert Avery of the Crondor Grain Traders Association. Almost unable to contain himself, he said, How much grain do you need? Enough to fill a ship, Mr. Avery. Rue turned to Dash. Is what arrived today enough to fill his ship? Dash said, I think so. Rue said, Good. To price, what do you offer? The captain said, You have the wheat here in Crondor? Yes, I can have it at the docks at first light. The captain got a calculating look on his face. Rue knew what he was thinking. If he could grab the wheat before word got around about the shortage, he might make enough of a profit for the ship's owner to make it worth having his crew forego any shore leave. At last he said, I am prepared to offer two silver pieces of common weight, the agreed upon size of the coins used to trade between the free cities, for three bushels of wheat at dockside tomorrow. Rue said, I'll take a silver per bushel. Three silvers for four bushels, said the captain. Rue said, I'll take a silver and a copper per bushel. Wait a minute, exploded the captain. You just set a price of a silver per. Now you raise it? Yes, said Rue, and in a minute it will be a silver and two coppers. Then he leaned forward and said very quietly, Locusts. The captain's face flushed, and he looked as if someone had just lit a fire in his trousers. But after glaring at Rue a long moment, he stuck out his hand and said, Done. A silver and copper per bushel, a dockside at first light. Rue turned and put his hand on Dash's shoulder and steered him out of the customs house. It's going to work, he said when they had cleared the street. The next morning the wagons paraded to the docks, unloading the grain onto barges that carried it out to the ship. The captain and Rue both stood by, comparing tallies, while stevedores hauled the large sacks of grain off the wagons and carried them down the gangplanks to the barges. By midday the tally was done, and the two men compared figures. Rue knew the captain was intentionally counting light, and showed six less bushels than Rue. For slightly more than a half-piece in gold, Rue thought he'd let the captain have his little triumph. I'll accept your figure, Captain. The captain motioned to his mate, who produced a chest out of which the captain counted sacks of gold. He let Rue inspect the contents of each bag, and when the transaction was done, Rue handed the contents to Duncan, who stood nearby with a chest that would be taken to the counting house, where Rue now had his accounts established. As they led the now empty wagons from the dock, Rue rode next to Duncan on the lead wagon. He felt an elation unlike anything he had known in his life. It's going to work, he said to no one. What? asked Duncan. Rue couldn't contain himself any longer. He laughed long and hard, then whooped. He said, I'm going to be a very wealthy man, cousin. Oh, very nice for you, said Duncan dryly. Rue didn't notice his cousin's lack of enthusiasm. The floor of the coffee house was in chaos. Grown men screamed at one another, and several fights had to be broken up by waiters. McCuller could be heard saying, Gentlemen, gentlemen, please remember yourselves, several times. Rue had one man hurl himself across a table at him, and his battle training served him well as the man found only air, where Rue had stood a moment before. The man knocked himself nearly senseless when he struck his chin on a chair. Taking the steps two at a time, Rue found a pair of waiters protecting the upper floor from those not authorized to mount the steps. Not that the upstairs was much quieter than down below, but at least there was no brawling. Grown men seemed on the verge of breaking down in tears or screaming in frustration. Rue pushed past two angry men to find several more at tableside, confronting an equally angry-looking Masterson. "'I don't care what you say!' screamed Masterson at a pair of men who leaned over the table, their hands pressing hard into the wood. "'You sign the note. You provide the wheat, or pay the market price. You have three days!' One of the men looked enraged, but the other looked ready to beg. "'I can't. Please! I'll have to sell everything I've ever acquired. I'll be penniless!' Masterson's temper seemed on the verge of getting the best of him. You should have thought of that before you sold me wheat you didn't have title to. Rue took him by the arm and over his shoulder said, Excuse me, gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. What? asked Jerome, still angry. 
Rue tried to keep a straight face and, failing, turned his back to the others around the table so they wouldn't see him grinning. How much? Masterson said, They owe us two hundred thousand bushels of wheat and they don't own any. Then he suddenly realized whom he was talking to and started to snicker. Covering his face with the back of his hand, he feigned coughing. I don't care much for Meany over there, and his cousin Meeks isn't much better. Thought I'd let them sweat a bit. Are they involved with Jacoby? asked Rue, keeping his voice down. No, answered Jerome. Not as far as I can tell. I did what you requested and ferreted out every syndicate or association that I thought had Jacoby participation, and they're not among them. Rue said, I've been thinking. We can't ruin every investor in Crondor, else we'll have no one to do business with. What do these two do? Masterson suddenly grinned. Meany has a lovely little mill he manages badly, and Meek's a big shop that does a tidy business not far from here. Mostly they speculate, and only on a modest scale, he whispered. Someone must have put the word out there was going to be a bloodletting. I've got notes here from people two or three times over, far more than they're worth if they default. Rue nodded. Well, if we take Crondor grain traders and turn it into a permanent syndicate, it wouldn't hurt opposition in future to have a few businesses we own to constantly generate gold. Would you like to own a share in a bakery and mill? Masterson rubbed his chin. Not a bad notion. You and I, with Crowley and Hume, need to sit and discuss this. We can bully out those other partners who came late, but Brandon Crowley and Stanley Hume were with us from the start. Agreed, said Rue. He turned and went back to the table. Mr. Meany, he asked. The angrier of the two men said, Yes. As I understand it, you don't have the wheat you contracted to deliver to us at the agreed-upon price? You know I don't, shouted Meany. Someone went out and fought off every grain from here to great cash. I've word from every grain buyer in the principality there is no wheat for sale anywhere. How can we meet these contracts if we can't buy grain? Rue said, An unfortunate circumstance to find yourself in. The other man, Meek, said, Please, if we're forced to account on the due date, we'll be ruined. I have a family. Rue pretended to think upon it, then said, We'll consider taking your note. No sooner were those words out of his mouth than Meeks was saying, Oh, thank you, sir. His relief brought him to the edge of tears. Meany said, You will? At a reasonable rate of interest, and we may require property as... Rue glanced at Masterson and whispered, What's the word? Masterson said, Collateral. Collateral. Prepare a list of your holdings and return here on the due date, and we'll work something out. Can't have your family out on the streets now, can we? said Rue pointedly to Meeks. The two men left, and Rue began dealing with the men who were coming in before the due date to plead for more time because there was no grain to buy. He noticed the notes Masterson had set aside for him to peruse and made a mental list of the names on them. Not one of those men came to see him. At the end of the day, Rue and his three partners, along with Sebastian Lender, sat down. Rue said, Gentlemen, I propose we form a standing company. Crowley said, Say on. We have, according to Jerome, managed to achieve the single most stunning manipulation of any market in the Western realm in the history of Barrett's. Lender said, I think that is a safe assessment. Jerome said, Well, none of us would have expected it to turn out the way it had. Rue said, My point is that We've done as well as we did, because you gentlemen were steadfast. Lesser men would have broken and run. Crowley looked unconvinced, but Hume appeared pleased at the remark. I was a soldier for two terrible years, said Rue, and I understand the incalculable benefit of having men at your back you can trust. He looked from face to face. I trust you four men. Crowley looked genuinely moved at that. Rue said, I propose we keep our newfound wealth pooled and form a new company, one as diverse and widespread as any seen before. In his mind, he knew he was proposing the formation, overnight, of a company to rival Jacob Estabrook's far-flung holdings. Crowley said, And you will preside over that company? There was a note of suspicion in his voice. No, said Rue. I'm still new at this, and while I think I have a knack for this sort of business, I also know that we got lucky. He started to laugh. I doubt anyone will sell a grain contract in the kingdom for a long time without having purchased the grain in advance. The others laughed in return. No, said Rue. I was thinking you should preside, Brandon. It was the first time he had used Crowley's first name. Me? asked Crowley, obviously surprised. Well, 
said Rue, turning to Jerome. Mr. Masterson and I have, shall we say, less than pristine histories? Masterson laughed at that. And while I respect Mr. Hume, it seems to me you're the senior member here. Your age and experience would serve us well. I propose that you preside, and Mr. Hume could act as the company's second officer. I will be content to be but one of four partners. I will conduct a fair bit of business on my own outside the company. Running Avery and Sons will take some of my time, and I expect we'll all have undertakings we will wish to pursue outside the company. But we're about to be confronted with many, many men who will not be able to meet the notes they sold us. He outlined his discussion with Masterson and his offer to Meeks and Meany. We could end up with shared interests in dozens of businesses scattered around the bitter sea. For that reason, gentlemen, he said to them all, I propose that this day we found the Bitter Sea Trading and Holding Company. Masterson slammed his hand down on the table. Damn me, if you're not a shooting star, Rue Avery. I'll ride with you. Hume spoke next. I will join with you. Yes, I will. After a moment, Brandon Crowley said, Presiding, officer? He nodded. Very well, I will join with you also. Rue said, Mr. Lender, would you be so kind as to execute an agreement to this effect? I would be pleased, Mr. Avery. Masterson rubbed his hands together. I think, gentlemen, it is time for a drink. He turned his head and shouted to a nearby waiter to bring his private brandy and five glasses. When the drinks were poured and each man held one, Masterson said, To Mr. Rupert Avery, without whose tenacity and conviction not only would we not soon be very wealthy men, we'd probably be begging in the street. Rue said, Now, please, each of us here is due some credit. I would rather we toast. He held up his glass. The Bitter Sea Trading and Holding Company. Each man in turn said the name of the new company, and as one. They drank a toast. Fifteen. Consolidation. The inn was crowded. In a dark corner, five men sat, keeping their voices low despite the din of the common room. One nearly spat as he spoke, so intense was his anger. The bloody bastard strangled the market and we're going to be ruined. You said this was going to be easy pickings. I took multiple positions in three different syndicates, all secured with the same collateral. If I default on more than one of them, I will have to flee Crond or I'll go to prison. You said there would be no trouble. He pointed an accusing finger at the man across the table from him. Timothy Jacoby leaned forward. I promised you nothing, DeWitt. I said you'd have an opportunity to make a killing. His own anger matched that of his companions. But I never guaranteed you anything. A third man said, This is pointless. The question is, what do we do? I'm going to see Astorbrook, answered Jacoby, standing abruptly so that his chair fell backward, striking a drunk who lay face down at the next table. The drunk barely stirred. Jacoby glanced at the nearly comatose man. Meet me back here in two hours. I'll have some sort of answer. The five men rose and left, and after a minute the drunk stood up. He was a young man of average height, and the only thing remarkable about him was his hair, which was a very pale blonde, nearly white when seen in sunlight. He kept a wool sailor's cap tight on his head, so that this unusual feature was hidden. Moving with purpose, he left the room and followed the five men out the door. Once outside the inn, the blond man glanced around until he saw a figure appear from deep within a nearby doorway. He waited until the second figure closed to him. Well, asked Dash of the false drunk. Go back and tell your employer that he stirred up a hornet's nest. Tell him Tim Jacoby is rushing to get some answers from Jacob Estabrook. I'm going to follow Jacoby and see if I can overhear what he and Estabrook are going to plan. Dash said, Well, at least you don't have to try to climb to the rooftops and hang upside down outside windows. You never were very good at that. Jimmy smiled at his younger brother. Well, you aren't much for picking pockets, either. He gripped his brother by the arm. You are certain father believes I'm out dining with you? Dash shrugged. That's what I told him. Don't worry. Unless you get yourself killed, grandfather will sort things out with father should we run into trouble. He always does. Well, hurry along. They're due to meet back here in two hours. You would do well to have someone else inside before then, in case I can't get back ahead of Jacoby. He patted his brother's arm. See you later tonight. Dash hurried off into the darkness, and Jimmy moved to where his horse had been hidden. He mounted and rode out toward the eastern gate, looking about to ensure no one spotted him or was following him. 
As he left the city gate, he caught sight of Jacoby on the road ahead, his figure outlined against the darkness by the light from the large moon, which was directly overhead. Jimmy slowed his own horse, lest he ride upon the heels of his prey. By the time Jimmy reached the outer wall of the Estabrook estate, he was certain getting inside would prove easy. Getting out, he thought to himself, might prove more difficult. Like his brother, Jimmy had grown up in the palace at Willanon, where their father, Arutha, had served with their grandfather, then Duke of Willanon. Arutha, named for the late Prince of Crondor, had been raised in a far more genteel fashion than his father, who had been a notorious boy thief, until Prince Arutha had taken him into service. But the grandsons had listened to their grandfather James's stories, and by the ages of seven and five, the palace was constantly troubled by two boys climbing walls, skipping along rooftops, picking locks, eavesdropping on state meetings, and otherwise creating difficulties far beyond what one would expect from two children of their size or experience. By the time they were eleven and nine, the boy's father had decided that the hearty life along the frontier would teach them a thing or two. So Jimmy and Dash had been packed off to the frontier court at Crydee, home of Duke Marcus, the king's cousin. Their visit had lasted two years, and by the time the two brothers returned to Villanon, they were sunburned, tougher, more self-reliant, fair trackers, better hunters, and now thoroughly incorrigible. In the subsequent five years, both sons had been thrown out of the palace by their father and grandfather several times, in the hope they would discover just how lucky they were to be among the elite of the kingdom. Each time the boys managed rather well, living by their wits and guile, and frequently using the skills developed driving the palace staff to distraction to provide sustenance. They had even run afoul of the thieves' guild in Milanon on two occasions, and survived to tell the tale. The last time they had been banished from the palace, their father had relented after three weeks and had gone looking for them, only to find they now had a controlling interest in one of the seedier bordellos along the docks. They had won it playing cards. Jimmy tied his horse out of sight down the road, where he would likely not be seen if Jacoby came riding past before Jimmy could recover them out. He hurried up to the gate and quickly looked it over. Two easy footholds, and a handhold later he was peeking over the top of the gate. A servant was leading Jacoby's horse toward the stable, and there was no one else in sight. He heard the door to the main house close, and assumed Jacoby had just entered. Jimmy jumped down from the wall and hurried toward the house, keeping off the pathway and stooping low beside a line of decorative shrubbery. Reaching the house, he glanced about. He didn't know where Jacob's library was, save it was on the ground floor, and he knew that only because Dash had mentioned it. Suddenly he cursed himself for not thinking of asking Dash if he knew. Oh, well, he thought. Preparation had never been his strong suit. Dash had the more devious mind. He glanced into a few windows and saw no one moving. He at last found himself staring at a dim room in which only a pair of candles burned but he could hear voices raised. "'Don't come in here and demand anything of me, Timothy!' Dash risked a better look and was rewarded by the sight of Timothy Jacoby, leaning over a desk, knuckles hard against the surface, as he yelled at Jacob Estabrook. "'I need gold!' shouted Jacoby. "'Lots of it!' Estabrook waved his hand as if wafting away a bad smell. "'And I'm supposed to give it to you?' "'Alone, then, damn it! "'How much?' asked Estabrook. I hold option orders for sixty thousand sovereigns, Jacob. If I can't meet the order, I'm going to forfeit everything we own unless some grain comes on the market in the next three days. You're worth more than sixty thousand, Timothy. A great deal more. It's not the price, Jacoby nearly shouted again. It's the penalty for the grain not delivered. By the gods, wheat is up to three silvers a bushel and rising. There is none to be had. Every miller in the kingdom is in Crondor, howling at the grain brokers. Someone has bought up all the contracts, and there is none to be had. What about all that cheap grain you have coming in from Kesh? asked Estabrook. We're delivering that tomorrow, but that's less than half the contracts we took. When I secured that grain, how was I to know that little insect and his partners would order up five times that amount? Instead of choking him on it, we're making him wealthy. The market price has doubled over the option we've secured. Jacob pointed at Timothy. You got greedy, which is bad. But you were stupid, which is worse. You let your distaste for Rue Avery color your judgment. And what's more, you killed a completely innocent man for merely being his business partner. You're the only man in Crondor who won't be given a chance to negotiate his way out of this. Innocent? said Jacoby. Ask my father about Helmut Grindel. He knew a man's throat was below his chin and which side of a dagger had the edge. 
He just happened to be in the way. Avery has a knack of taking goods from me that are difficult to replace, and my customers for those goods are less than forgiving. Running drugs for the mockers again, Tim? The disgust in Estabrook's tone could not be hidden. You made that bed, so lie in it alone. Are you going to loan me the gold or not? demanded Jacoby. How much? If grain comes onto the market in the next two days, I can survive with 60,000 gold sovereigns. That will bail out the wit and the others who came along because I told them. If it doesn't, you don't have enough to save my company. DeWitt won't be the only one fleeing the city to avoid prison. He lowered his voice, and Jimmy could barely hear him as he warned. But if I'm taken, Jacob, there are things I can tell the magistrate that might buy me a lighter sentence. I can take a few years in prison, Jacob, but you're not a young man. Think on that. Astorbrook considered it. He looked out the window, and Jimmy ducked out of sight. He heard footsteps approach and crouched as low into the shadows as he could, holding motionless. I thought I saw something, he heard Estabrook say. You're imagining things, said Jacoby. Jimmy heard the sound of a quill on parchment. Here's a letter to my accounts keeper, said Estabrook. He will honor the letter. But be warned, I am going to hold your father responsible if you default, our old friendship notwithstanding. Thank you, Jacob, said Timothy, and his tone was icy. Jimmy heard the door slam and was judging how best to time his move to the wall. Jacoby's horse was in the stable, and if he hurried, he might get to his own horse before Jacoby cleared the gate. He was about to move when he heard someone enter the library. Father? He chanced to peek and saw a stunning-looking young woman enter the room. He conceded that for once Dash hadn't exaggerated a woman's loveliness. He could see why Avery was smitten, as were Rue's cousin and young Jason, from what Dash had reported. Dash and Jimmy had grown up near the center of power in the kingdom, and many beautiful women had paid attention to the grandsons of the Duke of Villanon as soon as they were old enough to appreciate it. They had enjoyed the benefits of such attention, and had an education regarding women and their pleasures far beyond their years, but they also had something of an askance view of them as well. Jimmy, like his brother before him, marked Sylvia Estabrook as a very dangerous creature, one able to find powerful allies. She said, What was all that bellowing about? Was Tim being a bully again? Trying to, answered his father. It seems young Avery not only has managed to survive Jacoby's attempts to bury him, but is turning the tables, as they say. I had to loan Jacoby the gold to keep him from being ruined. Then Timothy will try to kill Rupert? Oh, most certainly. Will you let him? asked Sylvia. Jacob rose and came around the desk toward his daughter. I think I shall absent myself from the conflict. I think it opportune for us to visit our country home for a few weeks. By the time we return, the matter will be settled. Well, if you must have someone killed, please do it soon, father. Being out of the city is such a bore. Jimmy had met some calculating women in the eastern courts, but Sylvia Estabrook was easily the most cold-blooded he had encountered. As much as he wished to hear more of this conversation, he knew he couldn't afford to let Jacoby get too far ahead of him. He started back toward the wall, wondering if it would do Avery any good to warn him. Then he considered how beautiful Sylvia Estabrook was, and how unlikely it was that Avery was used to the attention of such a woman and discarded the idea as worthless. In the dark, he could hear Tim Jacoby's horse moving down the road as the gate closed. Jimmy dropped to the ground while the servant returned to the house, and when he heard the door to the house shut, he rose, ran to the wall, and quickly climbed over. A few minutes later, he was upon his horse, heading back toward Grondor. He fervently hoped Dash was already at the end because there was no possibility he could overtake Jacoby and resume his posture of being the drunk at the next table. Inside the house, Jacob Estabrook closed the door to his library behind him and said, Old Frederick's health isn't what it used to be, and I suspect that soon Timothy will be totally out of control. It would be better for us if either he or Rupert were to be removed from the landscape quickly, either a very dangerous young man who might rise to a dangerous level of power some day, or an unstable ally, potentially more dangerous than the opponent, will be removed. Either way, we profit. If Rue kills Tam, how does that profit you? 
He's not one of your partners, and given he's going to see your hand in much of what has been going on around the city the last few months, do you think he will be inclined to do business with you? If Tim kills him, that question is academic. If he kills Tim, he will be a young man of great influence, and I will groom him to help our cause. I count on your charms to make him wish to do business with me. Do you want me to marry him? No, he's already married. She laughed, a sound both lovely and chilling. The little rogue. He never mentioned a wife. Well, then, I shall just have to seduce the ugly twit and become his mistress. But only if Tim doesn't kill him, daughter. Yes, father. Now, would you care for supper? Rue sat motionless as Tim Jacoby stalked forward and threw papers down upon the table. Masterson was the one to pick them up, and he said, You'll have the grain, then? Yes said Jacoby, his fury turned to dark, cold anger. A broker came into town this morning, and I secured what I needed to meet the contract. Rue forced himself not to smile. He had had Luis pretend to be the broker, and had sold grain to Jacoby for more money than Jacoby was being paid for it now. He had conspired not only to sell the grain twice, but to make a profit both times. Jacoby turned to look at Rue. Avery, he said calmly. I don't know how you managed this, but I smell something here that stinks like weak dead cats. And when I find out what it is you did, and how you did it, we'll have a score to settle. Rue rose slowly, so that a fight wouldn't erupt in the balcony at Barrett's. He came around the table and looked at his taller foe. I told you once before, when I took your knife out of your hand, that you weren't the first enemy I've made. But you went too far when you punished an old man because you were angry with me, Jacoby. If you're ready to die, we can step into the street right now. Jacoby blinked and his jaw tightened, but he did nothing for a moment. Then he turned and stalked off, pushing past others come to settle their debts for the Crondor Grain Traders Association. Rue returned to his chair, and Masterson said, Selling him our grain so that he could meet his contract may have made us a bit more gold, Rue, but... We all might have slept better if we had put Jacoby and Sons out of business outright. If we had done that, we'd be spilling blood right now. Looking at Masterson, he added, I've seen the inside of the death cell. I have no desire ever to see it again. Then he smiled. Can you imagine Jacoby's reaction when he discovers that we were the ones selling him grain so he could deliver it back to us? At a loss? Masterson nodded with a smile. He might burst at that discovery. More men came, some with the grain, now being delivered for a fraction of the price it was commanding on the open market. The others came to plead for time or to offer compromise offers. As they had agreed to do, the partners heard every offer of compromise, and in most instances took part or all of a company in settlement. By the end of the day, the Bitter Sea Trading and Holding Company controlled a pair of mills, sixteen ships, a half dozen shops in the city, and other holdings as far away as the cities of Illith, Kars and Malik's Cross. As day came to an end, Rue rubbed his hand over his face. How have we done? Masterson looked at Lender, who consulted with a scribe employed to keep accounts. In the last four days, you've captured assets that are, conservatively, worth in excess of one million four hundred thousand golden sovereigns, gentlemen. I would set the Bitter Sea Trading and Holding Company's current net worth in excess of two million gold. When we deliver the grain, we're shipping ourselves to Borden and Port Natal. That will rise to something in excess of three million gold. Rue couldn't help but grin, despite his bone-numbing fatigue. Damn me, he said quietly. When's the party? said Masterson. What? asked Rue. It's traditional around here for the newest member of a syndicate to host a party for his partners and those doing business with him. Given you're presently doing business with just about every trading concern in the kingdom, and half of those in Kesh and Quegg, I hope you have a large house. A party, said Rue. Then he thought of the house across the street. Soon, I think. He turned and leaned across to whisper to Lender, Can you find out who holds title to that house across the street, and how much they require to purchase it? Lender rose. 
I'll find out at once. Rue also stood. I must for home, gentlemen. My wife has seen less of me since we started this mess than you four have by half. I must reacquaint myself with her and my daughter. He left word at the door that, should anyone need to reach him, they could do so at the office of Avery and Sons. Then he walked home. Carly looked up as Rue entered the dining room. He smiled and said, I have something to tell you. The baby rested in Carly's arms as she nursed. Carly said, Yes. Rue pulled out a chair and sat down. Putting his arm around his wife's shoulders, he said, You are married to one of the richest men in the kingdom. He couldn't repress a giggle. Carly pulled back. Are you drunk? Rue looked injured. Woman, I am not drunk. He stood. What I am is very tired and very hungry. I am going to take a bath, and if you would tell Rendell, I would like supper as soon as she can manage. Carly said, Don't you want to say hello to your daughter? Rue looked confused. She's a baby. How is she going to know if I say hello or not? Carly looked stricken. She needs to know her father, Rue. She held up the baby and put her over her shoulder. She smiled at me today. Rue shook his head. I don't know what it is you're talking about. I need a bath. As he began to leave the room, he said, Did I tell you I plan on buying a new house? Why? Rue turned on his wife, and his face hardened into a mask of outrage. Why? he shouted. The baby began to cry at the loud noise. Do you think I intend to live with the rest of my life in this tiny hovel your father was satisfied with? I'm going to buy us a townhouse across from Barrett's. It's three stories tall and has room for a large garden. He shook his head and took a deep breath. I'm going to buy a country house as well. I'm going to own horses and dogs and hunt with the nobility. As he spoke, his anger faded and a strange dizziness overtook him. He reached out and gripped the door jamb. I need to eat something. He turned and mounted the stairs while Carly tried to quiet the crying Abigail. Mary! shouted Rue. I need a tub of hot water, now! As Rue vanished up the stairs, Carly ignored the tear running down her cheek as she said, Hush, my love, your father loves you. The music filled the night. Rue stood at the door, wearing the finest clothing he could buy. He greeted each guest as they arrived, and he was the man of the hour. Every merchant of worth and importance was in attendance, and many nobles who had come as friends of friends. The new house was turned out and decorated and filled with the finest furniture that money could buy. It was clear to anyone who paused to consider a man of consequence had taken up residence across the street from Barrett's coffee house. Carly stood next to her husband, wearing a gown that had cost more gold than she could believe, but trying to look as if she wore such raiment every day. She glanced at the stairway, wondering how her daughter fared, for she was upstairs in a very noisy house, and she was teething. Mary was nearby, but Carly didn't trust anyone to look after her daughter. It had taken months to find the owner of the house, negotiate a price, fix it up, and move in. Carly had insisted they keep the old house she had grown up in, and Rue hadn't been willing to argue with her. After the dust had settled on his manipulation of the grain trade in the city, he turned out to be worth far more than even he had dreamed possible. When the last ship had returned from the free cities, the net worth of the Bitter Sea Trading and Holding Company wasn't in excess of three million gold pieces. It was closer to seven million, for the locusts had spread to the far coast and Yabon, and grain prices were at a record high. Additionally, several of the businesses they had acquired had proven quite lucrative, showing a quick profit as soon as Rue and his partners had taken control. Now Rue knew he was a man of importance, as the great and near great of the city came to his home to pay their respects. Rue felt as if his chest would burst when a cadre of horsemen rode up before a carriage and from the vehicle Dash, his brother Jimmy, and their father and mother emerged. Behind it came another carriage, bearing the crest of Crondor, and coming to visit his house were the Duke and Duchess of the city. Even those who attended out of curiosity, those cynical souls who judged Rue the current favorite, a man likely to be forgotten in a year, were impressed as the most powerful lord after the king came to call. Dash entered and smiled at Rue as he took his hand, shook it, then kissed Carly's. Turning, he said, May I present my brother, James? We call him Jimmy, so as not to confuse him with grandfather. 
Rue grinned as he shook hands with Dash's older brother. They were attempting to keep secret the fact they had indeed met before, and that Jimmy was helping his brother to make Rue a very powerful man. Behind them came a man who could be no one else but their father. The resemblance was so strong. Dash said, This is my father, Arutha, Lord Venkar, Earl of the Court. Rue bowed slightly and said, My lord, it is an honor to welcome you to my home. May I present my wife? He introduced Carly and then was introduced in turn to Elena, Dash, and Jimmy's mother. The handsome woman said, We are pleased you asked us to attend, Mr. Avery. We are pleased our son has discovered a legitimate interest. She glanced at Dash for a change. Her slight accent betrayed her roldom origins. Behind them came Duke James and the Duchess Gamina, whom Rue welcomed warmly. Gamina said, I am more pleased than you can imagine to see you in such surroundings, Mr. Avery, given the grim circumstances of our last meeting. Rue said, That makes two of us, my lady. James leaned over and said in Rue's ear, Remember, thou art but mortal, Rue. Rue's eyes narrowed, and he looked slightly confused, but the Duke swept past and entered the large room off the stairway. Other guests waited outside in the garden. Everything there was in bloom as Rue had paid a great sum to bring in fully mature plants, and for a short time Carly had rejoiced in the size of her new garden. But Rue couldn't escape the notion she didn't like the new house. Jerome Masterson came from the large room, and from behind whispered in Rue's ear, The Duke of Crondor himself. You're a success, lad. He patted Rue on the shoulders. You're about to find more invitations to dinner arriving than you could answer in a year. Accept the best only, and be polite to the rest. He patted Rue's shoulder again and wandered back into the ground. Carly said, I should go check on Abigail. Rue took her hand and patted it. She's fine. Mary's up there, and if there's any problem, she'll come fetch you. Carly didn't look reassured, but she stayed. The clatter of horses announced the arrival of Jado Shati and several soldiers from the garrison. Rue greeted them and shook hands. How's the leg? Jado grinned, his broad smile revealing remarkably white teeth. Fine, though I now know when rain's coming. He patted his left leg. I must have all my strength back. Rue introduced his former companion to his wife, and Jado led the soldiers with him inside. Rue didn't know any of them, and laughed to himself. These were obviously new barrack companions of Jado's who had come along on the promise of free food and drink. The evening wore on, and at last Carly had persuaded Rue that she needed to check on their daughter. While she was gone, a large carriage rolled up, and Rue's heart began to pound when he saw who was inside. Jacob Estabrook and his daughter arrived, and Rue felt his heart beat hard in his chest. Sylvia let the doorman take her cloak, and Rue saw she was dressed in the newest fashion, a gown cut so low as to be close to scandalous by more conservative court standards. Her father wore expensive but conservative dress, a short-cut jacket over a tunic with a single row of ruffles in front, black hose and black leather shoes with silver buckles. He went hatless and carried a simple cane with an ivory hilt. Rue took Sylvia's hand and was loath to release it and greet her father. Rue, said Jacob, shaking hands firmly, I must confess you've done remarkable things, young man. We must meet soon and discuss some ventures I have in mind. He moved along, and Sylvia lingered. We've just returned from the country, and I would love it if you would come for supper again soon, Rue. Her eyes never left his, and the way she said his name made his knees weak. Then she leaned forward and whispered in his ear, Very soon. Then she was moving past him, and he felt her breast brush against his arm. He turned to watch her as she vanished into the now crowded house. And who was that? came Carly's voice. He turned and discovered his wife standing before him, returned from upstairs. Rue blinked, then said, Uh, that was Jacob Esterbrook and his daughter, Sylvia. Carly made a disapproving noise under her breath. The shame of the woman coming out in public half-naked like that. And look at those men fawning over her. Rue narrowed his gaze, for one of the men fawning over her was Duncan, who was quickly cutting off every other young man in the room as they sought to get close to Sylvia. Rue turned to greet his next guest and said, Well, she's pretty, and her father is one of the richest men in the kingdom and has no sons. She's quite a catch for any single lad. 
Cloudy said, I noticed that didn't keep you and the other married men from drooling down her dress. She took Rue's arm in a possessive fashion and stood there until it was clear no more guests were to arrive. The party lasted well past midnight, and Rue couldn't remember a tiny fraction of most of the conversations she had held. He had been pointedly vague when pressed on matters of business, referring people to Jerome or telling them to stop by at Barrett's the next business day. He mixed as best he could, trying to keep track of who spoke to him on which matter, but the truth was he was drunk on wine and success. He was one of four partners in the Bitter Sea Trading and Holding Company, but he was rumored to be the driving force behind the sudden emergence of this powerful new company. Women flirted with him, and men sought to engage him in conversation, but throughout the night he was only concerned with two things, basking in the glow of triumph and keeping track of Sylvia Esterbrook. Each time he caught sight of her across the room, his breath caught in his throat, and when he saw another man hovering over her, he felt anger building inside. Carly kept him moving among the guests, only pausing to speak with the Duke and his family, forgetting for the time she socialized with nobility that moments before she was furious with Rue for his behavior around Sylvia. Twice she left to nurse Abigail, and when she returned she found her husband watching Esterbrook's daughter. At some point the crowd began to depart and bade their hosts goodbye. While Rue and Carly were standing at the door, Jacob came and took Rue's hand. My thanks for inviting us to the celebration of your new company, Rupert. He smiled at Carly. Mrs. Avery, it's been a pleasure to meet you. Carly smiled, but glanced around and said, Where is your daughter, Mr. Estabrook? Jacob smiled. Oh, she's somewhere in there. He took his cloak when the doorman presented it to him, folding it over his arm while waiting for his coach to be brought up from where it was waiting. I have no doubt at least a half dozen of those young lads have agreed to escort her home. I am not able to keep late hours any more. Indeed, said Carly, coolly. The coach arrived, and Estabrook departed. A little while later, Duke James and his wife and their son and his wife left, again setting Carly nearly glowing with pride. While many rich and powerful men had visited her father in his modest home, no noble had ever passed through their portal, and in the first evening of entertaining in the new house, the most powerful man in the kingdom, after the royal family, had come calling. Seeing that neither Jimmy nor Dash had accompanied their parents, Rue said, "'Excuse me a moment, please,' to his wife, and left. He found Jimmy talking to the very pretty daughter of a miller, who now worked for the Bitter Sea Company, and took him by the elbow, moving him away without even an apology. "'Where's Dash?' Jimmy glanced over his shoulder and made an expression of regret to the young woman, mouthing that he would be back in a moment. "'He's over there,' Jimmy pointed across the room. Sylvia Estabrook commanded a portion of the main salon, with a circle of admirers around her. At her side stood Duncan, his most charming smile on display, as he told some story of his adventures, to Sylvia's amusement and the irritation of the other young men. Dash stood a short way beyond, watching in a very observant fashion. "'It's his turn,' said Jimmy. "'His turn for what?' said Rue. Jimmy whispered, "'We're taking turns to make sure no one gets finger marks on your young Miss Estabrook.' He glanced back at the young woman he had been speaking with, and said, "'That particular young lady is very interesting, and as I am really not in your employ, and Dashiell is, he thought it the brotherly thing to do to watch over your friend for you while I take advantage of the opportunity to become better acquainted with that sweet girl there.' "'Your young Miss Esterbrook? Watch over your friend?' repeated Rue, his expression darkening. Jimmy whispered, it wouldn't do if one of these young gentlemen got a little too much to drink and made a fool of himself over such an unusually pretty woman, would it? Given Mr. Estabrook's importance in the community, I mean. Rue said, I guess not. Is Dash seeing her home? Neither he or Duncan, said Jimmy. Rue nodded and said, Get back to your young lady. He moved through the party until he found Luis, who was sitting as if at home, his bad hand kept in a large pocket on the side of his new jacket. Luis raised his good hand, holding a drink. Senor, he greeted Rue in his native Rhodesian dialect, you are a man of consequence to all appearances. Thank you, said Rue. Who's at the shop? Bruno, Jack, and I believe Manuel. Why? Just thinking, he glanced around. I would like you and Duncan to stop by there on your way back to your house, just to check up on things. 
Luis glanced past Rue and caught sight of Rue's cousin and Sylvia. After a second he said, I understand, he stood. But that leads me to another matter. What? asked Rue, still distracted. I would like to find other quarters. Why? asked Rue, his attention suddenly focused upon Luis. Luis shrugged. I am a man of simple needs, and your cousin, well, Duncan has many friends calling. I enjoy my work and find little time to rest given his late hours. Lou thought of it a moment and realized that with the money he was now paying Duncan, he was probably bringing a different barmaid or whore home every night. The house he and Luis shared was tiny and had to be difficult for the solitary Rhodesian. Find yourself new quarters tomorrow. I'll raise your pay to whatever is necessary to cover the extra expense. Make it a nice, quiet place. Thank you, said Luis, with one of his rare smiles. Now I will explain to Duncan. We need to check up on the shop on our way home. Rue nodded and returned to the door, where Carly was bidding guests good night. There you are, she said with a dark look. Where have you been? With Luis. He came to stand beside her, bade good night to another departing guest, and then said to Carly, he wants his own quarters, so I gave him leave to find a place away from Duncan. That I can understand, said Carly. Rue sighed. He knew she and Duncan had never gotten along on the few occasions he had come to the house. There was something about him that simply put her off, and the harder Duncan tried to win her over with his charming nonsense, the more distasteful she found his company. She had tried to keep her dislike to herself, but Rue saw it, and after he asked her about it, she had admitted as much. A little while later, Louise and Duncan came to the door, and while Louise bid Carly good night, Duncan leaned over and whispered into his cousin's ear, I would really like to stay a while longer, Rue. Rue said, I'd sleep better if you checked out the shop and made sure everything was in order. Duncan's features clouded. I'm sure you would. Rue took him by the elbow and steered him a few steps away. I've also told Louise to move out of your house. This caught Duncan completely off guard. What? he said. Well, said Rue, in a conspiratorial tone, you're rising in the world along with me, and... Letting his gaze wander to where Sylvia and the daughters of several other wealthy men stood in conversation with a number of young men, he added, and I thought you might do with a little more privacy for your entertaining. I told Louise to find himself new quarters. Duncan didn't know what to make of this for a moment, but then he smiled and said, thank you, cousin. Most generous of you. Rue hurried Duncan back to the door, where he bade Carly good night. A little while later, Dash came and said, I'm going to escort Miss Estabrook back to her father's house. Rue nodded and attempted to look uninterested. He turned to find Carly's eyes fixed upon him. Smiling, he said, This is going on longer than I wanted. Why don't you check up on Abigail while I shoo out the last of the guests? I'll be up in a while. Carly looked unconvinced, but she nodded lifted the hem of her dress and walked to the stairway and quickly climbed to the second floor. Rue made a brisk tour of the room, politely making it clear to those still there that the party was drawing to a close. He found Jerome Masterson asleep in a large chair in a small room off the main parlor, his arms wrapped around a now empty bottle of very expensive Cassian brandy. Lifting his partner by the arm, Rue carried him to the main salon, where he saw his bookkeeper deep in conversation with another young man. He motioned for Jason to come over and gave Masterson's care over to him, instructing him to see his partner got home safely. As he reached the door, the last of the guests were leaving, including Sylvia and Dash. As the last visitor departed, Dash's hired carriage pulled up to the door. Sylvia turned to bid Rue good night and feigned a stumble, falling against him. He caught her and felt her body hard against his. She whispered, "'My goodness, I must have had too much wine.' Her face was mere inches from his as she looked into his eyes and said, What must you think of me? Then, as if by impulse, she kissed his cheek and whispered, Please come soon. Stepping back, she turned and said, Thank you again, Rupert. And again, forgive my clumsiness. She moved quickly down the steps and entered the carriage as Dash held the door open for her. He glanced back at his employer, then climbed in after her, and the carriage headed off down the street. Rue watched until it disappeared, and then returned to the door. He walked inside and found the three hired servants waiting. He thanked them for their good work, paid them with a bonus, and sent them on their way. He knew Mary would already be asleep, as would Randall, for they would both be up at dawn the next day. 
He pulled off his coat and tossed it on the end of the banister, too tired to hang it in the wardrobe his wife had purchased for his clothing. His mind was afire with images of Sylvia Estabrook, and he could not be rid of her feel, her scent in his nostrils, her warmth, and her lips upon his cheek. His body ached for her as he entered the darkened bedroom he shared with Carly. He glanced over and found Abigail asleep in her crib, and was relieved. If the baby had been in bed with his wife, he would have retired to one of the guest rooms rather than risk awakening her. He quickly undressed and got under the covers. In the darkness, he heard Carly say, Did everyone finally go? Still slightly intoxicated, he laughed. No, nah, I left a few of them in the garden. I'll set them loose in the morning. Carly sighed. Was the party a success? He rolled over and said, You were there. What did you think? I think you enjoyed being with those powerful men and beautiful women. Rue reached out and felt his wife's shoulder through the thin cotton of her nightshirt. I like looking, he tried to say lightly. What man wouldn't? But I know where home is. Really, Rue? she asked, rolling on her side to face him. Do you mean that? He said, Of course I do. He pulled her toward him and kissed her. A moment later he was fully aroused and pulling her nightshirt over her head. He took her fast and hard, and at no time was he thinking of her. For those passion-filled minutes, his mind was completely engulfed with images of another woman. As he panted to a conclusion, he could only think of Sylvia's scent and touch. After he had spent himself, he rolled over and lay on his back, staring at the ceiling and wondering if Sylvia's carriage had reached her home yet. They had ridden in silence. Dash had waited for her to speak first, and she had said nothing until halfway to the estate. At last she said, I'm sorry, but I've forgotten your name. Dashel, he said with a grin. Jameson, you met my father and brother. She frowned. Your father? Arutha, Lord Venkar. She gasped, as if completely embarrassed. Oh, my! Then your grandfather is the Duke of Crondor, he finished. I'm that one. She regarded him in a new light. I had you confused with that other fellow, who doesn't speak much when I'm around. That would be Jason, said Dash. He's completely awestruck by you, miss. And you're not, she asked, a playful tone in her voice. Dash's grin widened. Not particularly. I bet I could change your mind, she said, leaning forward so her face was inches from his, and her gown provided an ample expanse of bosom for his inspection. He leaned forward also, until his nose was almost touching hers. Whispering in a conspiratorial tone, he said, I bet you could, too. Then he sat back. But I am, unfortunately, pledged to another. She leaned back, resting against the seat. Tapping her chin, she laughed. Who is the lucky woman? I don't know, he said. But she's the daughter of some noble house, no doubt. My grandfather will inform me when the time comes. She feigned a pout. That's a disappointment. Dash shrugged, as if bored by the discussion. It seems to have worked out for my mother and father. They are, by all outward appearance, rather fond of one another. They rode on in silence for the rest of the journey. When they entered the estate, the gateman ran alongside the carriage so he could open the door for Sylvia. Dash got out and presented her with his hand, and she stepped down. He escorted her to the door, and she opened it, turned, and said, are you sure I can't convince you to come inside? She moved close to him and slid her hand down his chest until it was below his belt. Dash endured the fondling a moment, then stepped back. I'm very sorry, miss. He turned and hurried to the carriage and climbed inside, while Sylvia went inside the house, displaying a wicked smile and sounding a poorly concealed laugh. The carriage rolled through the gate and toward the city, as Dash considered that his employer was in for a great deal of trouble. He now regretted he had been so generous with Jimmy, allowing him to pursue the miller's daughter. After a minute, Dash stuck his head out the window and shouted, Driver! Yes, sir. Take me to the sign of the white wing? Yes, sir, came the reply. Dash sat back and sighed. After a long moment of reflection, he muttered, Bitch. Sixteen. Friends. Carly frowned. Rue was dressing hurriedly for his supper appointment, and did not seem to pay attention to what she was saying. 
Catching sight of her expression, he said, I'm sorry, dear. What was that? I said I was hoping you would be dining in tonight. I have something to talk to you about. Smoothing back his hair with a brush, he glanced in the mirror at his reflection and frowned slightly. No matter how rich the clothing, how expensive the barber, he still didn't care much for how he looked. A tiny sound of delight caused him to look down, and he saw his daughter crawling in the doorway. Then she shrieked with joy as she gripped the door jamb and stood. She couldn't quite walk yet, though she was trying, but she could manage to stand now if she had something to hold on to. Carly turned, impatience on her face. Mary, she shouted. Yes, ma'am, came the reply from the next room. You let Abigail out of your sight, and she was crawling here on the landing, scolded Carly. Mary seemed to have some strange notion that she could set the baby down and leave and return to find the child in the same place. That hadn't been true for nearly three months now. What if she fell down the stairs? said Carly. Lou saw his daughter grinning at him, drool dribbling down her chin. Little teeth were emerging, and she often fussed through the night, but he had to admit he was becoming fond of her. He bent down and picked up the child, who viewed him with a skeptical eye. The baby put out her hand, trying to stick as many fingers as possible into his mouth, when Rue was suddenly greeted by a very strong odor. Oh, no, he said, holding the child at arm's length, while he looked for any sign of a diaper leak on his new coat. Not seeing one, he carried the baby, still at arm's length, into the next room, where he said, Dearest, the baby has filled her diapers. Again. Carly took the girl and sniffed delicately, saying, I believe you're right. Rue pecked her on the cheek. I'll try not to be too late, but if talks go on into the night, don't wait up for me. Before she could say anything, he was out the door. His carriage had been brought around from the storage yard behind the house. He had purchased it the month before, and occasionally rode around the city in it, just to be seen. The Pitcher Sea Company, as it was known, was rapidly consolidating its power base, and the name Rue Avery was on its way to becoming famous throughout Crondor and the Western Realm. As Rue climbed into the carriage, he considered what he might do to further expand his reach financially. The Blue Star Shipping Company was reportedly in financial difficulty, and Rue thought the Pitcher Sea Company would be needing more ships soon. Perhaps he should have Duncan sniff around the waterfront for further rumors, while he had Dash and Jason talk to their contacts. Rue wished he could convince Dash's brother Jimmy to come to work for him as well, considering how useful he had proven during the grain manipulation. But while Dash was working with Rue with his grandfather's blessing, the Duke seemed determined to keep his other grandson working at the palace. Rue settled back into the carriage and used a gold-topped walking stick to knock on the roof, signaling the driver he was ready to leave. The other thing that passed through Rue's mind as he rode through Crondor was how he might exact revenge on Timothy Jacoby. Hurting him in the grain swindle hadn't been enough. Twice since then, Jacoby and Sons had pulled trades to the disadvantage of the Bitter Sea Company. It was also attracting other firms into loose alliance, due in the main to fear of the Bitter Sea's growing power. But merely being more successful than Jacoby and Sons wasn't enough for Rue. Until Tim lay dead before him, he wouldn't count the debt for Helmut squared. He considered a half dozen plans and discarded them all. When a confrontation finally occurred, events had to appear as if Rue had nothing to do with inciting it. Otherwise, he might find himself back in the death cell. And now he had far too much to lose. As if wealth was a lodestone, attracting more wealth. So his success in forming the Bitter Sea Company had caused more opportunities to appear. He now controlled most of the freight between Crondor and the north, and a very serious percentage of it between Crondor and the eastern realm. Only between Kesh and the kingdom... Did he fail to gain any significant presence? Much of that trade had been secured by Jacobian sons, and those contracts appeared unbreakable. In fact, if anything, they appeared to be growing, as caravans from the south seemed on the rise. Thoughts of business and trade vanished as the carriage approached the gates of the Estabrook estate. The servant inside the gate inquired who was seeking admission, and Rue's driver called out his master's name. The gate quickly opened. This was the fourth time since his grand party that Rue had visited the Estabrook house. The first time, Sylvia had been flirtatious and charming. The second, she had lingered after her father had bid Rue good evening, and she had again kissed his cheek, pressing her body against his, and again she blushed and claimed it was the effect of the wine. The last time, she had again lingered, only this time the kiss had been passionate and not on the cheek, and she had said nothing about wine, only that, he should return soon. 
The dinner invitation had arrived two weeks later. Despite his impatience to see Sylvia again, Rue waited for another servant to open the door once the carriage came to a stop. He dismounted and said to the driver, Return to the city and get supper, then return here later. Wait here until I appear. I do not know how late I may be. The driver saluted and drove off, while Rue mounted the steps to the door. When the servant opened the door for him and he stepped inside, he was greeted by Sylvia, who smiled broadly at him. Rupert, she exclaimed, as if she weren't expecting him. The sound of his name on her lips sent a shiver through him, and sight of her in another of those scandalously low-cut gowns caused him to flush in excitement. She slipped her arm through his and kissed him on the cheek, pressing her bosom hard against him. "'You look very handsome tonight,' she said softly in his ear. He swore she almost purred when she spoke. She led him to the dining-room, and he saw only two places set. "'Where's your father?' he asked suddenly alarmed and excited at the same time. She smiled. He's out of the city on business. I thought you knew. I could have sworn I wrote something to that effect on the invitation. Didn't I? Rue sat after she had taken her seat and said, No, I thought the invitation was from Jacob. It was from me. I hope you don't mind. Rue felt his face flush. No, he said quietly. I certainly don't mind. He could hardly eat and found himself reaching for his wine glass repeatedly. By the time Sylvia announced supper was over, he was fairly down the road to being drunk. He rose and escorted her toward the entryway. He couldn't remember one word in ten they had spoken. As they left the dining room, Sylvia turned to the servants and said, That will be all. We will not be needing you further tonight. Instead of leading Rue toward the front door, she instead guided him up the stairs. He was afraid to speak, lest he wake her from some dream. Down a long corridor they walked, and then she opened the door. She stepped across the threshold and gently pulled him through. Reaching around him, she pushed the door closed while he stood motionless, staring at the gigantic canopied bed that occupied the room. Then she wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him. Whatever shreds of rational thought Rue still possessed, vanished that moment. In the darkness, Rue stared up at the canopy above. He could hear Sylvia breathing slowly and evenly, and assumed she was asleep. He was exhausted, but also too keyed up to sleep. She was the most incredible woman he had known. She was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, but for the well-bred daughter of a rich merchant. She was an astonishing mix of playful childishness and wanton sensuality. She made love like a veteran of the sign of the white wing and was willing, no, eager, to perform acts that would have appalled Carly. Thinking of his wife, he pushed aside a twinge of guilt. He knew now that he didn't love her. He had married her from pity. He looked at where Sylvia lay and sighed. This is the woman he should have upon his arm, he thought not the dowdy little woman who was now at home, asleep in the belief he was discussing business with some shipping magnate. It was Sylvia whom he should be presenting to nobility, and it was Sylvia who should be bearing him children. His heart pounded in his chest, and his love for Sylvia became a bittersweet pang. He lay upon his side, staring at the barely seen outline of her in the darkness. In his boyhood dreams he had never imagined he would be the man he was at this moment nor would he have dreamed that a woman of Sylvia Estabrook's stunning beauty and charm would be sharing her bed with him. Rolling on his back, he stared at the dark cloth above him and wondered at the miracle of change he had experienced since the night he and Eric had fled from the hounds in Ravensburg. Thinking of Eric made Rue wonder where his friend might be and what he was doing. He knew Eric was across the sea somewhere with Callus, de Longville, and some men he didn't know, and he had no idea what they were doing but he suspected it was something dire, and he knew exactly why they were doing it. Feeling no peace at such thoughts, he gently reached out and ran his hand down the amazingly soft skin of the woman at his side. She instantly stirred and moved in a languid fashion. Without words, she rolled over and came to him, engulfing him in her arms. Amazed at how she knew instantly what he wished, he left all thoughts of Eric behind. 
Eric pointed at the rocks. To port! To port! The storm raged as the steersmen fought to pull the tiller hard, turning the ship to port and away from crashing death. Eric had stood at the prow of the dragon ship for hours, looking through the dim murk of the early morning light, swirling snow and fog, trying to avoid running the ship aground. They had shot past the southern tip of Great Cache, catching the current they had been told would carry them swiftly across the sea to Novindus. Days had passed, and the dragon boat with its sixty-four passengers, Callus, de Longville, Eric, Miranda, and sixty soldiers of Callus's eagles, sped across the ocean. The rowers pulled in shifts all day and all night, adding their muscle to the current, and the boat raced across a seemingly empty expanse of ocean. Miranda used her magical ability from time to time to judge their position, and claimed they were where they should be. The weather had grown bitter cold, and occasionally they would sight an iceberg floating northward. Miranda had told Eric one night that the southern pole of the world was captured by ice year-round, a mass so large the mind couldn't imagine, and from that massive shelf of ice pieces the size of cities would fall into the ocean, drifting northward to melt in the warm air of the blue or green sea. Eric had remained dubious until one day he had seen what he had thought to be a sail on the horizon, only to find later in the day it was one of those huge pieces of ice Miranda had warned about. From that point forward they had kept extra watches and set the rowers to shifts around the clock to keep moving. They had found a peninsula of that ice-covered land, and unfortunately came upon it too quickly. They were now trying desperately to keep the ship from crashing against it. Callus had warned that if they were stranded there they would die a cold, hungry death, and there was nothing that could be done to save them. "'Row, damn you!' shouted Bobby de Longville over the roar of surf, wind, and the groaning of wood as the ship heaved and turned against every demand of nature. Eric could feel them moving sideways as the powerful current took them into the tug of the surf. "'More to port!' he shouted, and the two men on the tiller pushed to obey. Callus stood at the rear of the ship and added his superhuman strength, and the tiller creaked alarmingly. They had been warned that the long tillers of these Bridgener dragon ships could snap off, and then the only possible way to steer would be by controlling the stroke of the rowers. They had also been warned that even an experienced crew of Bridgeners could do this only with difficulty, and no man on this boat was either experienced or a Bridgener. Miranda appeared upon the deck, and with a large motion of both arms, shouted a word that was nearly unheard at the bow where Eric watched, for and Eric had to grab at the rail to keep from going over into the water. The boat hesitated in its dash to destruction, and then stopped a moment in the water. Then the ship obeyed the rowers and tiller, turning to break free of the pull of the tide, and started to move on a course parallel to the coastline. Miranda let her hands drop and took a deep breath. She made her way to the bow of the boat, and Eric watched her with interest. She shared the tiny cabin in the rear with the captain, and Eric had some idea that this was more than mere courtesy on Callus's part. There was something between them, though Eric couldn't begin to guess what it might be. De Longville acted like the captain's personal guard dog when Callus and Miranda were inside, and only an event of the gravest consequence would cause a crewman to dare to try to get past him. Miranda was certainly attractive enough, thought Eric, as she came near, but there was something about her that still disturbed him in a way that made any notion of being intimate almost impossible to imagine. Almost, because like the other men on the boat, Eric hadn't been with a woman in months. As she came to her side, she pointed dead ahead into the murk. I dare not use another spell, certainly not one that powerful, for a few days, lest we call undue attention to ourselves. So pay heed, if you could see through this mess, she said. You would see a tiny grouping of three stars, almost a perfect equal triangle, two handspans above the horizon, one hour after sundown. If you point toward that, you'll eventually come to the coast of Novindus, less than a day's rowing from Ispar. Steer along the coastline, bearing to the northeast, and you'll find the mouth of the river Deep. We need to use non-magical means to find our destination. Miranda was obviously tired from the magic she had employed to keep the boat off the rocks, and more talkative in five minutes than she had been the entire trip. Eric wondered if it was just because of the magic she used, or from some other reason, but was reluctant to ask if everything was all right. Then he considered that nothing associated with this voyage was right. Miranda was far closer to the truth of this mission than Eric, and Eric knew enough to expect they might not be coming back. He imagined she must be even more worried than he was. Finally, he said, Are you all right? 
She looked at him in open surprise, her expression frozen for a long moment, then laughed. Eric was unsure of the cause of that laughter, but finally she gripped his arm, threw the heavy fur cloak he wore, and said, Yes, I'm all right. She sighed. The sighting spells I was using along the way were a whisper in the noise of a market at noon. The spell I just cast to keep us from the rocks was a shriek in the night. If someone is looking for us, or if wards have been set to detect magic... Shaking her head, she turned away. Miranda? asked Eric. She halted and looked over her shoulder. Yes, Eric. Are we going to get home, do you think? Whatever amusement she had revealed a moment before vanished. She paused only briefly when she said, Probably not. Eric resumed his position, watching the murk for sudden danger. After another few hours, Alfred, the corporal from Darkmoor, came and said, I may leaving you, Sergeant. Eric said, Very well, and returned to the rowing oars. Once he had broken Alfred down, stripped him of the rank and attitude that had made him a bully and brawler back home, the man had turned into a first-rate soldier. Eric considered it likely that he would be one of the first to be promoted to corporal when they returned to Crondor, then amended the thought to, if they returned to Crondor. Other than the tiny cabin where the captain and Miranda slept, the only place to sleep was either leaning over the extra oars behind the last rower's bench, like a galley slave, or lying on the deck between the rowers. They slept in shifts. Lesser trained men might have come to blows, given the cramped quarters, the months at sea, and the coming danger, but the Longville and Callus had picked the sixty most disciplined men in the company. Any temper was deferred, and any discomfort was kept to oneself. Eric lay down and almost instantly dropped off to sleep. Fatigue was a constant companion, and after years of soldiering and grabbing sleep when he could, little could stir his mind enough to keep him awake. But as he fell into slumber, he did wonder in passing how his friends back home were doing. He wondered if Rue was making any progress toward being a rich man, and how Jado's leg had healed, and how the other men in the command were training. He wished he had Greylock to talk to, and then he thought of Nacor, that funny little man. And Chopin had not returned from Stardock with the captain, and Eric pondered what they must be up to as sleep overtook him. A dozen young men and women laughed, while twice the number scowled, muttered, or jeered. It's true, insisted Nacor. Chopin stood beside the man he had claimed as his master, looking to defend him should any of the angry students decide it was time to take matters into their own hands. He wasn't concerned over Nacor's ability to defend himself against up to a half-dozen of them. He knew exactly how adept Nacor was at open-handed fighting, the Isolani style taught at the Temple of Dalla. But against a full dozen or more, he would need help. "'Sit down!' cried one of those who had been laughing at one of those nearby who was jeering. "'Why don't you make me?' demanded the object of the instruction. Nacor said, "'Wait a minute!' He crossed to where the two young men were standing opposite one another, and grabbed each by the ear. It was a beautiful dawn at Stardock, and Nacor had gotten into a discussion with a student at the pre-dawn breakfast. As the sun began to rise in the east, Nacor had decided to conduct a class outside, away from the musty, dark halls that usually served for places of instruction. As he led the two howling young men into the center of the large circle, all three factions of students began to laugh. Chopin glanced up at the high window overlooking the lawn upon which the lesson was being conducted, and saw the faces at that window. Since being left in charge of the academy, Nacor had left most of the daily operation as he had found it, though from time to time he had taken it upon himself to teach a lesson on one thing or another. Most of his time was spent with a nameless, mindless beggar who was now a fixture of the island. Each morning two students were delegated to throwing the beggar into the lake, a marginal effort toward keeping the man clean. Once in a while, one or another of the more ambitious students would try to apply soap to the man, often resulting in a bloody nose or black eye. When not soaking wet, the man scampered from place to place, watching what everyone else did, or he slept, or he haunted the kitchen area, trying to steal food unless it was given to him. When presented with meals, he knocked the plates over, as a child might, and proceeded to squat and eat with his fingers from the floor. The rest of Nacor's time was spent in the library, reading and making notes. 
Chopi was occasionally given the opportunity to ask a question or request instruction in something that he wished to understand better. Nacor often obliged him by sending him on some strange quest or asked him a seemingly incomprehensible riddle. When he accomplished the quest or admitted failure or when he guessed the answer of the riddle, Nacor's reaction was one of universal indifference. The two howling students were released, and Nacor said, Thank you for volunteering to aid me and demonstrating the truth of my claim. To the student who belonged to the faction known as the Blue Riders, after Nacor's previous tenure at the Academy, he said, You believe I am being honest when I say that the energies we call magic can be manipulated without resorting to all the mumbo-jumbo most of you think is required. Is that not so? Of course, Master, said the student. Nacor sighed. All the Blue Riders called him Master, despite his objections, a legacy of Chopi's doing. To the other student, a member of the faction calling themselves the Wand of Watum, he said, And you don't think it's possible, correct? Of course it's not possible. Sleight of hand, street mummery, certainly, but not true manipulation of the forces of magic. Holding up a finger, Nacor said, Then observe. As he moved to position himself behind his student, the nameless beggar came pushing through the circle of students. Once in a while the man whom everyone but Nacor counted mad showed an interest in what was going on. He squatted a few feet away and watched. Nacor asked the student behind whom he stood, Did you take any training in the Reiki I taught last month? Of course, said the student. Very well, said Nacor. This is much the same thing. Make a fist. He took the arm of the student and bent it back then positioned the young man's feet in a fighter's stance. To the other student he said, Just stand there, if you don't mind. Nacor said, Pull back your arm and feel the energy that is in you. Close your eyes if it will help. The student did so. Now, said Nacor, feel the energy in you coursing through you and around you. Feel it flow. When you are ready, I want you to strike a blow at that young man's stomach, but more than just a blow. I want you to release the energy through the knuckles of your hand. Get ready, he said to the student who was about to be struck. Tighten your stomach or something. This might hurt. The doubting student smirked, but braced himself in case. The first student struck the blow, and it thudded into the second student's stomach, causing him barely to flinch. Need to work on this, said Nacor. You're not feeling the energy. Suddenly the beggar jumped to his feet and pushed the first student aside. He balanced himself perfectly on the balls of his feet and closed his eyes, and Nacor stepped away as he felt a fey energy crackle through the air around him. Then the beggar whipped back his hand, shot it forward, exhaling his breath as he said something that sounded like, Shot! When the blow struck, the doubting student seemed to fly backward off his feet, with an audible explosion of breath from his lungs. He sailed a half-dozen feet through the air to land atop two other students, who barely had time to react and catch him. The struck student doubled up, holding his stomach and obviously choking. Nacor rushed over, rolled the boy on his back, and picked him up around the waist, forcing him to breathe. With a ragged inhale and tears running down his face, the student looked at Nacor with eyes wide. Barely able to speak, he said, I was wrong. Yes, you were agreed to Nacor. He told two other students, Take him inside and have the healer check him over for injury. Something inside may be damaged. He turned to find the beggar was back on his haunches, watching with vacant eyes. So P came over and said, Master, what was that? Softly, Nacor said, I wish I knew. Then he turned to the other students. You see, even that poor creature knows enough to utilize the power that is already there, around you, everywhere. Seeing that most faces were only showing astonished confusion, Nacor waved his hand toward the main building and said, Very well, this lesson is over. Go back to whatever it is you do at this time. As the students departed, Nacor came over to where the beggar squatted and hunkered down to gaze at the man's eyes. Where, for a brief instant, something powerful and wise had been glimpsed. Now only a vacant pair of orbs were seen. Nacor sighed. My friend, he said, just what are you? He stood and turned to find Chopi, as he had expected. 
I wish I were a smarter man, he told his self-appointed student. I wish I knew more. Master? was all Sophie said. Nacor shrugged. Wish I knew what's happened to Callus, too. I'm getting bored here, and besides, he said, looking into the blue western sky as the sun cleared the horizon behind him, something's going on. We're going to have to leave soon, whether or not someone from Crondor comes to run things here. When, master? asked Sophie. Nacor shrugged. I don't know. Soon. Maybe this week. Maybe next month. We'll know when it's time. Come on, let's get some food. At the mention of food, the mindless beggar jumped up and with grunting and hooting sounds started shambling toward the dining hall. Nacor pointed after him. See? Our very basic friend there understands the relative importance of things. Then to Shopi, in the Isalani tongue, he said, And he hits like a grand master of the Order of Dalla. Shopi answered in the same language, No, master, harder. Whatever else that man has more cha, he used an ancient word for personal power, than any priest I ever saw when I was a monk in the temple. Lowering his voice, he said, He could have killed that boy, I think. Nacor said, Had he wanted to, no doubt. As they entered the dining hall, both men considered what they had just witnessed. Rue awoke to a gray pre-dawn light showing in the window. He realized that he would barely be able to return home before Carly awoke. He knew it possible the baby had slept through the night, and Carly might be convinced he had returned earlier, but he would have to move quickly. He left the bed as quietly as he could, regretting the need. The memory of Sylvia's body and her urgent demands throughout the night aroused him despite his fatigue. He dressed and quietly left the room, moving down the stairs and out the door. He approached his coach, where his driver was dozing, and woke the man, instructing him to head for home at once. Inside the house, Sylvia lay awake, smiling to herself. In the darkness, she thought, the little troll wasn't too difficult to take. He was young, enthusiastic, and a lot stronger than he looked. She knew that while he thought himself in love with her, he had barely begun to experience the depth of obsession she would bring him to. Within a month he would be willing to compromise some minor business matter for her. Within a year he'd betray his business partners. She yawned and stretched in satisfaction. Her father wouldn't be returning for a few days, and she knew she'd receive a note from Rue before midday. She'd ignore him for a day or two, then invite him back to the house. For a sleepy moment she wondered how long she should wait before her contrition scene, when she announced to Rue that she couldn't continue to see a married man no matter how much she loved him. As she started to drift off to slumber, she considered there were a couple of young men in the city she should invite to the house before her father returned. Rue tiptoed upstairs and slipped into the bedroom. The dawn was now breaking, and in the half-lighted room he could see Carly was asleep. He slipped out of his clothing and into bed next to her. Less than a half hour later, she awoke, and Rue pretended to be asleep. She rose and dressed, then went to where the baby was quietly singing to herself. After waiting a while, Rue arose and went down to the dining room. Good morning, said Carly, feeding the baby. Abigail giggled and said, Da, at sight of Rue. Rue yawned. Did you get much sleep? asked Carly, looking at him with a neutral expression on her face. Rue pulled out a chair and sat while Mary came from the kitchen with a large mug of coffee for him. I feel like I slept for five minutes, he said. Carly asked, Late night? Very. I don't even know what time we finished. Carly made a non-committal sound as she spooned mashed vegetables into the mouth of the hungry child. After a few minutes, Carly said, I have something to tell you. Rue felt his chest tighten. He wondered for a panic-stricken moment if somehow she knew he had betrayed her, and then forced the thought aside. She hadn't suspected anything when he returned from Ravensburg after having tumbled Gwen, and he decided she had no reason to suspect anything now. Calmly, he said, What is it? She said, I wanted to tell you last night, but you were in such a rush. What is it? Rue repeated. We're going to have another baby. Rue looked at Carly and saw her eyes were searching his face, looking for a reaction. 
and he sensed she was fearful of what that reaction would be. Wonderful! He forced himself to sound pleased. He stood, came around the table, and said, This time a boy. He kissed her cheek. Maybe, Carly said softly. Trying to sound jovial, Rue said, It has to be a boy, otherwise I'm going to have to have all the signs changed to Avery and daughters. And wouldn't that be something to see? She smiled weakly. If a son will make you happy, I hope it's a boy. He said, If it's as wonderful a child as this one, then I'll be happy. Carly didn't look convinced, and as Rue started to leave the room, laying his half-drunk cup of coffee on the table, she said, Aren't you going to eat? No, he said, as he took down his coat from the peg on the wall next to the outer door. I have to make straight for the office. I have an important letter to write, then I have to come back over here for a meeting at Barrett's. Without waiting for her to say anything else, he left the house, and Carly heard the door slam. She sighed as she attempted to keep most of the food going into the baby's mouth and not onto the floor. Time passed, and life took on a strange but steady tempo. Rue conspired to steal away to Sylvia once or twice a week, while spending a like number of nights each week with his business associates. There had been a horrible scene when she had claimed remorse because he was married, and he had to beg for weeks to get her to agree to see him again. She had at last relented when he had sent her a diamond and emerald necklace that had cost him more gold than he could have imagined only two years before. Sylvia finally admitted she loved him, and Rue had fallen into a routine of illicit love and lying to his wife. His strengths as a businessman emerged quickly, and rarely did he enter into a bad bargain and those few he did become enmeshed in created little financial hardship. Over the course of months, the Bitter Sea Company grew and prospered. Rue also learned how best to deploy the skills of those working for him. Duncan was most valuable at ferreting out rumors and keys to trading opportunities among the inns and taverns of the caravanseries and docks. Jason was proving adept at the single most confounding element of business to Rue, the management of funds. There was far more to being a merchant prince than merely buying and selling. Such odd concepts as cross-collateralization and mutually shared risk among non-members of the company were best to invest gold not being used for purchases and when to seek safety by simply letting the gold sit. All these were areas of knowledge where Jason showed an uncanny knack, while Rue could barely follow along. Six months after he first bedded Sylvia, Rue's company took control of accounting house and began its own banking. Luis was proving to be a treasure to Rue. He could be as gentle with an angry woman customer as he could be merciless with the toughest teamster. Twice he had to prove to one of the more belligerent that even with one crippled hand he was more than able to enforce his orders. Dash was the mystery to Rue. He seemed indifferent to any personal gain, but was pleased by the growth of the Bitter Sea Company as much as Rue was. It was as if he was serving the company for the sheer pleasure of seeing it thrive, rather than to benefit himself, and upon occasion he even contrived to involve his brother in some scheme or another. Between the two of them, Jimmy and Dash could be a formidable pair against whom Rue wouldn't wish to find himself pitted. As Carly grew with what he hoped was his son, Rue felt life could hardly be better, save for two sour notes. The continued existence of Tim Jacoby, and the absence of his friends from the old days. 17. Disasters Rue sighed. The baby squirmed in his arms as the priest droned through his incantations and poured scented oil on the baby's forehead. While he was thrilled at having a son, Rue decided that nothing would ever make the naming ceremony any more bearable. I name you Helmut Avery, said the priest at last. Rue handed the child to Carly and kissed her upon the cheek. Then he kissed little Abigail, who was squirming in Mary's arms, and said, I must rush to the office for a while, but I'll be home in two hours at the latest. Carly looked dubious, knowing as she did that her husband often worked impossibly long hours, sometimes throughout the night and the next day before returning home. We have guests coming, she reminded him. I remember, he said, as his family left the temple. Walking down the steps, he left Carly behind, saying, You take the carriage. I'll walk from here. Rue made his way along the streets until he was clear of Temple Square, when he found a public carriage and hired it. Within minutes, he was leaving the city on the road for the Estabrook estate. 
He wondered at his foul mood. Sylvia had become such a source of wonder for him that any anger or frustration was left behind, and for reasons he hadn't pursued, her father never seemed to be at home these days, so within minutes of his arrival for supper, or like today, a surprise midday visit, Sylvia would welcome him with open arms and quickly lead him upstairs. Rue was astonished and delighted to discover her appetites matched his own. Occasionally he wondered who had first taught a well-bred young lady like Sylvia so many inventive love-making tricks, but she had never volunteered anything of her past before meeting Rue, nor had she asked about his previous experiences. As the carriage rolled into the Estabrook estate, Rue realized the cause of his foul mood. Of those who attended Helmut's naming ceremony this day, or who would attend the celebration that evening, the one Rue most wished could be there wasn't. Eric signaled, and the column of riders halted. By hand signs, the order to dismount was passed. Eric rode at the head of the column next to Miranda and Bobby de Longville, while Callus and a man named Ronaldo scouted ahead. The boat had been beached at the location Callus had planned on, and the captain had been visibly relieved when agents from the distant city of the Serpent River had appeared within days. News from the front was grim. A great fleet was nearly half completed, and the armies of the Emerald Queen now held total control of the continent, save the small region south of the Rottengari Mountains and some of the western coast. Otherwise, the reports were uniformly dreadful. The Emerald Queen's host was ravaging the entire continent. They were stripping the land of every resource as they sought to create the great fleet they needed to cross the ocean and invade the kingdom. The deaths of thousands of slaves captured during the war were ignored. Several minor rebellions among the host of former mercenaries had been crushed mercilessly, with the rebels publicly crucified or impaled before elements of the army. As for the punishment, one man in a thousand had been selected by lot to die by being burned alive before his comrades, a further warning that any sign of disobedience would bring only utter destruction. Eric had thought about the time every man in his squad was held accountable for the other five. Each member of the squad had effectively seen that no one failed, because it would have returned every one of them to the gallows. The only good news in all of this for Callus's company was that the Emerald Queen's whole attention was turned to the immediate area around the city of the Serpent River, the city of Maharta, and the Riverlands. The area in which Callus and his company were to operate was almost devoid of any sign of her army. Callus observed that that would probably cease to be the case as they neared their destination. Horses had been secured and brought to the boat. Local clothing had been exchanged for their Bridgener gear, and six of Callus's agents took the Bridgener longship and moved it down the coast to a fishing village, where they had made arrangements to hide it in a large drying shed until the time to escape came. No one mentioned that few felt that possibility likely. Now they were in the mountains, having moved through the foothills for a week, and had yet to encounter anything remotely dangerous. Eric had been one of those to flee the Sa'awa through the tunnels occupied by the Pantathians, and knew some of what they were likely to find, for once it had been determined that Callus's eagles, whom the Pantathians thought to be only a rebel company of mercenaries, had entered the mountains, a full-scale Sa'awa occupation of the area had resulted. Eric knew only the bold deception in pretending to be one of the human companies replaced by the Sa'awa, and moving directly to the front, in the opposite direction from that which logic dictated they take, had saved them on that prior journey. Ronaldo ran up, and between pants reported to de Longville. The captain's found a safe campsite, and says we're done for the day. Eric glanced around and saw several hours of daylight were left. De Longville saw the same thing and said, We're close. Ronaldo nodded. He pointed through the trees. There's a ridge there, and from there you can see both the river gorge and the bridge. I take the captain's word for the latter. Eric understood. Callus's vision was far more acute than any human's. But if they could see the gorge, they were but a day's ride from the bridge and from there to the entrance to the mines. Another day's ride. If they decided to abandon the horses, it would be an extra two-day march from the bridge to the caves. Eric dismounted, feeling mixed emotions. If they rode, 
things would be easier on the men, but to abandon the horses near the mines was a death sentence for the mounts. They were unlikely to cross the bridge by themselves, and on the other side there was no fodder. Some might even fall to their deaths. Eric considered for a moment the irony of worrying more about the horse's survival than his own. He shrugged off the thought as orders were passed to make camp. The men fell to with the discipline beaten into, taught to, and expected from them. Alfred had been recently promoted to corporal and was reminding Eric more each day of Charlie Foster, the corporal who first made Eric's every day a living hell at Bobby de Longville's whim. Now, years later, Eric understood that making these men obey without hesitation or thought ensured the best chance for each man's survival, and, more important, the achievement of the mission's goals. When camp was readied, a rotation of guards was established and each man went to eat, trail rations in a cold camp so as not to risk anyone seeing a fire. Winter was rapidly approaching, so it would be an uncomfortable night for everyone. While everyone else was eating, Eric inspected the horses and made sure every mount was sound. He also saw that every man was where he was expected to be, then moved to where De Longville, Callus, and Miranda sat. Callus indicated Eric should sit. Horses are fine, Eric said. Callus said, Good. We're going to have to find a place around here to leave them. Miranda said, Why bother? Callus shrugged. I don't discount the chance we may get out of this and need a quick route out of the mountains. If there's a canyon around here with enough grazing for a week or two, I'd like to put the horses there. The heavy snows are not yet upon us, and the horses may prove useful. Eric said, when we passed around the peak at midday, I saw a small valley below us. He indicated the general direction. I can't be sure, but I think there is a route down from the trail. A goat path, at least. Kala said, We're going to rest here for a couple of days, so investigate it tomorrow. If there's a way in, put the horses down there. Eric was still not comfortable with the captain, though he had spent enough time with Bobby to speak his mind when he felt the need. Still, if anything, the captain appreciated direct talk when it concerned the mission. Captain, why are we waiting? We run the risk of discovery each day we delay. Calda said, We're waiting for someone. Miranda said, I have an agent, and he's trying to find some local men we need to talk to. Eric waited, and no more was said, so he resigned himself to having to wait to find out who this mysterious agent of Miranda's might be, and who those local men were. He excused himself and rose to go see how the men were doing. Eric was not surprised to find each man was doing exactly what he was supposed to do, and that he needed to instruct none of them. This was the finest group of soldiers in the history of the kingdom, according to Lord William and de Longville, and Eric felt a fierce pride at being included in that number. He downplayed his own role in the creation of this unity, but took credit for his own evolution as a soldier. He had spent hours reading every book on warfare and tactics and had taken the opportunity to speak with everyone in the palace he could on various military topics. He had even had occasion to discuss such issues with visiting nobles who came to call at the palace. Sometimes they'd chat over supper in the soldiers' commons, sometimes at a state dinner at the prince's palace, and occasionally in the marshalling yard as some border baron or eastern duke had observed the training of Callus's crimson eagles. Eric didn't think of himself as being particularly gifted in strategy, supply, or deployment, but he felt he had a knack for leading men, or at least getting them to do what needed to be done, without having to resort to bullying and threats the way some officers did. He really enjoyed the feeling that if he led, other men would follow, and he couldn't quite put his finger on why he felt good about that. He just did. Finishing his inspection, he sat and pulled a ration pack out of his saddlebags. He unwrapped the wax-dipped cloth, ensuring that the flaking pieces of wax fell onto another cloth. He knew that if he didn't inspect the site when they broke camp and make sure that not one flake of wax lingered to betray their passing, the Longville would. As much as his relationship had changed with Bobby since the fateful day when Bobby had ordered Eric hung, he still was not exempted from a public dressing down if the sergeant major felt Eric wasn't discharging his duty. Callus and Miranda approached, and Eric said, Captain? We're going to walk a bit, said Callus. Set your sentries and tell them the call sign is Two Finger Snaps and Magpie. Is that clear? Eric nodded. Clear? Whoever might blunder into this camp would be warned with Two Finger Snaps by the sentry. 
If he didn't respond instantly with the word magpie, he would be greeted with deadly force. Eric hoped that no itinerant traders or mendicant friars came wandering down that trail for the next few days. As Callus began to depart, Eric said, Captain. Callus halted. Yes. Why magpie? Callus indicated Miranda with a nod of his head. Miranda said, Because it's the word my agent has, and besides, magpies don't exist on this continent, so no lucky guesses. Eric shrugged and returned to eating his supper. Callus said, We need to speak of a few things. Miranda sat on a fallen tree bowl, such as. Callus sat beside her. If we survive, do we have a future? You and I, I mean. Miranda took his hand in hers. That is difficult to say. She sighed. No, that's impossible even to think about. She leaned over and kissed him. We have been special to each other since we met Callis. He said nothing. We have found feelings for each other that few people know. After another moment of silence, she said, But the future? I don't know if we'll be alive next week. Callis said, Think on it. I plan on surviving. Miranda studied his face in the golden light of the late afternoon sun as it streamed through the trees. She laughed. What is so funny? he asked, his lips turning up in a guarded smile. I am, she said, standing and reaching behind her to unfasten the ties of her dress. I was always a fool for a pretty blonde boy. Now come, warm me up. It's a cold day. As her dress fell to her ankles, he rose and wrapped his arms around her, his hands upon her buttocks. He picked her up in his arms as easily as he would a child. Kissing her between her breasts, he playfully spun her around in a circle, then laid her gently down on the ground and said, Boy, I'm past a half-century of age, woman. Miranda laughed. My mother always said that younger men made enthusiastic lovers, but often took themselves far too seriously. Callus paused a moment, studying Miranda's face. You never speak of your mother, he said softly. Miranda said nothing for a long time, then laughed. Get out of your clothes, boy, she said in mock command. The ground is cold. Callus smiled broadly. My father told me always to show respect to my elders. Quickly they coupled, losing their fear of what tomorrow might bring in one of the most basic and life-affirming acts possible. For brief moments their experience was one of shared joy and a denial of death, fear, and misery. Two finger snaps were quickly followed by the word magpie, spoken with a slightly odd accent. Eric was at the sentry point only moments before DeLongville and Callis. They had waited three days, and Callus had decided that if Miranda's agent didn't show, he would move ahead regardless. The horses had been moved to a lush valley that would keep them grazing for weeks. Eric also knew that if no one survived to return, the horses would find their way out of the valley and down into the lower meadows as winter approached. That made him feel better, for a reason he couldn't articulate. While the mountains of Darkmoor were less impressive than those they now approached, Eric recognized the change in the weather. The nights would quickly fall below freezing, and snow would come with the next storm. Winter was almost upon them. The man who came into view in the lead was oddly dressed, in whitish armor that Eric instantly marked as not being any metal with which he was familiar. For one thing, it should have clanked loudly, but it didn't. For another, it should have made the man wearing it plod along, but he moved lightly upon his feet. His head was completely enclosed in a helm with two narrow eyeslets, and upon his back he wore what appeared to be a crossbow of some alien design. Otherwise he fairly bristled with swords, daggers, and knives. The two men who followed were familiar figures to Eric, who greeted them softly when they were close. Praji, Vaja, it's good to see you again. The two old fighters returned the greeting. We'd heard you were among those who got away from the Harta, von Darkmoor, said Praji. The two old men were armed as mercenaries, but Eric wondered how well they could still fight, given their advancing age. 
Still, he had seen firsthand two years previously Praji and Vaja's toughness, and nothing he saw now indicated they were any less skilled, just tired. Prajikitas was as ugly a man as Eric had ever encountered, but smart and likable. Vajasiya was a fading peacock of a man, still vain despite advancing years, and the two dissimilar men were as loyal to each other as brothers. Miranda said, Boldar, any trouble? The walking arsenal removed his helm, revealing a youthful face, freckled and pale, with red-brown hair and blue eyes. A slight sheen of perspiration was the only sign of exertion, while Praji and Vaja both came into camp and sat with open displays of fatigue. The man named Boldar said, None. It took me a while to track down your two friends, Callus. Callus glanced at Miranda, who said, I described you. He was to come here and find you, even if I had gone. Callus didn't look pleased at the if-I-had-gone part. He asked Praji, How goes it in the east? Badly. Worse than we've ever imagined. This emerald queen bitch is far worse than we remembered at Hamsa and the other places we've run across her. He pulled off his boots and wiggled his toes. Do you remember General Guppy from the mercenaries' rendezvous before the assault on Lanada? He was sent against the Jashandi in the northern steppe. A big mistake from my experience with those horsemen. And they beat him to a bloody stump. One man in ten sent into the grasslands got back. Anyway, the Emerald Queen took it personally. She had Guppy staked out over an anthill and smeared honey on his balls. They'd all her generals watch until he stopped screaming. Vaja shook his head. You don't fail in her army. The old fighter smiled. Gives a whole new meaning to do or die. Kala said, So the Jashandi still hold? No more, answered Praji, a sad note in his voice. After Gopi's failure, they unleashed five thousand sa'ar into the grasslands. The Jashandi handled themselves well enough. They made the lizardmen bleed more than anyone else so far but they were finally crushed. Eric nodded in silence. He had faced the Sa'our and their monstrous horses only once, but he knew that despite their size, the Sa'our were as good horsemen as he had ever seen. No human force could face them one to one. It took three or four human riders to neutralize one Sa'our. In his idle moments, Eric had wrestled with plans to defeat the Sa'our in open combat, and had yet to devise one that seemed remotely plausible. Praji said, There are some stragglers still riding in the foothills, raiding a camp here and there for food, but as a force, the free people are uh, no more. Callus was silent a moment. Of all the cultures in this remote continent, the Jashandi counted the largest number of elven people. Each elf who was killed was a loss no human could understand. His mother's people would be mourning this news for decades. Shaking off his reflective mood, he asked, What of the clans to the south? Praji said, That's where he, he pointed at Boldar, found us. We were in a camp with Atonis last night. Eric blurted, You were in the Eastlands this morning? Praji nodded. This lad has the means of getting us around in a hurry. Boldar held out a device, turning it slightly in his hands. It was an orb with a series of small protruding switches. We got here in the blink of an eye, continued Praji. We spent most of the day trekking around these bleeding mountains trying to find you. Turning back to Callus, Praji said, We are pretty helpless, old friend. The Emerald Queen's fairly got our army lining the banks of the river on both sides these days. We hardly get a bow shot at our lumber barges. Best we can do sometimes is attack from ambush and try to run a barge aground on the banks, that sort of thing. The last time we tried to raid into the city of the Serpent River, we lost half our force and did no damage to speak of. He sighed. Looking directly at Callus, he said, The war here is over, Callus. Whatever you propose to do here in the Westlands, it had better be something special, because that fleet she's building is going to be ready to sail next year, year after at the latest. We thought we were buying ten years for you, but it's more like three or four. Callus nodded. And two of those are gone. Looking at the two tired old men, he said, Get something to eat. As Praji and Vaja were handed cold rations, Miranda turned to Boldar. Did you bring it? 
Boldar unshouldered his bag and reached inside. He pulled out a small amulet. Cost a fair bit, but not as much as I thought it would. I'll add the cost to what you owe me. What is it? asked Callus. Miranda handed it to him, and Eric observed it as Callus held it up. It seemed nothing more than a simple gold neck decoration. Miranda said, It's a ward against scrying magic. As of this moment, no magician can find you, and anyone within a dozen paces of you. This may save our lives when it's time to get out of here. Callus nodded. He handed it back to Miranda, but she put up her hand. I don't need it. She reached out and pushed his hand back toward him. You do. Callus hesitated, then nodded and put the amulet around his neck. Turning to where Bobby de Longville stood, he said, We leave at first light. Eric stood and started his rounds. De Longville didn't need to tell him what to do, or that now was the time to do it. Jason came running into Barrett, gripping a sheaf of paper and parchment, and looked around the room. Spying Rue on the stairs, he called his name and raced past a pair of startled waiters. "'What is it?' asked Rue. His eyes had dark circles under them, as he had missed sleeping for the better part of two days. He had promised himself he would stay away from Sylvia for a few days. He intended to spend time with his wife and children, getting some needed sleep in the master suite, while Carly slept with a baby in the nursery. But each of the last two nights, as if he had no volition, he had told his driver to take him to the Estabrook estate. Jason lowered his voice. Someone's convinced Jurgens to call our note. Rue instantly lost his fatigue. He took Jason by the arm and led him to the table that was now thought of as the Bitter Sea Company table, where Masterson, Hume, and Crowley sat. Rue came, sat, and said, Jurgens has called our note. What? said Masterson. He agreed to the extension. Looking at Jason, he asked, What happened? Jason sat down and spread out the paperwork before him. This is far worse than an untimely debt call, gentlemen. He pointed at a ledger sheet. Someone at our counting house has been, for lack of a better term, embezzling funds. At that, both Hume and Crowley sat upright. What? demanded Crowley. Jason politely and patiently began to explain, despite several interruptions. The short explanation was that not only had someone cleverly buried tens of thousands of golden sovereigns through clever transfers from account to account, they had also managed to avoid detection for months. Now there was almost a quarter million sovereigns unaccounted for. The only reason Jason had been able to uncover the deceit was because of the note being called. The worst of it, gentlemen, said Jason, is that one way or another the call comes at the most critical moment for the Bitter Sea Company since it was founded. If we can't meet this demand note from Jurgens, we lose the options on Blue Star shipping, and without those ships we can't make a half dozen critical contracts. What's the worst? asked Rue. The worst? If this note is not met, you can lose it all. Suddenly Crowley was saying, This is your doing, Avery. I told you we were moving too fast. We needed time to consolidate, to build capital reserves. But you insisted we keep taking positions. Luck turns, Rupert. And it has just turned on us. Masterson said, What's the note? Jason said, 600,000 golden sovereigns. How light are we? Jason laughed bitterly. Exactly what was embezzled. We can liquidate a few holdings quickly and maybe come to 400,000, but there's easily 200,000 less than we need. Who did this? demanded Hume. Jason said, more than one scribe had to be involved. He sat back and scratched his chin. I hate to say this, but it's as if the entire firm was being employed to ruin the Bitter Sea Company. Rue was silent a moment, then said, that's exactly what happened. That counting house was just too ripe a plum for any of us to pass up. He pointed a finger at Crowley. That includes you, too, Brandon. Crowley reluctantly said, That is true. Someone set us up, gentlemen. Who? Esterbrook, said Masterson. At least he's one of the few with the resources. But he hurts himself, said Rue. He's involved in a half dozen deals with the Bitter Sea Company. But we're big enough to be causing him some concern, said Hume. Masterson said, There are others, Wendell Brothers, Jelanke Traders, Harold the big trading houses in the free cities, Kilrain and the others. All of them have reasons to be wary of us. Rue said, Jason, go to the office and get Luis, Duncan, and any of the other men who can be trusted and know how to hold a sword. Then go to the counting house and put everyone there under guard. We're going to get to the bottom of this before whoever is working against us there catches wind that we know. Jason stood up. I'll leave at once. 
Masterson said, If this was an arranged betrayal, he'll find the counting house office empty, I'll bet. Rue pushed back the chair and shook his head. I won't take that bet. The dark feeling inside was threatening to rise up and sweep over him. He could feel a deep dread building that he might be reduced to a penniless freebooter as quickly as he had risen to prominence. He took a deep breath. Well, worry won't feed the team, as my father used to say. I suggest we put our minds to how we raise a quick quarter million golden sovereigns of capital in... He glanced at the demand note Jason had left on the table. The next two days. The others were silent. Duncan glanced around the inn, then indicated with a quick nod the man he had located. Rue went over to sit next to cross from the man, while Louise and Duncan came to stand on either side. What? began the man as he started to rise. Duncan and Louise each placed a hand on his shoulders, forcing him back into his chair. You're Rob McCracken? asked Rue. Who wants to know? responded the man, obviously feeling less brave than he tried to sound. His face had gone pale, and he kept glancing around for a route of escape. You have a cousin named Herbert McCracken? The man tried again to rise, but found that the two men held him tightly. Maybe. Suddenly, Louise had a knife lying alongside the man's neck, and he said, You are asked a question that requires a more certain answer, my friend. It is either, yes, he is my cousin, or no, he is not my cousin, and be sure that the wrong answer will be very painful. Softly, the man said, Yes, Herbert is my cousin. When did you last see him? asked Rue. A few days ago. He dined with my family. He's a bachelor, so he comes by every two or three weeks for a meal. Did he say anything about leaving for a journey? No, said Rob McCracken. But he did say goodbye in a funny sort of way. What do you mean? The man glanced around. He lingered at the door and, well, he hugged me hard, and we haven't done that since we were kids. It could have been a longer goodbye than I thought. Most likely. If he were to decide to leave Crondor and live elsewhere, where would he go? asked Rue. McCracken said, I don't know. Hadn't thought that way. We have kin in the east, but they're distant. A cousin in Salador. Haven't seen him in ten years. Rue paused, drumming his fingers on the table. If your cousin was to come into a lot of gold unexpectedly, where then do you think he might go? The man's eyes narrowed. Enough to purchase a Quaggan title? Rue glanced at Louise, who said, I think a minor title, if he took it all. Rue stood up. Sarth. To Duncan, he said, Get as good a description as you can of this Herbert McCracken, then send a dozen riders to Sarth. If they take extra horses, they should be able to overtake him within ten hours. Rue said to Louise, Head for the docks and start asking questions. No ships in from or bound for Quag are registered but you never know if one has slipped in claiming to be from the Free Cities or Durban. Sniff around and double-check that no one matching McCracken's description is trying to slip aboard a ship bound out of the city. We have enough eyes and ears down there working for us that we should be able to find him. To both men, he said, I have something to do, but I will be in the office at first light. If we haven't found this man by noon tomorrow, we're ruined. Duncan sat in the chair Rue had just vacated. Paint me a picture with words, Rob, and spare no detail. What does Herbert look like? Well, he's a plain-looking fellow, about my height. Without waiting for another answer, Rue departed, walking to where he had left his carriage. Once inside, he ordered the driver to take him to the Esterbrook estate. Callus signaled in the murk, and Eric turned, relaying the gestures. They were traveling in near blindness, sixty-seven of them spread out in a long line, walking in pairs. Callus led, as he had the ability to see in the dimmest light, while Boldar Blood brought up the rear, claiming to have the power to see in the dark, which seemed highly improbable to Eric, but so far the strange mercenary hadn't made a single misstep. It was some magic property of his helm, Eric judged. Miranda kept close to Callus's side, since she had the ability to see that came close to Callus's. The rest of the party were forced to move as best they could, using the light of a single torch carried to the center of the column. Eric knew from experience that those closest to the middle of the line were nearly blind when looking away from the torch, while those at either end stood a chance of seeing something beyond the faint fall of illumination. The signal word was passed that something or someone dangerous was ahead. 
Each man in line quietly readied his weapons, while Bobby Longville came forward from his position half the distance between the torch and Boldar. A step behind him came Praji and Vaja. Eric wished the old mercenaries had not come along, but two old men on horseback alone in the mountains would have stood little chance of getting back to what passed for civilization in this harsh land. Eric moved forward and felt a slight breeze against his cheek. As he reached the captain's position, Callus whispered, Something's moving down there. Down there was the deep circular well that served as the vertical highway from this, the topmost level, down into the bowels of the mountain. Eric and the survivors of Callus's company had trudged up the spiral ramp that hugged the inside of this vast well over two years before, and now they were getting ready to descend into it. Eric listened, but as was often the case, the captain's hearing was far more sensitive than Eric's. Then, faintly, a sound. It resembled nothing so much as a hand brushing stone. A few seconds later it repeated. Then silence. They stood motionless for a full five minutes before Callus signaled for the first five men to accompany him. Eric glanced around and selected the four soldiers at the head of the column and pulled his own sword. A covered lantern was lit, and the shutters closed so that only a faint single line of light showed, allowing the men to see slightly, while it was hoped, not being seen in return. The six moved out, and Eric carried the lantern. They moved down the tunnel, which was heading slightly downward, as it had been for miles, and then found themselves stepping into the vast well. As was the case at most tunnel intersections, the lip of the road that spiraled inside the well flared out, providing extra room for those entering and leaving the roadway to negotiate around one another. They paused and listened, and again they heard the faint scraping coming from below. They moved slowly down the ramp, pausing at each quarter turn of the road around the well, until they again heard the sound. Finally the sound ceased, and they continued on. Eric judged that each full revolution around the well dropped them about twenty feet. They were three full turns around from where they had entered the well when they found the corpse. Callus signaled to be alert, and the four men accompanying Eric and Callus turned their backs to the light, two facing up trail and two facing down. By not looking at the light, they wouldn't blind themselves to anything approaching out of the darkness. The figure was covered in a robe and when Callus pulled back its hood, Eric couldn't help but audibly gasp. It was a Pantathian. Eric had never been this close to the enemy. He had seen them once from a distance in these very tunnels, and another time from a ridge at the great rendezvous when one had come by inspecting troops. Turn him over, whispered Callus, and Eric reached down and moved the body so that it was on its back. A great gaping wound had half eviscerated the creature, and a large portion of intestine protruded through its shredded robes. Callus pointed toward an object in the creature's hands and said, Remove that. Eric did so, and as soon as he touched the object he wished he hadn't, an odd energy swept up his arms and made his skin crawl. He suddenly wished he could strip off his clothing and scrub himself until his skin bled and his hair fell out. Callus seemed to react strongly to the object, even though Eric was the one touching it. Eric turned the thing in his hands and realized it was a helm. It was halfway toward his head when Callus said, Don't. Eric stopped, realizing that he had been about to don the helm, and said, What do I do? Put it down, said Callus. Turning to another soldier, he ordered, Bring the others here. The soldier took the lamp and vanished, leaving Eric to endure a very strange few moments in the darkness. While he stood there, strange images came to him of dark men in alien armor, women of incredible beauty, but none were human. He shook his head, and by the time he'd rid himself of these images, the column arrived. Miranda came and said, What is it? Callus pointed. Miranda knelt and examined both the corpse and the helm. She picked it up, and if she was affected by it, she gave no outward sign. Finally, she said, I need a bag. One of the soldiers nearby produced a cloth bag, and she put the helm inside. To Boldar, she said, You carry this. Of everyone here, this should give you the least amount of discomfort. The odd mercenary shrugged, took the bag, and stuck it inside a large rucksack he carried on his hip. Miranda looked at the corpse, and after a moment said, There seems to be an unexpected turn of events here. Callus said, This one looked to be fleeing, to be protecting this artifact. 
Miranda said, or he was stealing it. She shook her head in frustration. Speculation gets us nowhere. Let's continue. Callus nodded and signaled, ordering the column downward. They moved through gallery and plateau, around and around as they descended into the heart of the well. At an otherwise nondescript tunnel, Callus signaled them to turn. The column entered the tunnel, which led downward at a steep angle. As they moved deeper into the tunnel, the temperature quickly rose. It had been getting bitter at night in the mountains, and the tunnels had been just as cold, but as they moved downward, each step seemed to take them toward heat. And as it grew hotter, an odor also grew. It stank of sulfur and the sweet, sick smell of rotten meat. They entered a broadening tunnel, and Callus signaled. Every man drew his weapon. They had discussed this part of the mission until each member of the company could repeat orders in his sleep. This was the first of the Pantathian galleries, and inside they would find serpent priests and breeding females. Eggs and young would be housed in some sort of creche, and the orders were simple. Enter and kill every living thing. Callus signaled, and the charge began. It ended almost as quickly as it began. The stench in the gallery was far more oppressive than it had been in the tunnels. The overwhelming odor caused more than one man to double over in wretch. Everywhere they looked, bodies lay scattered. Most were Pantathians, some infants of that race, while others were alien, a Sa'our. But not one was intact. The lone Pantathian they had encountered in the tunnel was almost undamaged compared to those within this hall. The body parts had been strewn around the hall, and everywhere the rot of death filled the air with an almost unbearable stink. Callus pointed to a throne. A figure lay at the foot that had once sat upon it. It was a Pantathian corpse, and it was mummified, and it lay in pieces. There, Callus choked, trying to keep his composure while lesser men wretched and vomited. Miranda and Boldar both seemed immune to the smell, and they moved to the corpse. Miranda waved her hands and spent a full minute inspecting the mummy, then turned and said, Artifacts? Armor, sword, shield, all of what you'd expect, answered Callus. Well, said Miranda, someone got to those items before we did. She looked around the cavern, inspecting the carnage as one of the soldiers lit a lantern, illuminating the large hall. Those died defending and paid a price. The one we found must have been days in dying. Eric took two men and looked around in neighboring galleries. In one large pool of hot water, a half-dozen smashed eggs lay, some with half-formed Pantathians floating in scummy pools. In another gallery they found a dozen tiny figures, babies from their size, and among them lay the bones of many creatures, some of them human. After they inspected the entire area, Eric reported back. Captain, it's the same as here. He lowered his voice and said, I don't see a single wound that looks like it was made by a weapon. He pointed to a dead Sa'our warrior's upper torso. He wasn't cut in two, Captain. He looks like something tore him in half. Boldar Blood said, I've seen a few creatures that could do that. He glanced at Eric and Callus, his face masked by the alien helmet he wore, his eyes not visible in the black eye slits. But very few, and not on this world. Callus and Miranda looked around, and Callus said, Something came through here like a fire through summer grass and killed everyone. De Longville said, Well, someone saved us some butchery. Callus looked disturbed for the first time since Eric had met him. He said, Bobby, someone has walked off with items of power unlike any seen on this world since my father donned the white and gold armor. De Longville said, There's a third player, then? Miranda said, By all appearances, there is a third player. What now? asked de Longville. We move downward, said Callus, without hesitation. We must find who it was that raided this warren, and if other warrens have also been destroyed. To the assembled company, he said, the orders are changed. Instantly, every man there gave full attention to Callus. We have another mystery. We will continue to move into the mountains, and if we find living Pantathians, we slay them to the last living being. He paused. But if we find who also is killing them, that enemy of our enemy may be no friend of ours. We need to find out who this other foe is. He lowered his voice. They are powerful, and now possess some of the most powerful artifacts of the Valheru, the Dragon Lords. They should be feared. He turned and signaled, and the party moved back up the tunnel, returning to the well. When they reached it, Callus called a halt to the march, letting the men rest and eat. When at last it was time, he signaled, reformed the column, and ordered them downward 
deeper into the well. 18. Discovery Rue nodded. Duncan drew back his fist and struck the man in the chair. The man's head snapped back and blood began running down his nose. Wrong answer, said Duncan. Herbert McCracken said, I don't know. Duncan hit him again. Rue said, It's very simple, McCracken. You tell me who arranged for you to embezzle my gold and who has it, and we'll let you go. They'll kill me if I do, he answered. We'll kill you if you don't, said Rue. McCracken said, If I tell you, I've got no bargaining power. What's to keep you from cutting my throat once I talk? No profit in it, said Rue. The gold is mine. It's not as if we're trying to break the king's law and getting it back. If I take you to the city watch office and file charges with a deuce constable, once we get a magistrate who can understand that puzzle of accounts you created, you'll be working on the harbor gang for the next fifteen years. If I tell you? We'll let you leave the city. Alive. He thought a minute, then said, Newton Briggs is the man's name. He arranged for the transfer of funds. Rue glanced at Jason, who stood in the shadows behind McCracken, where he couldn't see him. Softly, Jason said, He was a partner in the counting house before we bought it. McCracken said, He wasn't happy to lose control. I think someone paid him to steal from you. All I know is he promised me enough gold to buy a Quiggan title and a villa and set up my own business. Why Quiggan? asked Duncan. Louise, who stood behind the man, keeping him in the chair, said, Many in the kingdom dream of being a rich Quiggan noble living in a villa with a dozen young slave girls? And he shrugged. Or, boys. Rue laughed. You're an idiot. You were played for a fool. You set foot on the docks of the city of Quegg, and within minutes you'd be on your way to the galleys. Whatever gold you had would be forfeit to the state. Unless you have powerful allies there, non-citizens of Quegg have no rights. McCracken blinked. But I was promised, Rue said. Let him loose. Just let him go? asked Duncan. Where's he going? Louis had found McCracken waiting at a warehouse for a rendezvous with someone, now they knew it to be Briggs, less than four hours earlier. Duncan had already sent a rider to bring back those men heading for Sarath. If all went according to plan, they should be back at Ruth's headquarters within the hour. The man stood up and said, What am I to do now? Go to Quegg and try to buy a patent of nobility, said Rue. But use someone else's money. If you're in the city by sundown tomorrow, it won't be just your confederates who will be trying to kill you. The man wiped his bloody lip with the back of his hand and stumbled out the door. Rue said, Wait a minute, Duncan, then follow him. He's too scared to try to get away on his own. If there's another player in this, he may lead us to him. And don't let him really get away. We may need him to give testimony to the royal courts. He may be the only thing that stands between us and a charge of robbery. Duncan nodded. Where will you be? At the docks, said Rue. Just against the possibility there is a ship that might be quag bound to the morning tide. Send for us there. Duncan nodded and left. Rue said, Jason, return to the office and wait there. Louise and I will send word if we need you somewhere else. Jason departed. Louise said, We have a ship ready to sail as soon as you give word. Good, said Rue. If we find our gold thief is making a break from the city, I want to catch him out beyond the breakwater. By the time any royal warship comes to investigate, I want the matter settled. I want the gold in our possession, should some revenue cutter board us. It will be much easier to explain then. Luis shook his head. Why move the gold? Why not just stick it somewhere in a back room and wait for the bitter sea company to fold? Rue said, Because that's both smart and risky. If you knew these boys were going to get out of the city and not talk, it would be the smart thing to do. But if you thought they might be caught and forced to talk, well, eventually this trail will lead back to whoever is the brains behind this fraud. And at that point, he snapped his fingers, we come with every sword we can hire and it's a free-for-all. He sighed. But if the gold is safely gone, on its way to some port or in a wagon heading over the mountains, he shrugged. Whoever planned this certainly timed things correctly, said Louise. Rue said, that's what has me worried. Not only did those bastards at the counting house have to be in on this, they had to know something more about the Bitter Sea Company and its finances than they could from people like McCracken and Briggs. He held up one finger. They had to know that Jason or someone else would be close to discovering the fraud. It's just been going on too long. He held up a second finger. And they had to know that we're a few weeks from being able to cover such a loss. He shook his head in frustration. We've got caravans coming in from the east and a grain shipment putting into Illith today. Our far coast fleet should be at Kars or putting out for the return leg home. Any of those will be bringing enough gold to cover that shortfall. 
He struck his fist into his hand. But not today. A spy? An agent of some sort, said Rue. He moved toward the door. Besides, Duncan, you are the only person I fully trust, Luis. You were with me in the death cell, and you swam the Vedra River with me. We've looked death in the face together, and except for Jado and Greylock, there's not a man left in Crondor I'd want at my back besides you. Luis's expression was one of mild amusement. Even with one hand? Rue opened the door. You're better with a knife in one hand than most men are with a sword in two hands. Come along. Let's start combing the docks. Luis slapped his employer on the back as he followed him through the door and shut it behind him. The shed was one of many the Bitter Sea Company owned in the merchant's quarter, and from there the pair moved quickly toward the docks. After they had left, a figure rose from the roof of the shed. Lightly jumping to the cobbles, the shadowy observer watched Luis and Rue as they vanished into the darkness, then turned and whistled lightly, pointing after them. Two more figures emerged from a block farther down the street and rapidly approached the first. The three figures conferred for a moment, then one of the two returned the way he had come. The others followed Rue and Luis toward the dock. Ambush! shouted Rinaldo. Wedge! shouted Callas, and instantly every man was deploying. The column was in a large gallery, easily two hundred feet across, with six entrances. As they had trained, forty of the men formed a shield-to-shield -shield wedge, with their swords poised to strike down any attacker. The other twenty men unshouldered short bows and calmly set arrows to bowstrings as an inhuman snarling and shrieking filled the gallery. From three tunnels ahead, streams of Pantathians rushed forward to attack Callus's crimson eagles. Eric attempted a rough estimation of the opposing forces, but quickly stopped trying to count as the first wave of attackers began to fall to the bowmen. Then they struck the shield wall. Eric laid about him with powerful strokes of his blade. Twice he heard steel break under his strikes as Pantathian soldiers tried to block with their swords. He discovered little skill in their opponents. Without waiting for instructions from Callus, he shouted, Second rank! Swords and follow me! The twenty bowmen dropped their bows and drew swords. Eric circled around the right end of his line and hit the Pantathians in the flank. As he had suspected, they quickly collapsed in confusion. But rather than flee, they simply hurled themselves at the kingdom soldiers until suddenly the last two went down before Callus's men and the gallery fell silent. Boldar Blood said, Like hacking firewood. Eric glanced at the strange mercenary and noticed that the blood that was splattered on his armor was running off, as if unable to cling to the strange white surface. Catching his breath, Eric said, They were brave, but these weren't warriors. He signaled two men toward each tunnel mouth to stand alert in case other Pantathians might be heading this way. Not brave, said Boldar. Fanatics. Callus looked to Miranda, who said, We've never heard of anyone fighting them hand to hand. They prefer to use stealth and cunning to make war. Eric used the toe of his boot to turn one over and said, It's small. They're all small, said Callus, smaller than the one we found yesterday. Eric glanced at de Longville. Are they sending youngsters against us? Maybe, said the sergeant major, if they're as beat up in other parts of this warren as that crash we found yesterday was. They may be desperate to keep what's left intact. Eric quickly inspected his own man, while Callus and Miranda inspected the Pantathian dead. No man of Callus's command had suffered a significant injury. Only cuts and bruises, Eric reported. A few minutes rest, then we move on, said de Longville. Eric nodded. Which tunnel? De Longville repeated the question to Callus. The center, I think. If we need to, we can double back, said the captain. Eric hoped that was so, but he kept his thoughts to himself. Rue crouched behind a bale as a strong contingency of armed men moved warily through the darkness. Fog had rolled in, and in the early morning gloom a man could barely see his hand at arm's length from his face. Rue and Louise had scouted the docks when one of Rue's men reported a large company of guards and a wagon heading for the docks. Rue had followed, while sending Louise to fetch more men. Suddenly Rue spun, reacting to the soft sound of movement behind him. As Rue had his sword ready, Duncan held up his hand and whispered, It's me. Rue dropped the point of his sword and turned to look at the wagon as he came up the quay. Duncan knelt next to his cousin. The Kraken said it here. I lost him for a moment in the fog. Saw someone, you, duck down that alley, he pointed behind Rue, and followed. I expect we'll see Herbert show any moment. Rue nodded. It's our gold in that wagon, no doubt. Are we going to hit them on the docks? Rue counted. Not unless Luis gets back with our men before they get that boat launched, he whispered. All our men are either on the Bitter Sea Queen or at the warehouse waiting for orders. 
The wagon came to a halt, and a voice cut through the darkness. Down to that longboat. A single shuttered lantern was uncovered, and the wagon and the men around it were now clearly seen, as silhouettes outlined by the faint light. The men unlatched the tailgate and began unloading several small chests. Suddenly, another figure stumbled out of the dark into the small pool of lantern light around the wagon. Swords were drawn, as an alarmed voice said, It's me, McCracken! A man jumped off the wagon seat and grabbed the lantern as two guards gripped Herbert's arms. A man with the lantern held it up and stepped forward. Rue sucked breath hard. It was Tim Jacoby. Then at his shoulder he could see Tim's brother Randolph. Tim said, What are you doing here? Briggs never showed, said McCracken. Fool, said Tim Jacoby. You were told to wait until he showed up, no matter how long it took. He's probably at the warehouse looking for you right now. Randolph said, What happened to your face? Herbert raised his hand to his face, then said, I fell in the dark and hit my lip on a crate. Looks like someone hit you, said Tim Jacoby. No one hit me, said McCracken, too loud for Tim Jacoby's liking. I swear it. Keep your voice down, Tim ordered. Did anyone follow you? In this fog, said McCracken. He took a breath. You've got to take me with you. Briggs was supposed to show up at sundown with my gold. I waited and he never got there. I was promised 50,000 gold for my part in this. You've got to make good on this. Ah, uh, what? asked Tim. Suddenly McCracken was afraid. Hi. Rue noticed that none of the men around the wagon had moved since McCracken's arrival. The long boat at the bottom of the key's steps rocked gently against the stones. Keep talking, urged Rue silently, knowing that each passing minute brought Luis and his own men that much closer. Taking them here would be so much easier than a sea battle. He had only until sundown to pay the note, and if he couldn't take Jacoby's men on the docks, he would be forced to try a sea chase and taking Tim's ship before noon. Whispering to Duncan, he said, If I need to, I plan to keep them here until Luis comes. Can you circle around behind them? What? whispered Duncan. You want just the two of us to try to stop them? Slow them down, that's all. Get behind them and follow my play. Duncan rolled his eyes and whispered, I hope to the gods you're not going to get us killed, cousin. Then he turned and disappeared into the fog. McCracken said, If you don't make good on this, I'll testify before the Duke's constable. I'll claim you and Briggs forced me to falsify the accounts. Tim shook his head. You're a very stupid man, McCracken. We were supposed to have no contact. That was Briggs' job. Briggs never showed, said McCracken, his voice nearly hysterical. Tim nodded, and suddenly the two guards gripping McCracken's arms tightened their grip, holding him motionless. Jacoby swiftly drew a poniard from his belt and drove it into McCracken's stomach. You should have stayed in the warehouse, McCracken. Briggs is dead, and now... The accountant slumped in the grip of the two guards. So I you. With a motion of his head, he indicated they should dispose of the body in the harbor. The two guards took two steps down the stairs beside the longboat and threw the body into the water a few feet in front of the bow. Another body found floating in the harbor would hardly be worth mention in Crondor. Rue waited until he calculated almost all the gold was loaded on the boat. Then he stepped out and, with as much authority as he could muster, shouted, Don't move! You're surrounded! As he hoped, those near the wagon and the boat couldn't see who was out there in the fog, and that hesitation gave Rue the advantage he had hoped for. Had they instantly charged him, as good a swordsman as he was, he would have been overwhelmed. A strangled cry sounded from the back of the wagon, and a man fell to the cobbles. Rue wondered at this until he heard Duncan's voice shout, We told you not to move. One man near the body glanced down and said, It's a dagger. This ain't the city watch. He took a step and was brought down by another dagger, and a different voice said, We never said we were the city watch. Moving slowly forward from behind the other side of the building that had sheltered Rue, a figure could be dimly seen. Rue thought he recognized the voice, and then he made out some familiar features. Dashiell Jameson walked casually forward until he was visible to both sides. In the distance, hooves striking cobbles could be heard, and Dash said, And we also have reinforcements on their way. Put down your weapons. Some of the men hesitated when a third dagger sped out of the darkness from where Dashiell had emerged and thudded into the side of the wagon. He said, Put down your weapons shouted a different, odd-sounding voice. Rue prayed to Ruthia, goddess of luck, that it was Luis and his men whose hooves clattered through the early morning, approaching rapidly. Jacoby's guards slowly knelt, placing weapons on the cobbles. Rue waited another moment, then came forward. Good morning, Timothy Randolph. He tried to sound casual. Jacoby said, You! Just then Luis rode into view, and a dozen horsemen came after, fanning out to surround those men already on the ground. 
Several carried crossbows, which they leveled at the wagons and at the boat. Did you think I'd let you flee with my gold? Jacoby nearly spat he was so angry. What do you mean, your gold? Rue said, come along, Tim. McCracken and Briggs told us everything. Jacoby said, Briggs? How could he? We shut up, you fool, commanded Randolph. Rue glanced to where McCracken floated in the bay. So you sent Herbert to join Briggs, did you? I'll send you to join them in hell, snapped Timothy Jacoby, pulling his sword from his belt despite the crossbows pointed his way. No, shouted Randolph, pushing his brother aside as three bolts were unleashed. Two bolts took Randolph in the chest and another in the neck, and blood exploded across the men standing behind him. He hit the ground like a fly swatted out of the air by a human hand. Tim Jacoby rose up from the ground, holding his sword in one hand and a poniard in the other, and there was only madness and rage in his eyes. Louis started to draw back his dagger to throw, but Rue said, Now, let him come. It's time to finish this. You've been a thorn in my side since the day we met, said Tim Jacoby. You've killed my brother. Rue leveled his sword and said, An helmet died at your hands. He motioned for Jacoby to come toward him. Come on, what are you waiting for? The men stepped back, and Jacoby rushed Rue. Rue was the experienced soldier, while Jacoby was nothing more than a murdering bully. But now he was a murdering bully, inflamed by hatred and the desire for revenge. He closed on Rue faster than he'd anticipated, and Rue was forced to defend and retreat against the lethal two-handed attack. Light, commanded Duncan, and quickly men opened the shutters on the one lamp, throwing an eerie glow through the fog as the two men struggled. One of the horsemen jumped down, opened a saddlebag, and pulled out a bundle of short torches. He struck steel and flint while Rue and Jacoby slashed and parried, and brought a light to life. He quickly lit and distributed flaming brands to Luis's men, and a circle of light surrounded the two combatants. Luis had his men pick up the weapons Jacoby's men had put down, and moved the guards toward the wagon. Rue fought for his life. Back and forth the attacks and defenses moved the two men, each waiting for the other to make a mistake. The fury was finally flowing out of Jacoby as he tired, while Rue vowed he would never go so long without practicing his weapons again. Clashing steel echoed across the harbor. Upon distant ships at their moorings, guards lit lanterns and called questions. A watchman came out between two buildings, saw Randolph lying in a spreading pool of blood, the two fighters, and the two bands of men, and retreated hastily. When he was safely out of harm's way, he produced a tin whistle and began blowing it fiercely. A squad of three constables appeared a short while later, and the watchman explained what he had seen. The senior constable sent one of his men to headquarters for more men, and then accompanied the other man back toward the dock. Rue felt his arms begin to ache. What Jacoby lacked in skill, he gained back by using two weapons, a style of fighting difficult to defend with a single blade. Jacoby had a tricky move, an advance with his sword extended, followed by a slash with his left hand. It was designed to cut across the chest of any opponent who tried to engage his sword in repost. The first time he tried it, Rue barely escaped with a tear in his tunic. Rue wiped perspiration from his brow with his left hand, keeping the point of his sword directed at Jacoby. Jacoby's right boot heel tapped, and then he extended and advanced, following with a left-hand slash. Rue leaped backward. He chanced to glance over his shoulder and saw that he was being driven toward a large pile of crates, and once his back was against them, he would have no room to escape. The tap of Jacoby's boot heel against the cobbles saved Rue's life, for he leaped backward before he turned to look again at Jacoby and barely missed the poniard slashing through the air. Rue crouched. As he expected, he heard the boot heel tap again, and without hesitation, Rue leaned forward. He beat aside Jacoby's extended blade, but rather than come straight in, Rue dropped his own blade, extended his left hand downward to touch the stones, and ducked under the vicious slash of the poniard. For a moment, he was completely vulnerable, but Jacoby's blades were in no position to take advantage. Rue knew that any experienced fighter might kick with his boot, sending Rue to the stones, but he doubted Jacoby had ever seen this move. With his right hand, Rue thrust upward, catching Jacoby in his right side, just below the ribs. As the sword traveled upward, it pierced lung and heart. Jacoby's eyes widened, and a strange, childlike sound issued from his lips, and his fingers ceased to possess any strength. Sword and poniard fell from his hands. Then his knees wobbled, and he collapsed upon the ground as Rue yanked his blade free. Don't anyone move, said a voice. Rue glanced over his shoulder and saw the senior constable approaching with a riot club in one hand, absently slapping the palm of the other. Gasping for breath, Rue felt a giddy admiration for the officer of the prince's city watch, willing to confront two dozen armed men with nothing more than his badge of office and a billy. Rue said, Wouldn't think of it. More horsemen could be heard approaching as the constable said, Now then, what have we here? Rue said, It's simple. These two dead men are thieves. Those men over there... He pointed to the disarmed guards by the wagon, are hired thugs. 
and that wagon and that boat are loaded with my stolen gold. Seeing no one was attempting to cause trouble, the constable put his billy under his arm and rubbed his chin. And who might that wet fellow floating in the harbor be? Rue blew out and took a deep breath. My name, Herbert McCracken. He was an accountant at my counting house. He helped those two steal my gold. Hmm, said the constable, obviously not convinced. And who might you be, sir, to be having counting houses, accounts, and large shipments of gold? He glanced down at the Jacoby brothers and added, And a surplus of corpses? Rue smiled. I'm Rupert Avery. I'm a partner in the Bitter Sea Company. The constable nodded. As horsemen rounded the corner and approached the group, he said, That's a name few haven't heard in Crondor in the last year or so. Is there someone here likely to vouch for you? Dash stepped forward. I will. He's my boss. And who might you be? Asked the constable. He's my grandson, said the lead rider. Trying to see the figure on horseback through the gloom, the constable said, And then who might you be? Lord James rode forward into the circle of torches and lanterns and said, My name is James, and in a manner of speaking, I'm your boss. Then the other newly arrived riders appeared, soldiers in the garb of the prince's personal guards, and Knight Marshal William said, Why don't you take these men, he pointed to the Jacoby cards, into custody, constable. We'll deal with these other gentlemen. The constable was nearly speechless at being in the presence of the Duke of Crondor and the Knight Marshal, and hesitated a long moment before he said, Yes, sir. Titus. From out of the shadows came a young constable, barely twenty years of age by his appearance. He carried a crossbow. Yes, sergeant. Arrest that lot over there. Yes, sir, said the young constable, and he pointed his crossbow at them in menacing fashion. Come along, and no funny business. Other constables appeared, and the sergeant moved them to positions surrounding the dozen captives, escorting them away. Rue turned to Lord James and said, I don't suppose you just happened to be out for a very early morning ride, my lord? James said, No, we had you followed. Out of the shadows came the girl Catherine and Jimmy. Followed? asked Rue. Why? We need to talk, said James. Turning his horse, he said, Get cleaned up and get your gold to safety, then come to the palace for breakfast. Rue nodded. Straight away, my lord. To Louise and Duncan, he said, Get the gold off the boat and back to our offices. Then he turned to Dash and said, And tell me, whose employee are you? Mine or your grandfather's? Dash grinned and shrugged. In a manner of speaking, both of yours. Rue said nothing for a moment, then said, You're discharged. Dash said, uh, I don't think you can do that. Why not? demanded Rue. Grandfather will explain. Rue shrugged. Suddenly, too tired to think, he said, I can use some food and coffee. He sighed, A lot of coffee. The men began loading the gold back into the Jacoby's wagon, and two men took the Jacoby brothers' bodies to load into the wagon beside the gold. Rue put his sword away, wondering what was coming next. At least, he reasoned, he could meet the demand note and keep his company alive. Never, he vowed silently, would he let his company become that vulnerable again. Rue sipped at the coffee and sighed. This is excellent. James nodded. Jimmy buys it at Barrett's for me. Rue smiled. Best coffee in the city. The Duke of Crondor said, What am I to do with you? I'm not sure I take your meaning, my lord. They all sat around a large table in the Duke's private quarters. Knight Marshal William sat beside the Duke, while Jimmy, Dash, and Catherine filled out the company. Owen Greylock entered the room and sat. Good morning, my lord, Marshal, Rue, he said with a smile. As I was explaining to your old friend here, Captain Greylock, I'm at something of a loss as what to do with him, said James. Greylock looked confused. Do with him? Well, there are several dead bodies down at the docks, and a lot of gold, with little explanation as to how it got there. Rue said, My lord, with all due respect, I've explained this all to you. So you say, replied James. He leaned forward and pointed a finger at Rue. But you're a convicted murderer and several of your business dealings in the recent past have bordered on the criminal. 
Rue's fatigue made him prickly. Bordering on the criminal isn't the same as being criminal, Lord. Well, we could impound the gold and hold a hearing, said Marshal William. Rue sat straight. You can't. If I don't get that gold to my creditors by the end of the day, I'll be ruined. That was the entire thrust of Jacoby's plans. James said, Will everyone but Mr. Avery please leave us for a while? Breakfast is now finished. Greylock looked at the food still on the table with regret, but he rose and departed with the others, leaving Rue alone with Lord James. James stood and came to the empty chair next to Rue and sat. This is how it is, he said. You've done very well. Remarkable doesn't begin to cover how well you've done in your eyes, young Avery. At one point I thought we might have to take a hand in seeing you survive the attempts your enemies made upon you. But you didn't need our help. That's to your credit. But my threat wasn't hollow. I want you to understand something, and that is, no matter how powerful you become, you are no more above the law than you were when you and Eric killed Stefan von Dockmoor. Rue said nothing. I'll not attempt to impound your gold, Rupert. Pay off your creditors and continue to prosper. But always remember that you can be put away as quickly now as you were when we first tossed you into the death cell. Rue said, Why are you telling me this? Because you are not done with our service, young Avery. James stood and faced as he said, Reports from across the sea are worse than we thought they'd be. Far worse. Your friend Eric may already be dead, for all we know. Everyone who went with Callus may be. He stopped his pacing and looked at Rue. But even if they reach those goals they set out to achieve, this much you can bank on. The host of the Emerald Queen is coming. And you know almost as well as I that if she lands on these shores, your hard-won riches mean nothing. You and your wife and children will be nothing more than objects to sweep aside as she marches toward her goal, the destruction of every living thing on this world. Rue said, What do you want me to do? Do? said James. Why do you think I want you to do anything? Because we wouldn't be having this meal if you were only trying to remind me either of your ability to hang me on a whim or about the terrible things I saw when serving with Callus. Rue's voice rose in anger as he said, I bloody well know both those facts. He slammed his fist on the table, causing dishes to jump and clatter. Then he added, My lord, I'll tell you what I want, said Lord James. He leaned over, hands on the back of one chair and the table, and put his face before Rue's, eye to eye. I need gold. Rue blinked. Gold? More gold than even a greedy little bastard like you can imagine, Rupert. He stood up. We have the biggest war in the history of this world about to be unleashed on these shores. He walked to a window that overlooked the harbor and made a sweeping motion with his hand. Unless someone with a great deal more power and intelligence than are possessed by every ruling lord in this kingdom comes up with an unexpected solution, we will see the biggest fleet in history come sailing into that harbor in less than three years' time. And on that fleet will be the biggest army ever seen. He turned to look at Rue. And everything you see from this window will be ashes. That includes your house, your business, Barrett's Coffee House, your docks, your warehouses, your ships, your wife, your children, your mistress. At the last, Rue felt his throat almost close. He thought no one knew about his relationship with Sylvia. James spoke calmly, but his manner betrayed a tightly controlled anger. You will never understand the love I feel for this city, Rupert. He motioned around the hall. You will never understand why I hold this palace dear above all other places on this world. A very special man saw something in me that no one else would ever have seen, and he put out his hand and elevated me to a station that no one of my birth could ever have imagined. 
Rue saw a slight sheen of moisture in Lord James's eyes. I gave my own son that man's name to honor him. The Duke turned his back to Rue to look out the window again. And you have no idea how much I wish we could have that man with us here now. Of all men, he would be the one I would wish to tell us what to do next as this terrible day approaches. Taking a deep breath, the old duke composed himself. But he is not here. He is dead, and he would be the first to tell me that dreaming of things that cannot be is a waste of time. He looked again into Rue's eyes. And time is something we have far less of than we had thought. I said that fleet would be here in less than three years. It may be here in less than two. I won't know until a ship from Novendus appears. Rue said, Two? Three years? Yes, said James. This is why I need gold. I need to finance the biggest war in the history of the kingdom. A war that dwarfs any we've fought. We have a standing army of fewer than five thousand men in the Principality. When we raise the banners of the kingdom, both eastern and western realms, we can put perhaps forty thousand men in the field, trained veterans and levies. How many men does the Emerald Queen bring against us? Rue sat back, remembering just those forces at the mercenaries' rendezvous. Two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand, if she can get them all across the sea. James said, she has six hundred ships, as of our last report. She is producing two new ships a week. She's destroying the entire continent to keep production that high, but she's got her heel on the throat of the entire population down there, and the work continues. Rue calculated. Fifty weeks minimum. She needs at least one hundred more ships to carry provisions for that many men. If she's prudent, she'll build for another one hundred weeks. Have you seen anything to indicate prudence? No, said Rue. But on the other hand, even someone willing to kill every man in her service must have some idea of what she needs to accomplish her goals. James nodded. Two or three years from now, they will be in that harbor. Rue said, What part do I play? James said, I could tax you until you bleed to finance this war. But even if I sent out the army to grab every coin from the teeth of the world to cash, from the Sunset Islands to Raldham, it wouldn't be enough. James again leaned over and spoke softly, as if he feared someone might be listening. But in that two or three years, with the proper help, you might be able to finance that war. Rue looked as if he didn't understand. My lord? James said, you need to make enough profit in the next two years so that you can loan the crown what we're going to need to finance this coming war. Rue let out a long breath. Well, that's unexpected. You want me to get rich beyond dreaming so I can lend it to the Crown to fight a war that we may not win. James said, essentially. From what you said, I suspect the Crown may not be in a position to repay me in a timely fashion if we survive this coming ordeal. James said, consider the alternatives. Rue nodded. There is that. He rose. Well, if I'm to become the richest man sitting atop the ash heap in three years, I'd better set about gathering more wealth. To do that, I need to pay off my creditors by sundown. There is one other thing, said James. What, my lord? The matter with the Jacobis. There is the father. Do I need fear more attacks? Possibly, said James. The judicious thing to do would be go see him at once, before he learns that you killed his sons. Forge a peace, Rupert, because you need allies, not enemies, for the coming years, and I cannot help you in all things. Even my reach has limits. Rue said, after I settle with Frederick Jacobi, I'll need to tell all this to my partners. I suggest you buy them out, said James, or at least gain control of the Bitter Sea Trading and Holding Company. Then James grinned, and Rue could see both the reflection of the boy thief who had once run the streets of Crondor, and the echo of his grandsons in his face. You were planning on that eventually anyway, weren't you? Rue laughed. Eventually? 
Better sooner than later. If you need a small amount of gold to accomplish that, the Crown can lend it to you. We're certainly going to take that back and a great deal more besides. Rue said he would let the Duke know, and he departed. As he left the palace, he considered how his fate was once again linked to that of the Crown, and how, no matter how he tried, he could not free himself of the fate dictated for him the moment he and Eric had killed Stefan. As he reached the gate, he realized he had neither horse nor carriage waiting for him. Then he decided the walk to the office would help set his mind to what he would need to say to Frederick Jacobi when he told him his sons were dead. Eric directed the scouts to check the gallery ahead. They had been hearing faint sounds for nearly ten minutes, but the origin of them was unclear. There were side passages and galleries in profusion, and noises echoed in strange and disorienting fashion. A few minutes later they returned. It's filled with lizards, whispered one of the scouts. Eric signaled the man to follow him to where Callus and the others waited, and the man quickly diagrammed how the gallery was laid out. It was an almost perfect half-circle, with a long ramp down from the entrance running to the right, and a flat ridge running to the left. The swordsmen would charge down the ramp, while the archers would follow, deploying to the left, to rain arrows down upon the serpents. Callus gave orders, and Eric and Longville relayed them. Eric heard Callus tell Boldar to stay with Miranda and guard her. Then Callus was moving past, insisting on taking the lead personally. As was the case before, each man did exactly as he was bidden to do, without hesitation or confusion. But once into the gallery, the battle was joined, and as Eric had learned firsthand, and had read in every book William had given him to read, once the battle was joined, plans were so much chaff on the wind. These Pantathians were full-sized adults, half again as big as those young warriors they had fought earlier in the day. The tallest measured just short of Eric's chin and their best warrior was no match for Callus's meanest. But they had numbers on their side. Two hundred or more had gathered in the gallery, and Eric noted in passing that some showed recent wounds. But he hadn't time to dwell on where else the Pantathians were battling. He assumed it was with that third player Callus referred to. Every man in the company knew that surprise only gained them a slight advantage, and that they must quickly press that advantage, killing as many Pantathians as possible. Orders were passed on the other side of the hall, the hissing language of the serpent priests impossible to understand. Eric laid about him with as much efficiency as he could muster. In the first two minutes of battle, a snake man died for each blow he delivered. Then the defense got organized and began to push the attackers back. Just as the tide of battle seemed to tip, the twenty bowmen took up position on the ridge overlooking the gallery and began to rain arrows down upon the Pantathians. Eric shouted, Advance! and waded into the dying foemen and could hear others repeat his order. As before, the Pantathians refused to yield and stood their ground, dying either by arrow or by sword blow. Then it was silent. Eric glanced around and could see twitching bodies all around. A few were his own men, but most were green-skinned. He glanced around, taking mental inventory, then, after looking twice, turned to find De Longville, gasping for breath, standing a short distance away. We have seven down, Sergeant Major. De Longville nodded. Eric directed others to get the wounded and move them back up to the ridge where the archers waited. Eric then joined De Longville, Callus, and Miranda in inspecting the hall. Scouts were sent into nearby galleries, barely visible in the light. The air was humid and hot. Breathing was difficult. A crack in the floor along the far wall bled steam in a steady flow. Several of the Pantathians were still alive and Callus's men quickly executed them. The orders had been defined. If it was a Pantathian, kill it. No serpent man, woman, or child was to be spared. Eric had felt little concern for the order, but the men had discussed it. After a battle in which comrades had fallen, carrying out the orders was easy enough. Then a scout called out. Sergeant, over here. Eric turned and trotted over. What is it? Look, sir. Eric looked at a gallery and saw a bubbling pool of hot water in the center of the room. It had obviously been hollowed out by the serpent priests, as the marks of tools were visible in the rocks. More than a dozen large eggs were arrayed around the pool, close enough to incubate, but not so close as to cook the young. One of the eggs was moving. Eric approached the egg as a fracture appeared along one side, and then with a loud crack it split. 
The tiny body that tumbled out was little larger than a dog. It blinked as if confused and cried in a sound that was eerily like that of a human baby. Eric raised his sword and hesitated as the tiny creature made its inquisitive crying sounds. Then the baby Pantathian turned its gaze upon Eric. The baby's eyes narrowed, and Eric saw hatred in those newborn orbs. With animosity bordering on rage, the tiny creature hissed and hurled itself at Eric. Reflexively, Eric brought his blade down, severing the tiny creature's head from its shoulders. Eric felt his gorge rise, and, swallowing hard, shouted, Break them! The scout joined him, and they smashed the remaining eggs. Tiny bodies spilled from the eggs, and Eric found himself wishing he could have been anywhere else. The stench that quickly rose from the creatures was noxious beyond anything he had endured. Leaving the chamber after the grisly work was over, Eric saw others repeating his actions in other galleries close by. More than one man left the galleries retching at what they had seen. After a few minutes, Miranda said, There is something. What? said Callus. I don't know. But it's close. Callus stood motionless, then said, I think I know what it is. He moved to a tunnel leading downward. This way. De Longville said, Two dead, five wounded, only one too badly to keep up. Only the briefest flickering of the muscles along Callus's jaw betrayed his pain at hearing that report. Callus was starting toward the ramp leading to where the wounded were being cared for, when De Longville said, I'll ask him. Eric knew that Bobby was going to ask the man if he preferred a quick death at the hands of his comrades, or if he wished to risk being left alone to whatever fate brought him, hoping that Callus's company would return this way and be able to pick him up. Eric knew which choice he would have made, or at least he thought he did, and wondered how De Longville could volunteer for such a task. Then, as the other wounded and the archers descended the ramp, Eric realized that he knew exactly why Bobby could do it. He had seen the horrors of the Pantathians and their allies firsthand, and a well-thrust knife blade and a single moment of hot pain was far better for one of your companions than the lingering agony you would suffer if captured. A strangled grunt of pain told Eric how the man had chosen. De Longville returned, his face set in an unreadable mask, and he said, Form up the column. Eric gave the order, and the men got ready to move on. 19. Revelations Rue sighed. He had left the palace and walked home, thinking the entire way about the best manner to approach Frederick Jacobi. If the old man was more like the quiet Randolph, an accommodation might be reached. If he was like the volatile Timothy, the feud would almost certainly continue until one house or the other was destroyed. Rue entered his home. The only noise came from the kitchen, where Rendell and Mary readied food for the day. The upstairs hallway was still, and he knew he'd find his wife and children still sleeping. He wondered at the hour, and realized he had no idea what time it was. From the light, no later than eight of the clock, he pushed open the door to the room Collie slept in with the baby, and found her asleep. He now considered waking her, but decided to wait until the baby demanded feeding. Rue walked softly to the bedside and studied his wife and son in the dim light coming through the curtains. In the shadows, Carly looked very young. Rue suddenly felt terribly old and sat down in the rocking chair Carly used to soothe the baby when he was fussy. He didn't sleep as well as his sister had and cried more often. Rue ran his hand over his face, feeling fatigue in his bones. His eyes were gritty and his mouth had a bitter taste in it. Too much coffee, and a hint of bile from killing men. Rue closed his eyes. Sometime later, the baby's cry woke him. Carly sat up and said, What is it? She saw her husband in the chair. Rue, I must have fallen asleep. Why didn't you go to bed? she asked. I have something to tell you, he answered as she began to nurse the hungry child. What? The men who killed your father are dead. She didn't react. After a moment, he said, They attempted to ruin me, and I found out in time. We fought, and they're dead. I just came from the palace and a long discussion of these events with the Duke. Then it's over, she said. Not quite, said Rue. Carly stared at him a moment. Why not? 
The two men have a father. We took a deep breath. Your father had an old rival, Frederick Jacobi. She nodded. They were boys together, in the Advarian community up in Tenerus. Her voice softened. I think they were friends once. Why? Did he have father killed? No, his son Timothy ordered it. I think his brother Randolph may have helped, or at least he knew about it and didn't do anything to prevent it. So those men are dead? Yes. But Frederick is still alive, observed Carly. She looked sad, as if on the verge of weeping. So you have to kill him, too? Rue said, I don't know. I need to make some sort of peace with him if I can. He stood up. And I should go do it now. The Duke insists. Rue started around the bed, then paused and turned. He leaned over and kissed the back of the baby's head, then kissed Carly on the cheek. I probably won't get home until supper, and what I really need is sleep. She reached out with her left hand and gripped his right. Be careful. He squeezed her hand in reply and left the room. He called down to Mary to have his coach brought around, went to his room, quickly washed up, and changed his tunic. Then he went downstairs and out the door. His coach was there, and as he entered, he saw another figure waiting inside for him. Dash nodded in greeting. Feeling better? Tired, said Rue. What brings you here? Grandfather thought it prudent if I tagged along. Mr. Jacoby might have servants or other members of his household who are going to take the news of the brother's death badly. He pointed to the sword that lay across his knees. Rue nodded. You know how to use that? Better than most, Dash said, without boasting. They rode along in silence until the coach pulled up before the Jacoby residence. Dash followed Rue out of the carriage and to the door. Rue hesitated a moment, then knocked. A young woman opened the door a few moments later. She was pretty in an unspectacular way. Dark hair and eyes, a strong chin and straight nose. Yes, may I help you? she asked. Rue found he could barely bring himself to speak. He didn't know what to say. After a moment's hesitation, he said, My name is Rupert Avery. The woman's eyes narrowed. I know your name, Mr. Avery. It is not one spoken with affection in this house. I can imagine, Rue said. He took a deep breath. I suspect it will be even less so when you discover what brings me here. I would like to speak to Frederick Jacobi. I'm afraid that's impossible, said the young woman. He doesn't see visitors. Rue's expression betrayed something, for after a moment the woman said, What is it? Dash said, Pardon me, ma'am, who are you? I'm Helen, Randolph's wife. Rue closed his eyes and then took a deep breath. I fear I have grave tidings for you and for your father-in-law. The woman's knuckles where she gripped the door whitened. Randy's dead, isn't he? Rue nodded. May I come in, please? The woman stepped back, and it was clear she was close to fainting. Dash moved and took her by the elbow, keeping her upright. Just then, two children ran into the entry hall, complaining over a childish inequity. She separated the two of them, a boy and girl, looking to Rue to be about four and six. Children, she said, go to your room and play quietly. But mother, said the boy, irritated at his complaint being ignored. Go to your room, she said sharply. The boy looked injured by the command, but the girl just skipped away, counting their mother's deafness to the boy's grievance, a victory in the eternal sibling war. When the children were gone, she looked at Rue and said, How did Randy die? Rue said, We had cornered Randolph and Timothy at the docks. They were trying to make off with gold they had taken from me, and Timothy tried to attack me. Randolph pushed him aside and was killed by a crossbow bolt fired at Timothy. Trying to think of anything that might lessen the sting the woman felt, he said, It was over quickly. He was acting to save his brother. Helen's eyes filled with tears, but her tone was one of anger. He was always trying to save his brother. Is Tim alive? No, said Rue softly. He took a deep breath. I killed him. As the woman turned, Dash said, it was a fair duel, ma'am. 
Timothy died with weapons in his hand, trying to kill Mr. Avery. Why are you here? said the woman. Are you here to gloat over the fall of the house of Jacoby? No, said Rue. I'm here because Duke James asked me to come. He sighed, feeling more tired than he had ever felt in his life. I had nothing against your husband, or you or your father, men. It was only Tim I had issue with. Tim arranged to have my partner, my father-in-law, killed. Tim was trying to ruin me. Helen turned her back on them. I have no doubt of that, Mr. Avery. Please, follow me. She led them through a large hallway, and Rue saw that the house was much larger than one might think from the street, being very deep in its plan. Then they entered a garden at the rear of the house, surrounded by a large stone wall. An old man sat alone in a chair, bundled in heavy robes, with a large quilt over his knees. As they approached, Rue saw his eyes were blinded by cataracts, and then that part of his face was motionless. Yes? Who's there? he said, his speech slurred and his voice weak. Helen raised her voice. It's me, father. To Rue, she said, he's hard of hearing. He had a seizure two years ago. He's been like this ever since. She turned to face Rue. It's your chance, Mr. Avery. All that's left of the once great trading house of Jacoby is a blind, half-deaf, crazy old man, a woman and two children. You can kill us all now and put an end to this feud. Rue put up his hand, and his expression was one of total helplessness. Please, I... I have no wish to see any more suffering for either of our families. No suffering? She said, as again tears came. How am I to make do? Who's to run the business? Who will care for us? It would be far kinder for you to pull your sword and put us all out of our misery. She began to cry in earnest, and Dash stepped forward and let her lean against his shoulder as she sobbed. Helen, said the old man, his speech slurred by the affliction of a seizure. Is something amiss? Rue went and knelt by the old man. Mr. Jacopi. Who is this? he said, reaching out with his left arm. Rue saw that his right lay motionless in his lap. Rue took the left hand and said, My name is Rupert Avery. He spoke loudly. Avery, do I know you, sir? asked the old man. Knew a Klaus Avery when... No, that was Klaus Klamer. What was the Avery boy's name? Rue said, No, I don't think I've had the honor of meeting you before. But I knew an old friend of yours, Helmut Grindel. Helmet, said the old man with a grin. Saliva dribbled from the side of his mouth. Helen composed herself, and with a thank you pat to Dash's shoulders, she came and used a handkerchief to wipe the old man's chin. He and I grew up in the same town, did you know that? said the old man. How is he? Rue said, He died recently. Oh, said the old man. That's too bad. I haven't seen him for a while. Did I tell you we grew up in the same town? Yes, you did, said Rue. With delight, the old man said, Do you by chance know my boys, Tim and Randy? Rue said, I do, sir. The old man picked up Rue's hand slightly, as if for emphasis. If you are one of those rascals who is always stealing apples from our tree, don't admit it, he said with a laugh. I've told Tim to keep the other boys out of that tree. We need those apples for pie. My Eva bakes pies every fall. Rue looked at Helen, and she whispered, He gets confused. Sometimes he thinks his sons are still children. Eva was his wife. She's been dead thirteen years. Rue shook his head and released the old man's hand. He said, I can't. Tell him? asked Helen. Rue shook his head no. Randy, said the old man, motioning to Rue. Rue leaned over to put his head next to the old man's. Whispering, the old man said, Randy, you're a good lad. Look out for Jim. He's got such a temper. But don't let the other boys steal the apples. He reached out with his good hand and patted Rue on the shoulder. 
Rue straightened up and spent a few moments watching the old man, who was again lost in whatever dreams or memories he spent his days within. Rue stepped away and said to Helen, "'What purpose? Let him think his sons still live, for the God's mercy.' He thought of the coming fleet and the destruction that would be upon Crondor within a few years, and said, "'Let us all have a few years of pleasant dreams.' Helen led them away from the garden and said, "'I thank you for that small gesture, sir.' "'What will you do?' said Rue. "'Sell the house and business?' She started to weep again. "'I have family in Tanneris. I'll go to them. It will be hard, but we'll endure.' Rue said, "'No.' He thought about the boy and girl and his own two children, then said, "'I do not think the children need suffer for the mistakes of their fathers.' "'What do you propose?' asked Helen. "'Let me take charge of Jacobi and Sons. I will not take a copper of profit from the company.' I will operate it as if it were my own, but when your son is old enough, it will be his to control. Rue glanced around the house as they walked toward the entrance. I never spoke more than a word to Randolph, but it seems to me your husband's only flaw was to love a brother too well. It was only Tim with whom I had dispute. Taking the woman's hand, he said, Let it end here now. The woman said, You are generous. Rue said, No. I am sorry. More than you will ever know. I'll have my solicitor draw up a contract between you, as surviving widow of Randolph Jacoby, and the Bitter Sea Company, to operate Jacoby and Sons until such time as either you wish to dispose of the property, or your son is ready to take control. If you need anything, anything at all, you only have to ask. He pointed to Dash. My associate will come fetch you this afternoon and take you to the temple. Have you other relatives who should come with you? No, they live out of the city. I would bid you a good day, Mrs. Jacoby, but that would seem an empty sentiment. Let me depart by saying I wish we had met under different circumstances. Holding back more tears, Helen Jacoby said, So do I, Mr. Avery. I even suspect had circumstances been otherwise, you and Randolph could have been friends. They left and entered the carriage. Dash said nothing, and Rue put his right hand over his face. After a moment, he began to weep. Callus signaled, and the column came to a halt. They had encountered small commands of the Pantathians over the last three days. Callus judged they had moved twenty miles north of where they had encountered the large well in the heart of the mountain. Several times they had found more signs of struggle and destruction. Occasionally they encountered some hour corpses but as of yet they hadn't seen a single living lizard man. Having faced them once, Eric was grateful for that small boon. Eric fought against a growing sense of futility. The galleries seemed to wander under the mountains forever. He remembered maps back at the palace that suggested this range might be as much as a thousand miles long. If the Pantathian home realm wasn't as closely confined as Callus's theory proposed, they would be dead long before destroying the snake men's nest men were tense. The other specter that haunted their imaginations was who this mysterious third player might be. No fallen were seen who were not Pantathians or Sa'our. The only human remains were those belonging to pitiful prisoners dragged under the mountain to feed the Pantathian young. Whoever or whatever was warring on the Pantathians seemed intent on the same mission as Callus and his men. Three breeding creches had been found with infant Pantathians littering the rooms, all torn to pieces. The more evidence he observed, the more Eric was convinced they weren't looking for anything remotely like another invading force. Several bodies appeared to have been torn asunder, literally ripped limb from limb. Some of the young Pantathians looked as if they had been bitten in two. Eric couldn't put aside images of some monstrous creature from an ancient fable, materialized here by a magician to destroy his enemies. But when he had wondered aloud on this, Miranda's only answer was, where are the Pantathian magicians, then? Eric had heard some of Miranda's speculations as they marched. The entire population of Pantathian serpent priests was out in the field, serving the Emerald Queen. Even when she said it, Miranda didn't sound convinced. A scout returned and said, 
Nothing ahead, but there are some odd echoes, Sergeant. Eric nodded and asked, What do you mean by odd? Nothing I can put a name to, but there's something ahead, perhaps at a great distance. But it's making enough noise we should be able to get very close without being heard. Callus was told and said, We're close to being ready to drop. Miranda wiped her forehead. The heat down here is as bad as in the green reaches of Kesh. Eric couldn't argue. The men were wearing the lightest clothing possible under their armor, and it had taken a lot of attention to keep them from throwing away the heavy fur cloaks, which were now rolled and stowed in the heavy backpacks they lugged. Eric took time to remind each man that once they were back out of the mountains, winter would be upon them, and it would be as cold as it was now hot. Callus ordered a break and rest, and Eric assigned men to keep watch while others grabbed what sleep they could. As he reviewed every detail he could remember, De Longville motioned for him to come to a distant part of the cavern. Some stench, he offered. Eric nodded. Sometimes the sulfur makes my eyes burn. What do you think? Eric looked confused. About what? About all of this? Bobby waved his hand around. Eric shrugged. I'm not paid to think. Bobby grinned. Right. Then the grin vanished. Now what do you really think? Eric shrugged. I don't know. Sometimes it seems to me we've got no chance of ever seeing daylight again, but the rest of the time I just keep moving one foot ahead of the other, go where I'm told, keep the men alive, and don't dwell on tomorrow. The Longville nodded. Understood. But here's the hard part. That one-foot-at-a-time attitude is fine for the soldiers in the trenches, but you've got responsibilities. I know. No, I don't think you do, said De Longville. He looked around to make sure no one else was listening. Miranda has the means to get herself and one other out of here in a hurry. Special means. Eric nodded. He had long ago accommodated to the idea of Miranda's being a sorceress in some fashion, so this didn't surprise him. If anything happens to me, your job is to get the captain out with Miranda, understand? Maybe I don't. He's special, said De Longville. The kingdom needs him more than a couple of sorry sods like me and you. If you have to, hit him over the head and toss his limp body at Miranda, but don't let her leave without him. Eric tried not to laugh. The only member of this company stronger than Eric was the captain. And from what Eric had seen over the last few years, Callus was significantly stronger than Eric. Eric had a pretty good notion that if he hit Callus over the head, it probably wouldn't slow him a beat. I'll see what I can do, he said noncommittally. They moved out two hours later, and Eric capped what De Longville said in mind. He discounted the admonition because he didn't want to imagine a situation where De Longville wasn't around to tell him what to do, and he didn't think he could tell the captain to do anything. They moved along a long, narrow tunnel that seemed to slope gently downward. The heat continued unabated, but didn't seem to get worse. Twice they took breaks and scouts were sent ahead. Both times they returned to report the distant sounds they couldn't identify. Two hours later, Eric could hear the sounds they mentioned. Rumblings, the thunder faintly heard, with high-pitched keening, echoed from a great distance. Or at least, that's how it seemed to Eric. They reached a gallery and again found the signs of battle. But unlike the ones found earlier in the day or on the previous day, these were relatively fresh. The struggle took place yesterday, observed Callus. He pointed to places where deep pools of blood were still congealing. A soldier called Callus over to a breeding pool, and Eric followed. Gods, said Eric, looking at the carnage. It was the biggest hatching pool found so far. Eggs were smashed, and yolk and albumen floated in the water. The stench of rotten eggs was nearly overpowering. Then Eric noticed something. Where are the bodies of the young? A single arm lay floating in a bubbling pool of pinkish water, and around the verge splatters of blood were evident. At last Kala said, Something feasted here. The image of something ripping open the eggs and devouring the Pantathian young was one Eric didn't wish to dwell on, so he turned around and left. We should keep moving, said Callus at last. Eric formed up the men and moved them out. The ceremony was as brief as the one that had been conducted for Helmut. Rue stood with Carly beside him. 
The children were home with Mary. Helen and her two children stood silently while the priest of Limskragma intoned the benediction for the dead and lit the pyre. The girl played absently with her doll while the boy looked on with his face set in an expression of confusion. When the ceremony was over, Carly said, It is over? Rue patted her hand. Yes. The widow was a woman of remarkable strength, but no bitterness. She also cares most for her children. Carly looked at the children. Poor babies. She went over to Helen and said, I find no pleasure in this. If I can help, don't be ashamed to ask. Helen nodded. Her face was drawn and pale, but whatever tears she might have had remaining were held in check for later that night, when she was again alone. Carly returned to Rue's side. Are we going home? Rue shook his head. As much as I would like to, I have business I must oversee. He glanced at the distant afternoon sun. I must discharge a debt before sundown. After that, I don't know. Carly nodded. I must return to the children. Rue kissed her dutifully upon the cheek. I'll be home when I can. As Carly departed, Rue crossed to Helen. He studied the widow and thought what a fine and brave woman she was. Nothing like the beauty that Sylvia was, but, nevertheless, a woman who drew him. She turned to find him staring at her, and he lowered his eyes. I just wanted to repeat what I said today. Whatever you need, it is yours. Calmly, she said, thank you. Without knowing why, he said, you never have to thank me. Then he impulsively took her hand in his and held it briefly, saying, never. Without waiting for her to say anything, he turned and left. He rode without clear thought from the temple to Barrett's. Fatigue and emotions new to him made him unable to focus his mind. He thought of the struggle and the death. Then he saw the face of Helen Jacoby. The children, he would think. And then he would think of his own children. His driver had to alert him to the fact he was outside of Barrett's, and he wearily made his way to his usual place of business. His three partners were waiting for him, and he sat heavily, signaling to the waiter for a large cup of coffee. Masterson said, How did it go? I got the gold, answered Rue. He had intentionally not let his partners know about the recovery until now. His conversation with Duke James stuck in his mind, and he knew he needed to talk to his three partners while they were still frantic from worry. Praise be, called Hume, while Crowley just sighed deeply. Masterson said, Where's the gold? On its way to pay off the note. Good, good, said Crowley. Rue paused a moment, then said, I want you to buy me out. Masterson said, What? Rue said, This is all going too fast. We're very vulnerable, and I find I spend most of my time on the Bitter Sea Company and not enough time on Avery and Sons' business. Crowley said, Why should we buy you out? Because I've earned the right to quit, said Rue. For emphasis, he slammed his hand upon the table. I'm the one who fought a duel this morning to save our collective backsides. I don't mind saving my own, but I didn't see any of you gentlemen down there in the dark with a sword in your hand fighting for your lives. Hume said, Well, I mean, had we known... Crowley said, I don't think I'm persuaded we owe you any sort of quick exit, Mr. Avery. Masterson had been quiet, then he said, So you think this partnership should be dissolved? Rue said, or at least reorganized. Masterson smiled slightly. How? Let me buy controlling interest, said Rue. If you won't buy me out, either way I don't care, but if I'm going to be putting my life on the line, it will be for my own interests. Masterson said, You're a fast one, Rue Avery. I think you'll do fine, with or without us. If you're avid for a break, I'll sell to you. Hume said, This is all too much for me. I'm confused. Crowley said, Bah! This is just a trick to get me to step down as presiding officer of the Bitter Sea Company. Sell me half your interests, gentlemen, said Rue, and I'll make you rich, but I won't put myself again in the position where I'm risking my life and my family's future to protect your gold. Masterson laughed. That's right, Avery. I'll tell you what. I'll sell you just enough if the others will, to give you control. But I won't give you it all. 
It may have been your knack for a deal and your bloody damn luck that won us this wealth, but it was a lot of our gold at risk. Hume said, I'll do the same. I spend too much time here on Bitter Sea Company business and not enough on my other concerns. Crowley said, Well, I won't do it. Buy me out or sell to me, one or the other. Rue looked at Crowley and said, What price? To buy or to sell? The other three men laughed, and after a moment, Crowley did as well. Very well, said Crowley. I'll set you a price. He picked up a quill and scribbled a total on it, then pushed it across to Rue. Rue picked up the parchment, saw the figure was ridiculously high, and shook his head. He picked up the quill and drew a line through the total, wrote another one, and passed the parchment back to Brandon Crowley. Crowley looked at the total. That's robbery. Then I'll take the first number, as you're offered to buy me up said Rue. Masterson laughed. He's got you, Brandon. Crowley said, I'll take the difference between the two. Which was as Rue knew he would. So Rue said, Done. To human Masterson, he said, You gentlemen bear witness. They quickly agreed on the transfer of ownership, and before he knew it, Masterson was breaking out his special brandy again. After the events of the last two days, Rue was emotionally and physically drained. The single brandy got him close to as drunk as he could remember being. He struggled down to find Duncan waiting for him at the door. Luis says to tell you the gold got to where it needed to go, and all is well. He smiled. Rue smiled in return. You're a good friend, as well as my cousin, Duncan. He gave his cousin a very unexpected hug. I neglect to tell you that. Duncan laughed. Been drinking? Rue nodded. Yes. And you are now talking to the owner of the Bitter Sea Trading and Holding Company. He signaled for his carriage. I believe that makes me one of the richest men in Crondor, Duncan. Laughing, Duncan said, Well, oh, if you say so. The carriage rolled up, and Duncan opened the door, then helped to get Rue inside. Where to, sir? asked the driver. Rue leaned out the still open door and said, Duncan, I need a favor. I was to dine this night with Sylvia Estabrook, and I simply am too exhausted. Would you be a friend and carry my regrets to her? Duncan grinned. I think I can manage it. You're a good friend, Duncan. Have I told you that? Yes, said Duncan with a laugh. He closed the door and said, Get home with you. The carriage rolled away, and Duncan went to where his horse was tethered. He mounted and started to ride out toward the Estabrook estate. After a block, he turned his horse and headed back toward the small house he now shared with a prostitute he had met at the docks after Louise had left. He found the woman sleeping through the day and unceremoniously yanked the covers from her. She snorted and awoke, saying, What? He stared at her nude body a moment, then reached down and pulled her dress off the floor. Get your things and get up, he commanded as he threw it at her. What? asked the still confused woman again, sitting up. I said, get out, he shouted. For emphasis, he slapped her hard across the face. I need to bathe. Be gone by the time I'm done. He left the shocked and crying woman in the bedroom and moved down to the end of the hall, where a tub sat next to a small stove. He heated water and inspected his face in a polished metal mirror. Rubbing his hand over his chin, he decided he needed to shave. Stropping a razor, he hummed a nameless tune, while in the next room, the whore, whose name he couldn't recall, gathered up her belongings and cursed him under her breath. The screams echoed down the tunnels, and Eric, Callus, and the rest of the company moved as cautiously as possible. A bright light shone ahead from where a battle appeared to be taking place. Occasionally the sound of struggle paused, and then the clash of steel and shouts resumed. The hissing scream of Pantathians was punctuated by what Eric recognized as Sir Our war cries and something else, something that raised the hair on the back of his neck. Eric used hand signals, despite the din sounding ahead, against the faint possibility that someone might hear them coming. Rinaldo moved to where Eric stood at the van, and both of them stepped forward far enough to see what was ahead. A vast cavern, as big as any they had encountered, opened before them, a circular well, similar to the one when they had used to enter the mountains. It rose so high overhead that Eric had no idea where it stopped, but they had arrived near the bottom. 
Below them, one revolution down the circular ramp that hugged the inside of the well, a scene of desperate horror greeted them. The largest cache of Pantathian eggs they had seen so far lay in a vast pool of bubbling water. Eric quickly apprehended details. A stream of water ran down a wall into the pool, and Eric presumed it was cold, for the eggs would be cooked otherwise. The ice melt from above and the hot water from below must be mixed to keep the eggs incubated. The pool was easily sixty feet across, and crouched in the middle was a creature so alien Eric couldn't define it. He waved to those behind him and stared while the rest of the company filed out of the tunnel and spread out along the lip of the ramp. Eric felt pain in his shoulder and found Callus's hand gripping him tightly. Eric whispered, Captain? Callus blinked and said, Sorry, as he removed his hand. Eric knew he was startled, but was surprised at how much. The creature in the pool stood seventeen or eighteen feet tall with large, leathery wings on its back. It was a pearlescent black in color, with emerald green eyes. It divided its attention between savaging the remaining eggs in the pool, picking them apart and pulling the tiny pantathians from within, devouring them with a gulp, and fighting a battle with the surviving defenders. The creature's head was horse-like, but it had wide-set curved horns, like a goat, and each arm ended with human-looking hands, five fingers with long, sharp talons where nails should be. "'What is that thing?' asked de Longville. "'Mantreco,' said Boldar. "'You'd call it a demon, I guess. It's a being from a different plane of reality. I have never seen one, but I know about them.' He turned to Miranda and said, "'Did you know?' She shook her head and said, No, I thought we faced something else entirely. How did it get here? asked Boldar. The seals between this realm and the fifth circle have been intact for centuries. If one of those things had come through the hall, we would have known. It didn't come through the Hall of Worlds, obviously, said Miranda, straining to watch. Then she said, Now we know where the Pantathian magic users are. Suddenly a keening howl filled the room as the creature screamed in pain. It turned to face a group of serpent men who were encanting a spell against it. Callus said, Over there. He pointed, and Eric saw a tunnel about twenty feet beyond the other side of the struggle. What? That's where we need to go. Are you mad? asked Eric, before he could remember who he was speaking to. Unfortunately, no, said Callus. To Bobby, he said, Start walking the men around the ramp to just above that door, and then drop a rope. Try not to call attention to yourself. I don't want to have to deal with either side of the struggle, if we can avoid it. De Longville signaled, and Eric took the lead, moving as close to the wall as he could, so that at times, as he circled the well, following the ramp's rise, he saw only the head of the creature as it ducked, weaved, and tried to get past magic wards and blasts of energy. Twice waves of searing heat rose off the battle below, and once he was almost blinded by a flash of light so bright it left him blinking for a moment. He reached the position above the tunnel entrance Callus wanted, and turned so the man behind him could pull a rope out of Eric's backpack. Eric saw nothing to which he could tie the rope, so he braced himself and nodded for the next soldier to shinny down the rope and head up the tunnel. Each man followed orders without thought or hesitation. Two archers waited nearby, ready to fire at either the Fantathian magicians or the demon, but both sides seemed intent on their struggle. After the tenth man descended, Callus approached and said, "'How are you doing?' My arms ache, but I'm all right, said Eric. Callus said, I'll hold this for a bit. He took the rope with one hand, and Eric was again impressed with just how much more powerful the captain was than he appeared to be. More men climbed down, ducking into the tunnel. Eric couldn't judge, but it seemed to him the contest was slowly turning the demon's way. Each time the Pantathian magicians launched an assault, the creature returned even more viciously. The magicians appeared to be tiring, if Eric could judge these alien creatures. Suddenly it was Miranda climbing down, and Callus said, Eric, you next. Eric complied, and was followed by the Longville. Then the rope fell. Callus leaped the twenty or more feet to the stone floor, landing as lightly as if he had jumped only a few. He found his company spread out down the tunnel, backs against the wall. Callus moved past and said, Follow me, when he reached the other end of the line. The men fell in, and Eric took up a position at the rear, glancing back at the struggle. A strange hissing scream cut through the air, and Eric judged one of the magicians had been taken by the demon. 
They came to a small chamber, barely large enough to hold the company. Calla said, Listen, everyone. Something has changed the balance of forces we find opposing us, and we need to discover what this new agent is. He glanced about. Boldar? Yes? asked the mercenary. You put a name to that thing. What do you know about it? Boldar's helm turned in Miranda's direction, and she nodded once. Tell him. Boldar removed his helm. It's a mantrico, in the language of the priests of Astaput, a world I've visited. I've never seen one, but I've seen temple paintings. Boldar paused, as if considering his words. Other worlds live by other rules, he began. On Astaput, they've had dealings with these creatures, ritual sacrifices and invocations, and the sort of worship. On other worlds, they are considered creatures from a different energy plane. Energy plane? said Callus. Miranda spoke. A lot of beings exist out there in the universe in places that follow different rules than this world does, Callus. You've heard your father speak of the dread? He nodded, and no small number of the men made signs of protection against evil. He defeated a dread master once. The dread were the stuff of legends, along with the uh, dragon lords. The dread were considered the mightiest of the creatures of the void, the soul suckers and life drainers. The tread of their foot withered the grass, and only the mightiest magic could defeat them. Well, continued Miranda, that creature out there, that demon, is similar. The universe it lives in is governed by different laws from our own. She glanced back down the tunnel and said, it's not as alien to our sense of how things work as the dread may be, but it is different enough that its presence means some very difficult days are ahead. How did it come here? asked Callus. I don't know, Miranda answered. Perhaps we'll find out ahead. She pointed to the tunnel leading away from the struggle. Callus nodded. Let's go. He led the way with Eric, Boldar, De Longville, and the others trailing behind. At least we understand why we found some untouched pockets of young here and there, said De Longville. Eric nodded. That thing is too big for some of the chambers. Boldar said, It might not always have been that way. What do you mean? asked Callus, not stopping as he moved through the dark tunnel. They had returned to their single torch in the center of the line, and Eric found it odd hearing his voice in the gloom. It may be that this creature slipped through a dimensional scission. Scission? said Callus. Rift, replied Miranda. That might make sense. If a tiny demon came through unnoticed and spent some time gathering its strength, preying upon the unwary in these tunnels until it could raid the outlying creches. But that doesn't answer how it got here or why, said Callus. They moved quickly down the tunnel until it suddenly emptied into a large chamber. A half-dozen other tunnels also entered, and before them rose up gigantic double doors of ancient wood. The doors were open, and they moved through the doorway into the biggest hall encountered so far. Eric's eyes had difficulty understanding what he saw. It was a temple, but unlike any human temple he had ever encountered. "'Mother of all gods,' said one of the men coming into the hall behind Eric. A full hundred yards of floor stretched out before them, and everywhere they looked, torn and mutilated bodies were strewn. The stench was nearly overwhelming, even to men who had been smelling the stink of dead for days now. A thousand torches had once lit the room to what must have been brilliance, but presently only one torch in ten still burned. The hall was rendered into gloomy darkness and flickering shadows that danced on every surface, giving the room an even more terrifying aspect than it would have held. And that aspect would have been frightening at the light of noon. The rear wall was cut to form a statue of heroic proportion. A regal-looking woman sat atop a throne, a figure measuring over one hundred feet from toe to crown. Her robes flowed down from her shoulders, leaving her breasts bare. In two arms she held life-size creatures, one obviously Pantathian, the other resembling the Sa'our, though of smaller stature than any Sa'our Eric had seen. The entire statue was green, as if cut from the largest single piece of jade in the universe. Before her a huge pit yawned, and Eric picked his way through the litter of bodies to glance downward. Gods, he whispered. 
He couldn't begin to estimate the number of humans who must have gone into that pit to fill it, because he had no concept of the depth. But just from what he could see, it had been a staggering population. Then he realized the dark railing wasn't that color from paint or stain, but from generations of human blood. Boldar came forward and said, This begs repayment. I thought you a rather cold-blooded crew when Miranda told me where we were headed and why. But now I understand why you must destroy these creatures. This is only a part of it, said Callus from behind. He pointed to cases used to display artifacts arrayed on both sides of the huge statue. There. That is where we must go. Eric looked around. He didn't much like the idea of attempting to walk across the Mountain of Bones. Then he spied an entrance near the base of the pit. Maybe that way? Callus nodded. You, Boldar, and Miranda, with me. To Longville, he said, spread out the men and search. Anything that looks as if it might be remotely important is to be carried back here. Miranda said, but carefully, do not let alien devices or objects come into contact with one another. Boldar echoed that. There can be nasty consequences if the wrong sorts of magic come into contact. The Longville ordered the men to spread out, and torches were distributed so the men could have more light to inspect the ruins of this temple. Callus led the others to the small door Eric had seen, and it was indeed an access to the altar, so that they could get to the huge idol without crossing the pit. As they reached the large dais upon which the idol sat, Callus motioned for Boldar and Eric to stand back while he and Miranda cautiously approached the nearest case. Looking like nothing so much as bookcases, thought Eric, these were fashioned of stone, blackened by what he knew now to be centuries of human blood. He saw Miranda and Callus were indifferent to the cases. They studied the items displayed within them. Eric didn't see anything remarkable about any of them. They mostly consisted of jewelry, a few weapons, and some other nondescript items. But Callus and Miranda approached them as if they were repositories of evil. Quietly they looked, moving toward the cases and away, then barely touching them. Suddenly Callus said, They are wrong. Miranda said, Are you certain? As I know my own heritage. He picked up a dagger and said, the helm that we carry brings sounds, tastes, ancient visions. There is nothing of that here. Miranda took another weapon and examined it. Then she tossed the short sword to Eric, hilt first, and said, Von Darkmoor, strike something. Eric glanced around and saw nothing close by that looked a likely target. He moved to the other side of the huge idol and struck the edge of one of the large stone cases. The sword shattered as if it had been fashioned of base metal. Not very well made, said Eric, inspecting the hilt still in his hand. Having been a smith for years, he said, the blade wasn't even steel. Callus knelt and picked up a piece of shattered metal. It wasn't supposed to be steel. It was supposed to have been something far more deadly. Eric tossed away the hilt. Callus moved around the statue, inspecting it. This is supposed to be the green mother of all, he said quietly. In a strange fashion, she would be my aunt. Eric's eyes widened slightly, and he glanced at Miranda and Boldar. Miranda watched Callus's face closely, as if she were anxious about something. Boldar returned Eric's questioning glance with a shrug. Miranda said, These are stage properties. She waved her hand to the artifacts in the case. It's as if a company of actors were staging this. She looked around the vast hall. This is a theater more than a temple. Boldar looked at the carnage on the floor and the bones in the pit. The murder is real enough, Kala said. Look here. Eric came over and saw a faint crack along the back of the huge idol. He put his hand over it and felt a draft of air. There's an entrance behind here. Callus put his shoulder to the idol and Eric pushed as well. Rather than the enormous resistance they expected from an idol this massive, it rolled away a few feet, being hinged on the opposite side from where they stood. A man-sized opening was visible in the wall behind the idol, an entrance to a flight of stairs leading downward. Miranda knelt and examined the base of the idol from behind. 
This is marvellous engineering, she observed. Boldar looked at the metalwork. Nothing like this was forged on Midkemia. Eric also looked at the marvellous wheels, pulleys, and hinges, and was forced to agree. He wished for enough time to linger over these items. He was still fascinated by the smith's arts, but Callus was already moving down the stairs. Eric gripped his torch tightly in his left hand, his sword in his right, and called over his shoulder. Sergeant! De Longville shouted back. What? There's a passage down here. The captain's heading down it. Understood, said De Longville, as he continued to have the men look over the corpses for anything that might shed light on what had happened in the strange underground city of serpent men. Eric stepped on the top step and followed the others downward. Duncan knocked on the gate and was quickly answered by a servant. He assumed the gateman had been waiting for Rue to arrive. Yes? asked the servant. I bear a message for Lady Sylvia from Rupert Avery. Seeing the rider was dressed in fine clothing, the servant opened the gate, asking, And who might you be, sir? I am Duncan Avery. Very well, sir, said the servant, closing the gate behind Duncan, as he rode up to the front of the house. Duncan dismounted and gave the reins to another servant and walked to the door. He knocked loudly. A few moments later the door opened and Sylvia stood regarding Duncan. She wore another of the stunning evening gowns only the boldest young women of Crondor would dare to display themselves in. She was one of the few who could do justice to it. Duncan smiled his most charming smile. She said, I was expecting Rupert. He sends his regrets. I thought it far more civil to bring word in person rather than letting an impersonal note serve. She stepped aside and said, Do come in. He entered and said, he regrets that the press of business and family matters conspire to keep him away this evening. He is devastated. Sylvia allowed herself a slight smile. I somehow find it difficult to imagine that Rue said it in quite that fashion. Duncan shrugged. I thought perhaps if you had no objection I might offer you my poor company as an alternative. She laughed. Taking his arm in hers, she pressed her bosom hard against him as she walked into the dining hall. I doubt women find your company poor, dear Duncan, is it not? It is indeed, Sophia, if I may presume. Reaching the dining room, she said, You may presume a great deal, I think. She led him to the chair at the end of the table and motioned for him to sit as a servant pulled out her chair. We met that night at the party. Now I remember. Duncan smiled, and she studied his face a while. Let us eat, said Sylvia, and drink. Yes, I find I'm in the mood for a great deal of wine. Motioning to Duncan's goblet, she told the servant, Some of father's best. As the servant disappeared to fetch a bottle of wine, Sylvia fixed Duncan with as penetrating a gaze as she could. Good cousin Duncan. Yes, Rue has spoken of you. She smiled again. Let us drink a great deal, dear Duncan. Let us get drunk together. And then, later, we'll think of some other things we might do. Duncan's smile broadened. Whatever your pleasure, I am at your service. She reached over and scratched the back of his hand with her nails. Pleasure and the service. My, what a treasure you are. The servant arrived and poured wine, and supper commenced. 20. Discovery Rue smiled. He had slept a long night and had awakened to a house full of noise, but rather than irritating him, the noise delighted him. The baby squealed and made cooing noises while Abigail talked her baby talk. Carly seemed her usual subdued self, but smiled at whatever small comment he made. He lingered over breakfast, and finally, when he left for the office, she walked with him to the door, where he paused. "'Would you like to live in the country?' he asked. "'I hadn't given it any thought,' answered Carly. He looked out the door across the street to Barrett's and said, when I was a child, I used to run for hours, or at least it seemed like hours, without seeing another person. The air is clean, and there's a silence at night. I think I'd like to build us a house outside the city. 
a place where the little ones can run and play and grow strong. She smiled at his reference to the children, for he rarely spoke of them. Will you be able to conduct your business from so distant a home? He laughed. I now console the company. I think I can delegate more day-to-day -day business to Dash, Jason, and Louise. And Duncan? Of course, he said. He's my cousin. She nodded. I would have to come in from time to time, and you and the children would come with me for holidays, and we'd stay in the city during winter. But when the weather's warm, a place a day's ride from the city wouldn't be much of a hardship. Whatever you think best, she answered, lowering her eyes. He reached out to touch her chin, gently lifting it. I want you happy, Carly. If you don't wish to live away from the city, we'll stay here. If you think it would be nice, we'll build another house. You decide. She seemed genuinely surprised. Me? Yes, he said, smiling. Think on it. I'll be across the street if you need me. He crossed and entered the building. Kurt practically fell over himself, opening the gate for him, as he said, Good morning, Mr. Avery. Rue almost tripped. He was so surprised by the usually surly waiter's politeness. He turned to discover men who had barely glanced at him since he had become a member, rising to greet him. Good morning, Mr. Avery, was repeated by men whose names he could barely recall. When he mounted the stairs, he discovered a new railing had been put across the last third of the upper balcony, and on the other side sat Luis, Jason, and Dash. Dash nimbly jumped up and, with a dramatic flourish, opened the swinging gate in the rail. What is this? Dash grinned. I arranged with Mr. McKellar for us to take a permanent position here with an option for the rest of this side of the balcony area in the future. Really? said Rue, fixing Dash with a baleful look. And what was all this business below? Dash attempted to look innocent. I merely let it be known yesterday afternoon, after you left for the day, that you were now controlling owner of the Bitter Sea Company. Lowering his voice, he added, You're probably the richest man in Crondor this morning, Rupert. Dash held out his hand, and Jason produced a fistful of papers. He handed them to Dash, who passed them along to Rue. The trading fleet from the Free Cities returned on the evening tide last night. Rue grabbed the sheets and looked them over. This is fantastic. Not only had they sold the last shipments of grain at far above the projected market value, the locust plague had crossed the Grey Towers and struck hard at the far coast. The ships had returned, carrying cargo brilliantly selected at prices sure to realize a profit. They had projected the ships returning empty, so indeed Rupert was far more wealthy than he had imagined. There you are, said Crowley, hurrying up the stairs. Rue said, Good morning, Brandon. Don't you good morning me, you thief! What? said Rue, his good humor vanishing. You knew that fleet was coming in, yet you sat there and cozened us with babble about risk and— Cozened? exclaimed Rue. He stood up. Brandon, I offered to sell you my share of the Bitter Sea Company. Part of a clever plot to cheat us all, obviously. Oh, mercy, said Rue, turning toward Dash. Don't deny it, said Crowley. Rue turned. Brandon, I have no patience for making denials. He looked at his former partner. Here's what I will do. You have a choice. I will tell Jason to account the profits on the fleet and give you what would have been your share of the profits from this voyage had you not sold me your share in the Bitter Sea Company last night. If I do this, do not ever again expect me to invite you into any business with the Bitter Sea Company. The gold we account you today will be the last you will ever see from us. In fact, should fate put us at odds, I will ensure you're crushed. He smiled as he said this. Or oh, you can simply accept that you bet the wrong way on the turn of the card and leave with some attempt at good grace. If you can manage that, I will be sure to invite you to join with the Bitter Sea Company on other ventures in the future when I seek partners. Those are your choices. What do you prefer? Crowley stood there for a long moment, then said, Bah! You're giving me a fool's choice. But I wasn't here to beg favors. I want no part of your ill-gotten profits, Rue Avery. A bargain's a bargain, and you'll not hear otherwise from Brandon Crowley. He turned and left, muttering under his breath. After he'd gone, Dash laughed. Jason said, If he'd taken but a day to think on your offer, he'd have been a far wealthier man. 
Rue nodded emphatically. That's the whole point of his complaint. He's mad at himself. Do you think you've made an enemy? asked Louise. Rue said, No, Brandon just enjoys complaining. He'll be back the second I invite him to make sure he's involved in any rich deals, but he'll keep complaining. The other partners showed up later that morning, but unlike Crowley, they simply congratulated Rue on his good fortune and themselves on their increased profits on the portion of the company they still owned. Rue spent the next hour exchanging pleasantries with other men of note in the coffee house. About mid-morning, the last social visitor departed, and Rue asked, Where is Duncan? I haven't seen him since yesterday, said Dash. Rue shrugged. I asked him to run an errand for me after leaving here. Knowing Duncan, I'd wager he went out after that and found some woman to tumble. Rue then glanced about to ensure no one else was close by, then motioned to his three companions to come closer so he could speak softly. Someone has betrayed us. Jason looked at Luis and Dash. How do you know? Someone knew more about this company than would be possible without inside communications. That party sent word to the Jacobis. He explained how he had agreed to run Jacobi and Sons for Helen and her children. Jason, go over to their office and introduce yourself to anyone who might still be there. Most of Tim's hired men are in prison today, so there may not be anyone around but a clerk or two. If they need convincing, have someone go to Helen Jacoby's home and get confirmation as to our arrangement. Go over the books and see what is due and what is needed, but also keep an eye out for any hint of who our betrayer might be. Jason nodded. I'll go at once. After he left, Rue said, Very well, gentlemen. What else concerns us today? He sat and began attending to the duties of being the richest man in Crondor. Duncan stood at the door while Sylvia gave him a long kiss. Stop that, he said, or we'll be back upstairs. She smiled and closed the sheer night robe she wore, which had fallen open. No, sorry to say, I must get some sleep, and the morning is half over. Now, go. She closed the door behind him as he walked down to where a groom brought his horse and waited until she heard the horse moving away. She walked to the left hall and continued down to the office. Opening the door, she stepped through. Jacob Estabrook looked up and, seeing the open robe, said, Cover yourself, Sylvia. What will the servants say? Whatever they say, said Sylvia, ignoring his instruction and letting the robe stay open. She enjoyed outraging her father. She sat down on the other side of the desk. There's not one of them who hasn't seen me undressed from time to time. She neglected to mention that several of them had shared her bed over the years as well. Both she and Jacob pretended he didn't know of her indulgences. Was that young Avery? She grinned. That was the other young Avery. Duncan came in his cousin's stead. So I decided he might as well fulfill all of Rue's duties. Jacob sighed. You create potential difficulties, Sylvia. She laughed, leaning back, allowing the robe to fall even farther open. I always create difficulties. It's my nature. But this Duncan is as venal as any man I've met, I'll wager, be the price gold or flesh. I think we can use him, especially if we offer him both gold and flesh. Really? said Jacob, ignoring his daughter's brazen attempt to embarrass him. He could prove a useful weapon, she said with a smile. Jacob nodded. Well, having an ally inside the Bitter Sea Company is very useful. Having two would be even better. But considering the situation, I'd like to remind you what disaster might befall us should you blunder and let the two discover each other. She stood, stretching and arching her back like a cat. Have I ever made a mistake where men are concerned, father? He sat back in his chair. Not so far, daughter, but you are young. I don't feel young, she said, turning and leaving his office. Jacob considered for a moment to the creature who was his daughter, then dismissed such musing. He had never understood women, not Sylvia, not her dead mother, not the occasional wench he tumbled down to the sign of the white wing. To him, women were to be either used or ignored. Then he thought again of his daughter and realized that ignoring such a one as she could prove deadly. Sighing at what he saw her to be, he refused to assign blame to himself. 
He had never intended for her to turn out as she had, and, besides, she served the needs of Jacob Estabrook and company admirably. Eric pointed. What is that? They had found a long tunnel leading away from the bottom of the flight of stairs behind the idol. The Longville reported finding nothing of interest among the slain above, and Callus ordered the rest of his company down to the tunnel. Seeing how tired the men were, Callus had ordered a halt. They slept for what Eric judged to be several hours on the landing at the bottom of the stairs before moving along the large tunnel that led away into the gloom. While waiting, Eric had noticed what appeared to be a large pipe leading along the ceiling of the hall. Drain pipe, offered Praji. Eric tried to inspect it and finally said, Hand me a lantern. Baja obliged, and Eric looked closely. Eric held the lantern close and said, It's no pipe. I think it's solid. He took out his sword and gently tapped the blade against it. A shriek loud enough to cause those awake to cover their ears and to jolt every sleeping man to alertness echoed down the tunnel while an angry green flash nearly blinded Eric. Praji, who had been standing next to Eric, said, Don't do that again! while Miranda waved her hand, her mouth moving as she softly spoke an incantation. Eric felt his arm sting to the shoulder and said, Don't worry, I won't. Miranda said, It's a conduit. For what? asked Callus. Life. Eric frowned and looked to Boldar, who stood next to his employer. The alien mercenary shrugged. I have no idea what she's talking about. Callus said, We move out now. The men formed up, and they moved down the tunnel. Eric heard Alfred mutter, Given that shriek, no one's going to be surprised when we show up. Eric said, Given what we've seen, anyone who's surprised by anything down here is an idiot. There is that, agreed the former corporal from Darkmoor. Eric said, Take the rear, Alfred. I need someone with a steady nerve back there. With a faint smile at the praise, the one-time brawler stepped aside to let the other men pass. They followed the tunnel until they came to a large wooden door. They carefully inspected the door, listening for noise, and when they heard nothing, Callus put his hand against the wood. He pushed, and the door swung inward. Callus and Eric stepped into a large chamber, and Eric's hair bristled even down to the hair on his arms. The room was filled with strange power, energies that swept through him, filling him with a giddy feeling. Everything was illuminated by a series of lanterns in the ceiling, recessed so the source of the light couldn't be seen unless one stood directly underneath. The soft glow was tinged with green, and Eric suspected that the green flash of light he had seen when his blade had touched what Miranda called a conduit, and the alien light in this room were related. Five figures turned as they entered, and instantly Callus's sword was out and he was charging. Eric, Prodji, and Vaja didn't wait for orders, duplicating the captain's attack. Miranda shouted, Back! to those behind her while she began casting a spell. Five Pantathian serpent priests began casting spells. A sixth priest, in ornate robes, sat motionless atop a large throne, observing without any change of expression. Eric dove under the outstretched arm of a priest as a blinding blast of energy exploded off the creature's hand. Eric rolled over on his back, just catching a glimpse of Miranda using some type of mystic shield to deflect the blast down toward the floor. Callus, Praji, and Vaja were standing together when another ball of energy exploded in their direction. Praji and Vaja took the blast full in the face, and both men fell backward, their bodies erupting into flames. Eric judged them dead before they hit the stone floor. Callus turned and took part of the blast on his left side, stumbling and howling in pain as the energies flamed around him. For a tortured moment he seemed a living candle, a light in being consumed. Then the magic fire vanished, but the entire left side of Callus's body was smoking char and weeping wounds. Callus, shouted Miranda, while Eric continued to roll right into the first serpent priest. He knocked the creature over and slashed past it as he stood, killing another priest. Without hesitation, he slammed his boot heel into the throat of the creature he had knocked over, leaving the serpent priest thrashing in pain as it suffocated, trying to breathe with a crushed windpipe. A third priest turned to face Eric, attempting to conjure, but it died before any spell was realized as Eric severed its head from its shoulders. Suddenly a shout from the other end of the tunnel alerted Eric that more trouble was likely to descend upon them. He turned toward the remaining three priests. One also was about to conjure a spell when a thin stream of light, a blinding white and purple pulse, slammed into its head as Miranda attacked. The creature hissed in agony, then its head erupted in mystic flame. A brief flash, and the head was gone. The decapitated body slumped to the ground. 
Callus pulled himself upright by force of will to kill the fifth priest before Eric could reach him. Even injured, Callus was powerful enough to drive his sword completely through the priest. Eric spun to face the door as De Longville cried out, Sir R, they're coming! Eric turned to face the seated priest. Miranda also came forward, first to grip Callus and help him to keep standing, and second to protect him. She spared the smoking corpses of Praji and Vaja only a momentary glance, as it was obvious they were far beyond mortal help. Then she joined Callus in turning to confront the last Pantathian, preparing to defend Callus should the high priest launch an attack. But the seated Pantathian only blinked as he regarded the carnage before him. Eric slowly approached and saw that the five priests had been protecting something, an object that sat in a stone well in front of and a few feet below the base of the throne. Eric moved slowly toward it, shifting his gaze back and forth between the object and the figure on the throne. The object looked like a large green emerald, but one aglow with a fey light. "'Gods!' said Miranda in a voice hoarse with fear. "'Your gods have nothing to do with this, human,' said the figure upon the throne, what Eric took to be a high priest. Its speech was sibilant, but otherwise understandable. "'They are newcomers to this world, trespassers and pretenders.' Eric glanced up and saw a faint shimmer of green energy pouring from a metal rod, falling in a faint cascade upon the stone. He followed the rod back to the wall above the door and surmised it was the same one he had struck. The sounds of battle rang out in the hallway. Eric glanced at Callus, who weakly said, Get that door closed and block it off somehow. Eric ran to where the Longville stood. Captain says to get this door closed and blocked off, said Eric. The Longville shouted out, Fall back! He turned to Eric and said, We've got one advantage. They're so damn big they can't come through the tunnel but one at a time, and we're hacking them down as they show their ugly faces. The men fell back, and Eric saw that most were covered in blood. He imagined it must have been grim work at the end of the line. The last man through was Alfred, who thrust and parried at an unseen opponent. Then Eric saw a huge green head as a Sa'our warrior, attempting to fight while half hunched over, pushed forward. Eric didn't wait, but took out his dagger and threw it with all his strength at the creature over the shoulder of the retreating Alfred. The blade took the Sa'our in the neck, and it clawed with one hand at the blade as it fell forward, half blocking the door. A shout from behind the creature told Eric the creature's allies had seen him fall. The Longville didn't hesitate, but shouted, Drag him inside! Three men on each side grabbed the creature, nearly twelve feet tall, and pulled it through the portal, while another soldier duplicated Eric's action and threw his dagger at the next Sa'our. It had the desired result, causing the creature to retreat long enough for them to get the door closed. There was a large wooden bar, and Eric motioned for other soldiers to set it across the door, into two huge iron supports. A moment later came the sound of a large body hitting the door, followed by an angry exclamation Eric assumed to be a Sa'our oath. "'Block the door!' shouted Eric. Four of the men dragged the dying Sa'our away from the door, while others took some idols of stone, lizard figures crouching as if guarding something, and pushed them before the door. Eric turned to see Miranda and Callus slowly approaching the green gem. What is this thing? Miranda asked. The seated figure said, Your lowly intellect is incapable of understanding human. Callus hobbled with Miranda's help to stand next to the object, letting the green light bathe him. The burns he had received from the magician's blast must have been causing him incredible pain, but he showed no sign of it. He said, It is a key. The serpent said, You are more intelligent than you look, elf. Callus shook off Miranda's support and reached over the edge of the pool in which the emerald rested, and the Pantathian stood up slowly, as if infirmity or age were weighing heavily upon him. No, he commanded. Do not touch this. It is nearly finished. It is finished said Callus, as he put his hand upon the gem and closed his eyes. Green, pulsing light seemed to crawl slowly up his arm. Callus's wounds were still terrible, raw flesh and singed hair, but the green light seemed to strengthen him. He removed his hand from the gem's surface and walked toward the creature, who now stood upright, looking at Callus with amazement upon its face. "'You should be dead,' said the priest. "'This is decades of work.' the life force of thousands of slaughtered creatures, and it is the key that will bring back our mistress. 
Your mistress is a fraud, shouted Callus. He came up to the Pantathian, weaving slightly, and said, You are snakes lifted up and given arms, legs, speech, and cunning, but you are snakes. He leaned forward until he was nearly nose to snout with a creature. Look into my eyes, snake. See what you face. The old priest blinked and stared into Callus's eyes. Mystic communication passed between them because suddenly the priest fell to its knees, turning away, holding up its arms, as if shielding itself from Callus's gaze. No, it cannot be. I carry that blood within me, shouted Callus. Eric wondered where the strength to hold himself that way came from. A lesser man would be dead from the burns. It is a lie, screamed the lizard man, turning away. Your green mother is the lie, shouted Callus. She is no goddess. She is one of the Valhero. No, they were lesser kin. None were as great as she who birthed us. We labor to bring her back, so that in death we will be born again to rule at her feet. Fools, said Callus. And Eric could sense the strength leaving him again. Miranda took careful hold of his right side, helping him stay erect. Murderous fools, you are nothing but what she made you. Bent creatures of no natural root, the makings of a vain thing who knew only her own pleasures. You were dust under her feet, and when she rose with her brethren during the Chaos Wars, you were forgotten. Callus stumbled, and Delongville came to help hold him. If there was any possible way to redeem you and your kind, we would not be here. Then Callus took a deep breath. You are a pawn, and have always been a pawn. It is no fault of your own that you must be destroyed. But you must be obliterated, root and branch. You are here to do this, said the high priest. I am, said Callus. I am the son of he who imprisoned your armor, Lodaka. No, shrieked the high priest. None may speak the most holy of names. The old serpent rose, pulling a dagger from its robes. Eric didn't hesitate, but ran two steps up the dais and hacked as hard as he could at the high priest. The old creature's head sailed from its shoulders, landing a short distance away, while the body collapsed. Eric looked at Kalos, who said, You did well. What now? asked the Longville, as the thudding against the door became more rhythmic. They've gotten themselves a ram. That's a heavy bar on the door, but it won't hold forever. Those Sa'au are strong. Kala said, Find us another way out, or we have to fight back the way we came. De Longville turned and ordered the men to start searching for another exit. Here is what their temple was about, said Callus, as Miranda helped him sit upon the steps. Tens of thousands of lives given up over the last fifty years in vile sacrifice, so they could create that. He pointed weakly at the green stone. It is a thing of captured life. Miranda said, Your father spoke once of the false Mermandanus using the captured lives of those who died in his service to shift into the same realm as the life stone. We should have suspected they would again use such means. She pointed at the stone. This is a far more powerful tool than that simple deception. What do we do with it? asked Eric. Callus groaned in pain. You, he said to Miranda, take it. You must take it to my father. He and Pug are the only two men on this world who might understand how to utilize it. The pounding on the door served to underscore the urgency of his words. If the Emerald Queen gets this key to Sathanan, joins it with a life stone... Miranda nodded. I think I understand. I can get a few of us out of here. No, said Callus. I'm staying. I'm the only one who might begin to understand what else we might find here. Take the Valhero helm we found, and this key. Try for the surface. He looked at Boldar and said, Take the mercenary with you. He'll keep you alive until you find a place you can use your arts to get home. Miranda smiled. You bastard. You told me you don't know anything about magic. Kala said, There is no magic, remember? I wish Nacor were here, said Eric. Kala said, 
If Pug couldn't find the Pantathians after looking for them for fifty years, it follows this place is very secure, and I suspect that using magic to get in or out is equally impossible. Damn you, she said, a tear running down her face. We do need to climb up to the surface or near it. Well, then we'd better hope there's another way out. A few minutes later, DeLongville reported they had found a stairway at the rear of the hall leading upward. There you go, said Callus, trying to smile. I need to rest a bit. And the men need to look around. Miranda took his hand and gripped it. What do I say to your father? That I love him. And say the same to my mother, said Callus. Then tell him that a demon is loose. And there's a third player in this. I think when he looks at this gem, he will find it is not what it seems to be. What do you mean? Let the spell weavers examine this thing without my theories coloring their opinions. Miranda approached the object with caution and gently touched it. She muttered and cast about with her hands, then picked up the object. I don't like leaving you. Callus managed a brave smile. I don't like it much either. Now, if you can manage to give me a kiss without touching my injured side, do so. And get out of here. Miranda knelt and kissed the right side of his face, then whispered, I'll come back for you. Don't, said Callus. We won't be here. We'll find our own way out. I'll get to that Bridgener ship somehow. Get Duke William to send someone our way just in case, but don't you dare come back here for me. There are still other priests in these mountains, almost certainly, and even if we've killed their inner circle, they will be powerful enough to find you when you use your magic to return. Then he fingered the magic ward she gave him. Besides, how will you find me? His question was punctuated by another assault on the door. She gripped his good hand with her left while holding the glowing gem with her right. Stay alive, damn it. I will, he promised. Bobby, the Longville said, Captain. Take a dozen men and go with them. The Longville turned and shouted, Squad two and squad three, come here. Twelve men left their searching of the hall and reported. Go with the lady, he instructed. Callus said, You too, Bobby. The Longville turned and with an evil grin said, Make me. To the twelve men who waited, he pointed to the door and said, Take the lady and the mercenary and get the hell out of here. The twelve men glanced at Miranda and Boldar. Boldar nodded once and set off in the van, and six men followed, while the other six waited until Miranda gave Callus's hand one more squeeze and set off. Then they followed her. Eric turned to Callus. What do we do now, Captain? How many men do we have left? asked Callus. Eric didn't have to count. Now that two squads are gone, we're down to thirty-seven, including you. Wounded? Five, but they can still fight. Help me up, said Callus. Eric gave him a hand up, then slipped his arm around his waist, keeping his hand on Callus's belt, avoiding his burned flesh. Callus leaned his good side heavily upon Eric and said, I need to see anything that may be an artifact of the ancient ones, the dragon lords. Eric had no idea how he would know if he stepped on such an artifact, but Callus said, Remember how that helm felt when you touched it? Eric said, I can't forget that. That's what we're looking for. For a tense fifteen minutes they combed the hall. A door with a large bar on it was discovered behind a tapestry. Once it was open, Calla said, Stand back. He forced Eric to let go and hobbled to the entrance. Inside sat a suit of armor. It glowed with a green light, and Eric felt the hair on his arms rise up once again. Calla said, This is the true repository of her power. Eric assumed he meant the goddess, or Lady Dragonlord, or whatever she might be. But he was distracted by the creaking sounds of wood and groaning hinges as the Sa'awar continued to pound methodically at the heavy door. Bobby said, What do we do with it? We destroy it, said Callus. He took a staggering step forward, and both Eric and DeLongville hurried to help him walk. Eric felt his skin tingle and fought back the urge to scratch as he came nearer the artifacts. Besides the armor, a set of emerald jewelry was displayed. A tiara, a necklace that was a full choker of huge stones, matching bracelets and rings. Callus gently reached out and touched the breastplate. Then he snatched his hand back, as if his fingers had been burned. No, he said. What? asked De Longville. It's wrong. He quickly touched each item in the room and said, It's all contaminated. Something has changed this. Suddenly, and for the first time since Eric had known him, 
Carus revealed fear in his expression. I'm a fool. Almost as big a fool as the Pentathians. To Bobby, he said, we must destroy this as quickly as we can. But most of all, we must escape. De Longville said, you'll get no argument from me, Captain. Carus said, Eric, you are a smith. How best to destroy this armor? Eric picked up the breastplate, a shimmering thing of green metal with a serpent depicted in bas relief upon it. As he touched it, strange images, haunting music, and an alien rage flooded through him. He dropped it to the floor. It rang as it struck the stone. I don't know if it can be destroyed, at least by normal means, said Eric. To forge metal, great heat is needed. Great heat can also rob steel of its temper. If we could build a hot enough fire... Looking around, Calla said, What can we burn? Then he collapsed, and Bobby lowered him to the floor. Looking at Eric, he shouted for Alfred. When the corporal reached them, De Longville said, To my distress, I find myself suddenly in command. At this moment, I would appreciate any suggestions either of you might have. Alfred said, We should get the hell out of here, Sergeant Major. That door won't hold much longer. What about these damned things? Bobby asked Eric. Eric tried to think as quickly as he could. I know nothing of this magic business. I know armor, horses, and fighting. Then he continued, All I know about these things is Miranda's warning not to let them come into contact with one another. If each man wrapped a single item, we might bring them with us. At least that would keep them out of their hands. He indicated the thudding door. Do it. Eric gave orders, and the men grabbed tapestries and wrapped the armor, jewelry, and other objects in cloth. Eric said, Each man is to watch those around him. If any other man looks different... Lost, confused, or distracted? Tell me at once. He distributed the items among different men, no one man carrying anything, no matter how small, without another standing next to him. De Longville said, You start. I'll follow. If they don't break in the door, I'll leave in ten minutes. See if you can jam this other door after you get through it, suggested Eric. Get out of here, said De Longville with a mocking smile. Eric lit a torch and hurriedly led the men carrying the artifacts through the second door. A flight of stairs led up into the gloom, and he began climbing. Nacor lay under a tree, dozing, when he suddenly sat up. Glancing around, he saw Shopi sitting a short distance away, watching him. The mad beggar also sat watching him. What is it? asked Nacor. I didn't wish to disturb you, master, so I waited. Lord Venkar has arrived. The prince has sent him to take control here. Not that, said Nacor, standing. Didn't you feel it? Feel what, master? Nacor said, Never mind, we're leaving. Shopi also stood. Where are we going? I don't know. Condor, I think. Maybe up to Elvendar. It depends. Shopi followed Nacor as he hurried toward the large building that dominated the island. Near the building, the mad beggar hurried off toward the kitchen. The bandy-legged Isalani gambler entered the building and headed straight to the central hall, where he found a well-dressed man sitting at the head of the table, Khalid, Chalmus, and the other magicians sitting there as well. The Earl of the Court said, And you must be Nacor. Nacor said, I must be. I have to tell you a couple of things. To begin with, these here are all liars. The other magicians gasped or objected, but Nacor simply kept talking. They don't mean to be but they've become so used to doing things in secret they can't help themselves. Don't believe anything they say, but otherwise they mean well. Arutha, Lord Benkar, began to laugh. Father said you were remarkable. I think Lord James is pretty unusual, too, said Nacor. Hell of a card player, he winked. Only man I've ever met who could cheat me at cards. I admire that. Arutha said, well, we can talk about this over supper. No, we can't, said Nacor. I've got to leave. Arutha, who looked something like his father, but with lighter hair, said, This minute? Yes, Nacor turned toward the door. Tell these stubborn dolts that something really bad is going to happen soon, and they'd better stop fooling around and get serious about helping the kingdom, or there won't be any point to anything any more. I'll be back in a while. If the Prince of Crondor's representative had anything more to say, Nacor didn't hear it, as he turned down a hallway and almost ran he was walking so fast. Shopee said, Master, I thought you said we were leaving. We are, replied Nacor, as he started to climb a flight of stairs. But this isn't the way to the docks. This is the way to Pug's Tower, I know. Shopee followed Nacor as he climbed the circular stairs that led to the top of the tower. 
When they reached the top floor, they were confronted by a wooden door with no apparent lock. Nacor pounded on it. Pug! A strange shimmer covered the surface of the door, and the wood flowed and twisted, forming a face. Be gone, said the face. This room shall not be entered. Nacor ignored the admonition and pounded upon the door even louder. Pug! he shouted. Shopee said, Master, he's not been here. He stopped speaking when the door opened. Pug looked out. You felt it, too. How could I not? said Nacor. Shopee said, But they said you weren't here. Nacor gnawed his gaze as he looked at Shopee. Sometimes I despair, boy. Are you stupid or just too trusting? How long have you known? asked Pug, motioning for them to come inside. They moved inside, and the door closed behind them. First day I got here. You make a lot of noise coming and going. Then he grinned. One day I came up the stairs, really quietly, and I heard you and your lady friend. His eyes grew wide, and he shook his hand as if touching something hot. You too, he laughed. Pug looked heavenward. Thank you for not disturbing us. No reason to, but we've got to go. Pug nodded. We risk attack, Nacor said. I don't think so. Whatever we feel is making enough noise out there that even if anyone is looking for you, they won't notice you moving the three of us. Where are we going? Crondor? Pug shook his head. No, we're going to Elvendar. I need to speak with Tomas. Nacor motioned for Sopi to stand close and took his student's hand. Pug linked hands with the two of them, and the room shifted and shimmered. Then they found themselves in a forest glade. Pug said, Follow me, and led them a short distance to a shallow river. This is the river Crydy, said Pug. Then he called out in a loud voice, I am Pug of Stardock. I seek counsel with Lord Thomas. A few minutes later, two elves appeared on the other side of the bank. One called out, You are bidden enter Elvendar. They waded across the stream, and Pug said to Shopee, None may enter Elvendar unbidden. Once they were on the other bank, Pug said, I hope you don't mind if I hurry along. The elf said, Not in the least. Pug smiled. Gelaine, isn't it? You remember, said the elf. Pug said, I wish I had the time to be social. The elf nodded. I and my patrol will return to the court in a few days' time. Perhaps then we may visit. Pug smiled. He took Shopee's and Nikor's hands again and moved them to another location in the forest. Shopee's eyes widened, and Pug remembered his first reaction to seeing the heart of the elven forest. Giant trees, dwarfing the most ancient oaks, rose to form an almost impenetrable canopy. Some of the trees showed leaves of the deepest green, while others had leaves golden, red, or silver in color, a few white as snow. A strange soft light bathed the area. Giant bowls rose with steps cut into the living wood, and branches broad enough to serve as walkways spread in all directions. It's our city of trees, said Chopi. Yes, said an old man, who stood nearby, leaning on a long bow. His hair was pure white, and his skin showed years of aging, but his body was still erect, and he wore the green leathers of a hunter. Martin, said Pug, stepping forward. The old man took Pug's extended hand and shook. It's been a long time. You look well, Nacor grinned. You old car cheat, said Martin, gripping Nacor's hand. You don't look a day older. Nacor shrugged. For one not gifted with long life, Martin, you look remarkable. The old man smiled. For a man my age, you mean? He glanced around. Here I linger. Elvendar has been kind to me. I think the gods decided to let my final years be peaceful. Pug said, You deserve some peace in your time. Martin Longbow, once Duke of Crondor, brother to King Liam and uncle to King Borak, said, Seems that once more peace is at risk. Pug nodded. I need to speak to Thomas and Aglarana. Is Callus here? Martin picked up his bow. I was sent to wait for you. Miranda arrived an hour ago with the strangest young man. He began walking. Tomas said you'd be here shortly. Callus is... well, he may not return. 
ill news, said Nacor. Who is this? Martin motioned to Chopin. Nacor said, Chopin, a disciple. Martin laughed as he moved through the trees. Seriously, or are you doing the mendicant holy man act again? Seriously, said Nacor, looking injured. I never should have told Borak about that scam. He's told everyone in his family about it. Martin's brown eyes narrowed. There was a reason. Then he laughed. It's good to see you again. Are you coming? asked Pug. No, I rarely sit in the Queen's Council any more. I am content to be a guest here, waiting out my time. Pug smiled. I understand. We'll talk this evening after supper. He gripped Chopin's and Nacor's hands and closed his eyes. And again the air shimmered, and they were someplace else. They stood in the center of a large platform set high in the trees. A voice said, Welcome, Pug of Grydee. Pug couldn't help but laugh. Thank you, old friend. A large man, easily six inches over six feet in height, approached and took Pug's hand, then hugged him. It is good to see you again, Pug. His features were youthful, but his eyes were ancient. His features were a blend of human and elf, with high cheekbones, pointed ears, and blonde hair. To any who had seen Callus, there was no doubt this was his father. Pug slapped his friend on the back. Too many years, Tomas, he said with genuine regret. Shopi and Nacor were introduced to Tomas, war leader of the elven host of Elvendar. Then they were presented to a stunning woman of regal bearing, Aglarana, queen of Elvendar. Nacor smiled and said, Nice to meet you, lady, while Shopi knelt in greeting. The elf queen was a young-looking woman, despite her centuries of age. Her hair was a fine red gold, her eyes a deep blue, and her beauty breathtaking, despite being alien. An elf who looked young by human standards came to stand next to Tomas. This is Callan, said Tomas, heir to the throne of Elvendar and brother to my son. Prince Callan greeted the two newcomers, then said to Pug, Miranda arrived an hour ago. Where is she? asked Pug. Over there. Tomas indicated a second platform off to the side of the first. Chopin followed in awe. The trees themselves were alive with lights and magic. There was a profound sense of peace and rightness here that he had not imagined possible. They came to the indicated place where Miranda was inspecting a strange, glowing gem, as well as a helm. None of the elves gathered near her touched anything, but they peered closely at the objects. Pug hurried over. Miranda! She turned, and upon seeing him, nearly flew to him, throwing her arms around his neck. It's so good to see you again. Callus? asked Pug. He's been injured. How badly? Badly. Pug held her a moment, then said, Tell me where to find him. I can't. He wears a ward that protects him from magic sight. It shields him from the Pantathians, but it shields him from us as well. Tell me about it, said Pug. Miranda reconstructed the events of the journey, the discovery, and the escape. I left six men, those who survived the fights on the way out, in a frigid cave in the peaks. She finished. I pray they've gotten down from the mountains, but I fear they are all dead. Pug said, Every one of us knew the risks. Miranda nodded, clutching his hand, but her face was drawn. There is this, she said, and Callus judged it critical. I bring it here. Pug looked at the key. What is it? A Pantathian thing. A key to free the Green Lady from the Life Stone said Miranda. Pug looked dubious. He looked at the object for long minutes, placing his hand over it, but not quite touching it. He closed his eyes several times, and his lips moved. Once a tiny spark of energy leaped from the palm of his hand to the stone. At last he stood upright and said, It's a key of some sort, that's certain, but to free the Valhero. He looked at the assembled spellweavers of Elvendar and addressed the eldest. Tapa. What do you see? This is something of those whose name may not be spoken, said the senior advisor to the queen. But there is an alien presence here as well, one of which I have no knowledge. Pug said, The demon you spoke of, Miranda? No, it was nearly a mindless thing, a killing device, pure and simple. I witnessed it at work, and while it was powerful and able to hold a dozen serpent priests at bay, it had cunning but no intelligence, at least not enough to have conceived this device. 
Whatever fashioned this thing was more than that simple being. Someone sent it through a rift into the heart of the Pantathian home to wreak havoc and destroy them. The same intention as ours. Pug said, Once before we dealt with Ducosity. Why not now? Tomas stood next to his friend and said, What do you think? Pug stroked his beard. As Merman Demis was but a false icon to manipulate the Moradel to rise up and capture Sethanon, a Pantathian ruse, so might not this be a demon ruse to use the Pantathians to capture the Lifestone? Toward what end? asked Aglarana. Pug sighed. Power? It's a powerful tool, no matter who wields it. Weapon, said Nacor, not a tool. What of the Valhero? asked Tomas. Can some other force imagine they can do anything with the life stone, use it somehow, without having to deal with those trapped within the stone? Pug said, The problem is that the only source of lore we have is what you remember, from the memory of Ashen Shugar. Tomas possessed the memories of the ages dead dragon lord whose armor he had donned during the Rift War. But he alone of the Valheru had nothing to do with the creation of the Lifestone. He knew something of its nature, something of its purpose, that it was to be a weapon to destroy the new gods, but beyond that he was ignorant of its nature. So you suspect that someone else, whoever is behind this demons entering our world, may have a purpose for the Lifestone that hasn't occurred to us, said Miranda. Could they simply grab the Lifestone and use it as a weapon? the way a man might use a sword or crossbow? That, said Pug, I do not know. It's clear, though, that someone is prepared to try. What do we do? asked Miranda. Pug said, We wait and study this thing and see what they do next. Miranda said, What about Callus? Tomas said, We wait. Miranda said, I want to return to look for him and the others. Pug said, I know you do, but it would be foolish. They will have moved on, and whoever we face, whoever is left alive there, will be on guard and looking for him as well. The second you pop into existence there, whatever magic is left will fall on you like a burning house. Nacor said, I'll go. Pug turned and said, What? I will go, he said slowly. Get me to Crondor, and I will get a ship, and I will sail down to that place. He left his boat, and I will get him back. Pug said, you're serious? Nacor said, I told this one, he motioned to Chopi, we had to go on a trip. This is just a bit farther than I thought. He grinned a moment, then the smile faded. In the most serious tones anyone had heard Nacor use, he said, A great and terrible storm is coming, Pug. It is black and deadly, and we don't understand yet what is behind it. Everyone here has a duty. I do, too, to find Callus and the others and bring back whatever they've learned after Miranda left. Aglarana said, Take from us whatever we can give, if it will help you find our son. Nacor said, Just get me to Crondor. Pug said, Any particular place? Nacor thought a moment. The court of the prince will do. Pug nodded, then to Shopi he said, You, too? I follow my master. Pug said, Very well, join hands. They did, and Pug wove a spell, and suddenly they were gone. Callus was unconscious, and Eric carried him as he would a child. Bobby was barely conscious, and leaned on Alfred's shoulder. Of the thirty-seven men who had left the deep temple of the Pantathians, nine were alive. Three times they had encountered hostile forces and had to fight. At Callus's insistence, they had continued on. Despite his demand they leave him, they carried him. Eric had found a deep fissure in the mountain, from which heat rose in shimmering waves. He had ordered the armor and other items thrown into the fissure, certain that even if the heat wasn't sufficient to destroy the Valheru artifacts, no mortal would be able to retrieve them. A few minutes after he had done this, the mountain shook with a terrible quake, and rocks fell, killing one man, injuring another. A howling wind shot through the tunnel they were in, knocking them down and deafening them for nearly an hour afterward, and a crackle of angry energy shot along the ceiling of the tunnel, as if mad lightning were seeking a way upward back into the sky. 
Eric judged that even when they attempted to destroy those magic items, it was wise not to let them come into contact. He hoped the violence heralded the destruction of the Valhero artifacts. Then they had been attacked, first by a ragged band of Pantathians who appeared to have been survivors of the demon's raid on one of the crashes, and twice they had been forced to confront the Sa'awar. The only reason they were alive was that those other forces were trying to get out of the mountains as desperately as Callus's company, and didn't pursue once combat was broken off. But the attacks had forced them upward, higher into the mountains. Alfred came from the head of the line and said, There's a cave ahead. They entered the cave, and Eric looked out its mouth. Arrayed at his feet were the snow-covered peaks of the mountains as the late afternoon sun struck rose and golden highlights across the ridges. For a brief moment, he thought that despite his pain and fear, beauty endured. But he was just too tired, hungry, and cold to enjoy it. Make camp, he ordered, and wondered how long they could survive. Men broke torches out of a backpack and used them to make a small fire. Eric took inventory and judged they had enough food and things they could burn to keep them alive for five or six days. After that, no matter how damaged the men, they would have to start down from the snow line, trying to avoid detection from whatever Pantathians had escaped the destruction of the Dragon Lord artifacts, and find forage enough to keep them going. He wondered if the horses were still in the valley, and if he could even find that valley. With both Kalos and DeLongville hurt, Eric was now leading the survivors. Sergeant, said Alfred, better come here. Eric worked past the men struggling to light a fire and knelt next to Alfred. The Longville's eyes were open. Sergeant Major, said Eric. How's the captain? asked the Longville. Alive, said Eric. He marveled at that simple fact. Any lesser man would have been dead this morning. He's asleep. Eric looked at the pale complexion of his immediate superior and said, How are you? The Longville coughed, and Eric could see blood fleck the saliva running from his mouth. I'm dying, said De Longville in the same matter-of-fact tone in which he would have asked for another helping of supper. Each breath is harder. He pointed to his side. I think I have a piece of rib sticking me in the lung. Then he closed his eyes in pain. I know I have a piece of rib sticking me in the lung. Eric closed his eyes and fought back regret. If the man had been allowed to rest... And if the bone fragments had been discovered, something might have been done. But a fragment sticking him while he was being half-carried, dragged, forced to walk, it must have been sawing into that lung for half the day. The pain must have been incredible. No wonder de Longville had been unconscious most of the time. No regrets, said de Longville, as if reading Eric's thoughts. He reached out and took Eric's tunic in his hand. Pulling him close, he said, Keep him alive. Eric nodded. He didn't need to be told whom de Longville spoke of. I will. If you don't, I'll come back and haunt you, I swear it. He coughed, and the pain was enough to cause his body to spasm, and his eyes filled with tears. When he could speak again, he whispered, You don't know, but I was the first. I was a soldier, and he saved me at Hamsa. He carried me for two days. He raised me up. Tears gathered in Bobby's eyes. Eric couldn't tell if it was from pain or emotion. He made me important. De Longville's voice grew even weaker. I have no family, Eric. He is my father and brother. He is my son. Keep him. De Longville's body contorted in spasm, and he spewed blood across his chest. A great racking attempt to breathe brought only tears to his eyes, and he pulled himself upright. Eric wrapped his arms around Bobby de Longville, holding him close tightly so he wouldn't flop on the stones, but as gently as he would a child, and listened with tears running down his own cheeks as de Longville tried to take a breath that would not come. Only a gurgling sound of lungs filling with blood was heard, and then de Longville went limp. Eric held him closely for a long minute, letting the tears fall without shame. Then he gently lowered him to the stone. Alfred reached out and closed the now vacant eyes. Eric sat unable to think until Alfred said, I'll find a place where the scavengers won't get him, Sergeant. Eric nodded and looked back to where Callus lay. Feeling the bitter cold, he began pulling Bobby's heavy cloak off his body. He said to a soldier nearby, Help me. It's what he would have done. They stripped the Sergeant Major's body and piled the clothing upon the unconscious half-elf. 
Eric looked at his color and wondered. If he survived the blast in the Pantathian Hall, he might survive this cold, provided he could rest and heal. Eric knew that the only possibility would be to rest a few days, and then cold and hunger would force them out of the cave and down the mountain. He turned as Alfred and another man picked up the Longville's body and carried it out into the snow, and he returned his gaze to Callus's face. I promise, Bobby, Eric said softly. I'll keep him alive. A short time later, Alfred and the other soldier returned, and Alfred said, There's a small ice cave over there. He pointed slightly to the west. We put him in there and piled some rocks over the entrance. Sitting as close to the fire as he could, he said, I don't think it ever thaws out up here. He'll be safe there, Sergeant. Eric nodded. His mind pleaded to fall into black despair, and he felt as if he needed nothing more than to lie down and sleep. Instead, he knew he had to plan and to work, for there were six other men, and one very special being, who was more than a man, who were now dependent upon him to survive, and he had made a promise, a promise he would honor. He took a deep breath, pushed aside fatigue and failure, and turned his mind to getting everyone out of these mountains. Rue looked up as a commotion broke out downstairs. Several voices were raised in protest. What? Nacor, he said as the Isolani gambler hurried up the stairs, a step before three waiters trying to halt him. You can't go up there, shouted Kurt, trying to overtake Nacor. Rue stood up and said, It's all right, Kurt. He's an old business associate. I tried to tell him, said Nacor. He grinned at Kurt as the now disgruntled waiter turned and descended the stairs. Rue said, What brings you here? You do. I just came from the palace, and Lord James tells me he can't give me a ship. I need a ship. He said you have ships, so I came here to get a ship from you. Rue laughed. You want me to give you a ship? What for? Nacor said, Callus, Herrick, Bobby, and the others, they're stuck down in Novindus. Someone has to go get them. Rue said, What do you mean, stuck? Nacor said, They went down to find and destroy the Pantathians. I don't know if they destroyed them, but they hurt them badly. Callus sent Miranda to his father on some important business, and now they are all stuck down there with no way to get home. Lord James says he can't spare the ships and is going to keep them here to defend the city. So I thought I'd get one from you. Rue didn't hesitate, but turned to Jason and said, What ships of ours are in the harbor? Jason consulted a sheaf of paper. Thumbing through the pages, he said, Six of the... Which is the fastest? Bitter Sea Queen, answered Jason. I want it outfitted for a six-month voyage, and I want fifty of the toughest mercenaries we can hire, ready to go with us at first flight tomorrow. With us? asked Nacor. Rue shrugged. Eric is the only brother I've known, and if he's down there with Callus, I'm going. Nacor sat down and helped himself to a cup of coffee from a pot on the corner of Rue's desk. He sipped the hot brew and said, You going to be able to do this thing? Rue nodded. I've got people I can trust I can leave in charge. He thought of Sylvia and Carly, and then Helen Jacoby, and said, I need to say a few goodbyes. I need to eat, answered Nacor. Oh, show P is downstairs. Being more polite than I, he believed them when they said he couldn't come up here. Rue motioned to Jason to fetch show P, and said, And then I must go find Louise and Duncan. I need to work out who's in charge of what while I'm gone. Jason nodded and departed, and Rue said, We'll get them back. Nacor smiled, nodded, and drank more coffee. Epilogue Rescue Eric pointed. Callus nodded. I see it. The five remaining soldiers sat atop a bluff overlooking the ocean before a rude hut they had called home for more than two months. The fisherman who carried word spotted it on the horizon before sundown yesterday. He said they were sailing far to the south of the Queen's ship's normal patrol. Too close to the iceberg flows for anyone who knows the local waters. A kingdom ship? asked Rinaldo, turning to look at Micha, the other soldier who had accompanied Callus, Eric, and Alfred down from the mountains. Perhaps, said Callus, forcing himself upright on a makeshift crutch. He had endured punishing conditions when they had come down from the mountains three months earlier. After six days in the caves with nothing more than torches and each other for a source of warmth, they had started downward. 
Carlos had regained a bit of strength during that time, but had to be assisted for the first two days. They reached a cave below the snow line where Eric started a fire and trapped some hares, and they rested another two days. After that, it had been a long walk, for not only could Eric not find the valley with the horses in it again, he almost put them on the wrong side of the River Dee, with no way to ford to the southern side. But eventually they had reached the coast and found the fishing village. The village had been raided by a Sir Hour patrol, and the drying shed with a Bridgener ship burned down, and the six men left to guard it killed. The Sir Hour had left warriors behind for two weeks, but when no one returned, they had left to rejoin their compatriots. A black despair had washed over all five of them, but after a day of dejection, Eric had organized the other three healthy men and begun a modest camp some distance from the village. The villagers had been more than willing to help in exchange for work, and because these men were obviously enemies of their oppressors. Not one member of the village had suggested they be turned over to the Emerald Queen's army. As they watched, the ship grew slowly on the horizon. At last, Calla said, It's a kingdom ship. Alfred and Rinaldo let out a whoop of pleasure, while Micha gave a short prayer of thanks to Tithonanka, the god of war. Calla stood, leaning on his crutch. We'd better get to the village. Eric walked near Callus in case he needed help. He had taken more damage than any mortal should have to endure, and still he lived. He was healing. He would carry burn scars on the left side of his face, but his hair was growing back. For the severity of the wounds, which Eric had cleaned daily and regularly performed Reiki on, the scars weren't bad. There was some weakness on his left side, and he limped, but Eric was certain once they reached the kingdom, some help from the prince's chirurgeon or one of the healing priests at one of the temples, would bring the captain back to his former vigor. They didn't speak at all of Bobby de Longville, alone in his icy tomb high in the mountains above. Eric had some vague sense that the unwillingness to speak of the dead was Callus's elven heritage. He also sensed some deep personal loss. Bobby had been more than just a friend to Callus. He had been the first man recruited to Callus's special cause and he had endured longer than any man in Callus's command. As they reached the beach, Eric realized with something close to shock that now only Jado Shati stood longer in term of service to Callus than he, and he had barely served for three years. He shook his head. Callus noticed and said, What? Eric shrugged. I was just thinking that longevity isn't a hallmark of this service. That's the truth, said Callus, and I fear the carnage has only just begun. Of us five here, none may be alive when this is all done. Eric said nothing. They reached the village where one of the older fishermen named Rajis said, Do you wish to meet that ship? Yes, said Eric. It is one of ours. It will take us home. The villager nodded and shook Eric's hand, then Callus's and the others. We can only say thank you, said Callus. If we help you in defeating the Emerald Queen, you need not thank us. They entered a boat and were pushed out into the surf, and two fishermen began to row. As the ship approached, Eric said, That's not a royal ship. Callus nodded. They fly a trading banner. What? said Alfred. It's a merchantman? So it would seem, answered Callus. After a few minutes, Eric said, I don't know. He stood and began waving. As the ship approached, figures on the deck began waving back. Then suddenly Eric recognized one of them. It's Rue, he shouted. It's Rue. A moment later he said, And Acor's with him, and Chopi. Soon they were alongside the ship, and a rope ladder was dropped. Two sailors shinnied down ropes and helped Callus climb aboard. Eric waited to be last, then bade the two fishermen goodbye. When he got on deck, he found Nacor, Chopi, and Rue waiting. Rue came over, and the two boyhood friends embraced. After a moment, Eric said, It's good to see you, more than you can ever know. Looking at the five men, sunburned, undernourished, ragged, and dirty, Rue shook his head. Just you five? That we know of, said Callus. Miranda had a dozen with her. Nacor said, If they aren't here by now, they didn't get out. She got to Elvendar with a strange man named Boldar. I saw them there. Then Pug sent me to Rue so I could come get you. Callus stood. There is much we must talk of, things I saw under the mountains that I don't yet understand. 
Perhaps your odd perspective on things might help me sort it out. We have a long voyage ahead, said Nacor. Plenty of time to talk. First, you need to eat, then sleep. Then Chopi and I will look at your wounds. The other three men were shown below, and Eric said to Rue, Why you? Rue shrugged. Duke James was loath to lend Nacor a ship. I've come into some money and had a few ships lying around the harbor, so I thought I'd give him one. Glancing at the retreating Isolani's back, he said, Then when I considered what a maniac he could be, I thought it best if I came along to make sure I got my ship back. Eric laughed. Rue said, To Longville? Eric lost his smile. Up there, he said with a tilt of his chin toward the distant mountains, their peaks hidden by clouds. Rue was silent for a long moment before he turned toward the quarterdeck. Captain! Yes, Mr. Avery. Take us home. Aye, aye, said the captain. He gave word to the first officer, and the ship came about, slowly turning away from Novendus. Eric put his arm over Rue's shoulder and asked, Any trouble getting here? Rue laughed. We had a run in with one of the Queen's smaller cutters. I brought along some of the nastier brawlers I could hire on short notice, and we let them come alongside us. Then we boarded and sank her. I don't think they have much experience with pirates down here. Eric laughed. So, are you the richest man in the kingdom yet? Rue said, probably. If not, I'm working on it. He laughed. Let's get you some food. The two men went below, and the ship came fully around and began the long journey back the way she had come, heading for a distant port that the two men called home. End of Rise of a Merchant Prince, Serpent War Saga, Volume 2 By Raymond E. Feist Read by Roy Avers and